Section 29 of Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman. Part 2. Chapter 22. The Grist of the Prison Mill. 1. The comparative freedom of the range familiarizes me with the workings of the institution and brings me in close contact with the authorities. The personnel of the guards is of very inferior character. I find their average intelligence considerably lower than that of the inmates. Especially does the element recruited from the police and the detective service lack sympathy with the unfortunates in their charge. They are mostly men discharged from city employment because of habitual drunkenness or flagrant brutality and corruption. Their attitude toward the prisoners is summed up in coercion and suppression. They look upon the men as willless objects of iron-handed discipline, exact, unquestioning obedience and absolute submissiveness to peremptory whims, and harbor personal animosity towards the less pliant. The more intelligent among the officers scorn inferior duties and crave advancement. The authority and remuneration of a deputy wardenship is alluring to them, and every keeper considers himself the fittest for the vacancy. But the coveted prize is awarded to the guard, most feared by the inmates, and most subservient to the warden, a direct incitement to brutality on the one hand, to sycophancy on the others. A number of the officers are veterans of the Civil War. Several among them had suffered incarceration in Libby Prison, these often manifest a more sympathetic spirit. The great majority of the keepers, however, have been employed in the penitentiary from fifteen to twenty-five years, some even for a longer period, like Officer Stewart, who has been a guard for forty years. This element is unspeakably callous and cruel. The prisoners discuss among themselves the ages of the old guards and speculate on the days allotted them. The death of one of them is hailed with joy. Seldom they are discharged. Still more seldom do they resign. The appearance of a new officer sheds hope into the dismal lives. New guards, unless drafted from the police bureau, are almost without exception lenient and forbearing, often exceedingly humane. The inmates vie with each other in showing complacence to the candidate. It is a point of honour in their unwritten ethics to treat him white. They frown upon the fellow convict who seeks to take advantage of the green screw by misusing his kindness, or exploiting his ignorance of the prison rules. But the older officers secretly resent the infusion of new blood. They strive to discourage the applicant by exaggerating the dangers of the position, and depreciating its financial desirability for an ambitious young man. They impress upon him the warden's unfairness to the guards, and the lack of opportunity for advancement. Often they dissuade the new man, and he disappears from the prison horizon. But if he persists in remaining, the old keepers expostulate with him in pretending friendliness upon his leniency, chide him for a soft-hearted tenderfoot, and improve every opportunity to initiate him into the practices of brutality. The system is known in the prison as breaking in. The new man is constantly drafted in the clubbing squad, the older officers setting the example of cruelty. Refusal to participate signifies insubordination to his superiors, and the shirking of routine duty, and results in immediate discharge. But such instances are extremely rare. Within the memory of the oldest officer, Mr. Stewart, it happened only once, and the man was sickly. Slowly the poison is instilled into the new guard. Within a short time the prisoners notice the first signs of change. He grows less tolerant and chummy, more irritated and distant. Presently he feels himself the object of espionage by the favorite trustees of his fellow officers. In some mysterious manner the warden is aware of his every step, berating him for speaking unduly long to this prisoner, or for giving another half a banana, the remnant of his lunch. In a moment of commiseration and pity, the officer is moved by the tearful pleadings of misery to carry a message to the sick wife or child of a prisoner. The latter confides the secret to some friend, or carelessly brags of his intimacy with the guard, and soon the keeper faces the warden on charges, and is deprived of a month's pay. Repeated misplacement of confidence, occasional betrayal by a prisoner seeking the good graces of the warden, and the new officer grows embittered against the species convict. 
the instinct of self-preservation, harassed and menaced on every side, becomes more assertive, and the guard is soon drawn into the vortex of the system. 2. Daily I behold the machinery at work, grinding and pulverizing, brutalizing the officers, dehumanizing the inmates. Far removed from the strife and struggle of the larger world, I yet witness its miniature replica, more agonizing and merciless within the walls. A perfected model it is, this prison life, with its apparent uniformity and dull passivity. But between the torpid surface smolder the fires of being, now crackling faintly under a dun, smothering smoke, now blazing forth with the ruthlessness of despair. Hidden by the veil of discipline rages the struggle of fiercely contending wills, and intricate meshes are woven in the quagmire of darkness and suppression. Intrigue and counterplot, violence and corruption, are rampant in cell house and shop. The prisoners spy upon each other, and in turn upon the officers. The latter encourages the trustees in unearthing the secret doings of the inmates, and the stools enviously compete with each other in supplying information to the keepers. Often they deliberately inveil the trustful prisoner into a fake plot to escape, help and encourage him in the preparations, and at the critical moment denounce him to the authorities. The luckless man is severely punished, usually remaining in utter ignorance of the intrigue. The provocateur is rewarded with greater liberty and special privileges. Frequently his treachery proves the stepping-stone to freedom, aided by the warden's official recommendation of the model prisoner to the State Board of Pardons. The stools and the trustees are an essential element in the government of the prison. With rare exception, every officer has one or more on his staff. They assist him in his duties, perform most of his work, and make out the reports for the illiterate guards. Occasionally they are even called upon to help the clubbing squad. The more intelligent stools enjoy the confidence of the deputy and his assistants, and thence advance to the favour of the warden. The latter places more reliance upon his favourite trustees than upon the guards. "'I have about a hundred paid officers to keep watch over the prisoners,' the warden informs new applicant, "'and two hundred volunteers to watch both. "'The volunteers are vested with unofficial authority, "'often exceeding that of the inferior officers. "'They invariably secure the sinecures of the prison, "'involving little work and affording opportunity for espionage. "'They are runners, messengers, yard and office men. "'Other desirable positions,' clerkships and the like, are awarded to influential prisoners, such as bankers, embezzlers, and boodlers. These are known in the institution as holding political jobs. Together with the stools, they are scorned by the initiated prisoners as the pets. The professional craftiness of the conman stands him in good stead in the prison. A shrewd judge of human nature, quick-witted and self-confident, he applies the practised cunning of his vocation to secure whatever privileges and perquisites the institution affords. His evident intelligence and aplomb powerfully impress the guards. His well-affected deference to authority flatters them. They are awed by his wonderful facility of expression and great attainments in the mysterious world of baccarat and confidence games. At heart they envy the high priest of easy money and are proud to befriend him in his need. The officers exert themselves to please him, secure light work for him, and surreptitiously favour him with delicacies, and even money. His game is won. The con has now secured the friendship and confidence of his keepers, and will continue to exploit them by pretended warm interest in their physical complaints, their family troubles, and their whispered ambition of promotion and fear of the warden's discrimination. The more intelligent officers are the easiest victims of his wiles, but even the higher officials, more difficult to approach, do not escape the confidence man. His business has perfected his sense of orientation. He quickly rends the veil of appearance and scans the undercurrents. He frets at his imprisonment and hints at high social connections. His real identity is a great secret. He wishes to save his wealthy relatives from public disgrace. A careless slip of the tongue betrays his college education. With a deprecating nod, he confesses that his father is a state senator. He is the only black sheep in his family, yet they are good to him and will not disown him, but he must not bring notoriety upon them. Eager for special privileges and the liberty of the trustees, or fearful of punishment, the con man matures his campaign. He writes a note to a fellow prisoner. With much detail and thorough knowledge of prison conditions, he exposes all the ins and outs of the institution. In elegant English, he criticizes the management, 
dwells upon the ignorance and brutality of the guards, and charges the warden and the board of prison inspectors with graft, individually and collectively. He denounces the warden as a stomach robber of poor unfortunates. The counties pay from 25 to 30 cents per day for each inmate. The federal government, for its quota of men, 50 cents per person. Why are the prisoners given qualitatively and quantitatively inadequate food, he demands? Does not the state appropriate thousands of dollars for the support of the penitentiary, beside the money received from the counties? With keen scalpel the conman dissects the anatomy of the institution. One by one he analyzes the industries, showing the most intimate knowledge. The hosiery department produces so and so many dozens of stockings per day. They are not stamped convict-made, as the law requires. The labels attached are misleading and calculated to decoy the innocent buyer. The character of the product in the several mat shops is similarly an infraction of the statutes of the great state of Pennsylvania for the protection of free labor. The broom shop is leased by contract to a firm of manufacturers known as Lang Brothers. The law expressly forbids contract labor in prisons. The stamp convict made on the brooms is pasted over with a label, concealing the source of manufacture. Thus the conman runs on in his note. With much show of secrecy he entrusts it to a notorious stool for delivery to a friend. Soon the writer is called before the warden. In the latter's hands is the note. The offender smiles complacently. He is aware the authorities are terrorized by the disclosure of such intimate familiarity with the secrets of the prison house in the possession of an intelligent, possibly well-connected man. He must be propitiated at all cost. The conman joins the politicians. The ingenuity of imprisoned intelligence treads devious paths, all leading to the highway of enlarged liberty and privilege. The old-timer, veteran of oft-repeated experience, easily avoids hard labor. He has many friends in the prison, is familiar with the keepers, and is welcomed by them like a prodigal coming home. The officers are glad to renew the old acquaintance and talk over old times. It brings interest into their tedious existence often as grey and monotonous as the prisoners. The seasoned yeggman, constitutionally and on principle opposed to toil, rarely works. Generally suffering a comparatively short sentence, he looks upon his imprisonment as, in a measure, a rest-cure from the wear and tear of tramp life. Above average intelligence, he scorns work in general, prison labour in particular. He avoids it with unstinted expense of energy and effort. As a last resort he plays the jigger card producing an artificial wound on leg or arm, having every appearance of syphilitic excrescence. He pretends to be frightened by the infection, and prevails upon the physician to examine him. The doctor wonders at the wound, closely resembling the dreaded disease. Ever had syphilis? he demands. The prisoner protests indignantly. Perhaps in the family, the medicus suggests. The patient looks diffident, blushes, cries, No, never, and assumes a guilty look. The doctor is now convinced the prisoner is a victim of syphilis. The man is excused from work, indefinitely. The wily Yegg, now a patient, secures a snap in the yard, and adapts prison conditions to his habits of life. He sedulously courts the friendship of some young inmate, and wins his admiration by ghost stories of great daring and cunning. He puts the boy next to the ropes, and constitutes himself his protector against the abuse of the guards and the advances of other prisoners. He guides the youth's steps through the maze of conflicting rules, and finally initiates him into the higher wisdom of the road. The path of the gun is smoothed by his colleagues in the prison. Even before his arrival, the esprit de corps of the profession is at work, securing a soft berth for the expected friend. If noted for success and skill, he enjoys the respect of the officers and the admiration of a retinue of aspiring young crooks of lesser experience and reputation. With conscious superiority he instructs them in the finesse of his trade, practices them in nimble-fingered touches, and imbues them with the philosophy of the plenitude of suckers whom the good God has put upon the earth to afford the thief an honest living. His sentence nearing completion, the gun grows thoughtful, carefully scans the papers, forms plans for his first job, arranges dates with his partners, and gathers messages for their mall buzzers women thieves. He is gravely concerned with the somewhat roughened condition of his hands, and the possible dulling of his sensitive fingers. He manoeuvres, generally successfully, for lighter work, to limber up a bit. 
jollies the officers, and cajoles the warden for new shoes, made to measure in the local shops, and insists on the ten-dollar allowance to prisoners received from counties outside of Allegheny. Upon their discharge, prisoners tried and convicted in the county of Allegheny, in which the Western Penitentiary is located, receive only five dollars. He argues the need of money to leave the state. Often he does leave. More frequently, a number of charges against the man are held in reserve by the police, and he is arrested at the gate by detectives who have been previously notified by the prison authorities. A great bulk of the inmates, accidental and occasional offenders direct from the field, factory, and mine, plod along in the shops, in sullen misery and dread. Day in, day out, year after year, they drudge at the monotonous work, dully wondering at the numerous trustees idling about, while their own heavy tasks are constantly increased. From cell to shop and back again, always under the stern eyes of the guards, their days drag in deadening toil. In mute bewilderment, they receive contradictory orders, unaware of the secret antagonisms between the officials. They are surprised at the new rule making attendance at religious service obligatory, and again at the succeeding order, the desired appropriation for a new chapel having been secured, making church-going optional. They are astonished at the sudden disappearance of the considerate and gentle guard buyers, and anxiously hope for his return, not knowing that the officer who discouraged the underhand methods of the trustees fell a victim to their cabal. 3. Occasionally a bolder spirit grumbles at the exasperating partiality. Released from punishment, he patiently awaits an opportunity to complain to the warden of his unjust treatment. Weeks pass. At last the captain visits the shop. A propitious moment. The carefully trimmed beard frames the stern face in benevolent white, mellowing the hard features and lending dignity to his appearance. His eyes brighten with peculiar brilliancy as he slowly begins to stroke his chin, and then, almost imperceptibly, presses his fingers to his lips. As he passes through the shop, the prisoner raises his hand. "'What is it?' the warden inquires, a pleasant smile on his face. The man relates his grievance with nervous eagerness. "'Oh, well!' The captain claps him on the shoulder. Perhaps a mistake, an unfortunate mistake, but then you might have done something at another time and not been punished. He laughs merrily at his witticism. It is so long ago, anyhow. We'll forget it. And he passes on. But if the captain is in a different mood, his features harden. The stern eyes scowl, and he says in his clear, sharp tones, State your grievance in writing, on the printed slip, which the officer will give you. The written complaint deposited in the mailbox, finally reaches the chaplain and is forwarded by him to the warden's office. There the deputy and the assistant deputy read and classify the slips, placing some on the captain's file and throwing others into the waste-basket, according as the accusation is directed against a friendly or an unfriendly brother officer. Months pass before the prisoner is called for a hearing. By that time he very likely has a more serious charge against the guard who now persecutes the kicker but the new complaint has not yet been filed, and therefore the hearing is postponed. Not infrequently, men are called for a hearing who have been discharged or died since making the complaint. The persevering prisoner, however, unable to receive satisfaction from the warden, sends a written complaint to some member of the highest authority in the penitentiary, the Board of Inspectors. These are supposed to meet monthly to consider the affairs of the institution, visit the inmates, and minister to their moral needs. The complainant waits, mails several more slips, and wonders why he receives no audience with the inspectors, but the latter remain invisible, some not visiting the penitentiary within a year. Only the secretary of the board, Mr. Reed, a wealthy jeweller of Pittsburgh, occasionally puts in an appearance. Tall and lean, immaculate and trim, he exhales an atmosphere of sanctimoniousness. He walks leisurely through the block, passes a cell with a lithograph of Christ on the wall, and pauses his hands folded, his eyes turned upwards, lips slightly parted in silent prayer. He inquires of the rangeman, "'Whose cell is this?' "'A-1108, Mr. Reed,' the prisoner informs him. "'It is the cell of Jasper, the coloured trusty chief stool of the prison. He is a good man, a good man, God bless him,' the inspector says, a quaver in his voice. He steps into the cell, puts on his gloves, and carefully adjusts the little looking-glass and the rules hanging awry on the wall. It offends my eye, he smiles at the attending rangeman. They don't hang straight. Young Tommy, in the adjoining cell, calls out, Mr. Officer, please. The inspector steps forward. 
This is Inspector Reed, he corrects the boy. What is it you wish? Oh, Mr. Inspector, I've been asking to see you a long time I wanted. You should have sent me a slip. Have you a copy of the rules in the cell, my man? Yes, sir. Can you read? No, sir. Poor boy, did you never go to school? No, sir, me mother died when I was a kid. They put me into orphan and then into ref. And your father? I had no father. Mother always said he ran away before I was born. They have schools in the orphan asylum, also in the reformatory, I believe. Yep, but they keep me most of the time in punishment. I didn't care for the school know-how. You're a bad boy. How old are you now? Seventeen. What is your name? Tommy Wellman. From Pittsburgh? Allegheny. Your mother used to live on the hill near this here dump. What did you wish to see me about? I can't stand to sell, Mr. Inspector. Please let me have some work. Are you locked up for a cause? I smashed a guy in the jaw for calling me names. Don't you know it's wrong to fight, my little man? He said me mother was a bitch. God damn his... Don't. Don't swear. Never take the holy name in vain. It is a great sin. You should have reported the man to your officer, instead of fighting. I ain't no snitch. Will you get me out of the cell, Mr. Inspector? You are in the hands of the warden. He is very kind, and he will do what is best for you. Oh, hell, I'm locked up five months now. That's the best he's doing for me. Don't talk like that to me, the inspector upbraids him severely. You are a bad boy. You must pray. The good Lord will take care of you. You get out of here! The boy bursts out in sudden fury, cursing and swearing. Mr. Reed hurriedly steps back, his face momentarily paling, turns red with shame and anger. He motions to the captain of the block. Mr. Woods, report this man for impudence to an inspector, he orders stalking out into the yard. The boy is removed to the dungeon. Oppressed and weary with the scenes of misery and torture, I welcome the relief of solitude as I am locked in the cell for the night. 4. Reading and study occupy the hours of the evening. I spend considerable time corresponding with Nold and Bauer. Our letters are bulky, ten, fifteen, and twenty pages long. There is so much to say. We discuss events in the world at large, incidents of the local life, the maltreatment of the inmates, the frequent clubbings and suicides, the unwholesome food. I share with my comrades my experiences on the range. They, in turn, keep me informed of occurrences in the shops. Their paths run smoother, less eventful than mine, yet not without much heartache and bitterness of spirit. They, too, are objects of prejudice and persecution. The officer of the shop where Nold is employed has been severely reprimanded for neglect of duty. The warden had noticed Carl, in the company of several other prisoners, passing through the yard with a load of mattings. He ordered the guard never to allow Nold out of his sight. Bauer has also felt the hand of petty tyranny. He has been deprived of his dark clothes and reduced to the stripes for disrespectful behaviour. Now he is removed to the north wing, where my cell is also located, while Nold is in the south wing, in a double cell, enjoying the luxury of a window. Fortunately, though, our friend, the horse thief, is still coffee boy on Bauer's range, thus enabling me to reach the big German. The latter, after reading my notes, returns them to our trusted carrier, who works in the same shop with Carl. Our mail connections are therefore complete, each of us exercising utmost care not to be trapped during the frequent surprises of searching ourselves and persons. Again the prison blossoms is revived. Most of the readers of the previous year, however, are missing. Dempsey and Beatty, the Knights of Labour men, have been pardoned, thanks to the multiplied and conflicting confessions of the informer Gallagher, who still remains in prison. D, our poet laureate, has also been released, his short term having expired. His identity remains a mystery, he having merely hinted that he was a scientist of the old school, an alchemist, from which we inferred that he was a counterfeiter. Gradually we recruit our reading public from the more intelligent and trustworthy element. Did the Queen strikers renew their subscriptions by contributing paper material? With them join Frank Shea, the philosophic second story man, George, the prison librarian, Billy Ryan, professional gambler and confidence man, Yale, a specialist in the art of safe blowing and former university student, the Attorney General, a sharp lawyer, magazine Alvin, writer and novelist, Jim, from whose ingenuity no lock is secure, and others. M and K act as alternate editors, the rest as contributors. The several departments of the little magazinelet are ornamented with pen and ink drawings, one picturing Dante visiting the Inferno, another sketching a peat man 
with mask and dark lantern, in the act of boring a safe, while a third bears the inscription, I sometimes hold it half a sin to put in words the grief I feel, for words like nature half reveal and half conceal the soul within. The editorials are short, pithy comments on local events interspersed with humorous sketches and caricatures of the officials. The balance of the blossoms consists of articles and essays of a more serious character, embracing religion and philosophy, labor and politics, with now and then a personal reminiscence by the second story man, or some sex experience by magazine Alvin. One of the associate editors lampoons Billy Goat Benny, the deputy warden. K sketches the shop screw and the trusted prisoner and G relates the story of the recent strike in his shop, the men's demand for clear pump water instead of the liquid mud tapped from the river, and the breaking of the strike by the exile of a score of rioters to the dungeon. In the next issue, the incident is paralleled with the Pullman car strike and the punished prisoners eulogized for their courageous stand, someone dedicating an ultra-original poem to the noble sons of Eugene Debs. But the vicissitudes of our existence, the change of location of several readers, the illness and death of two contributors badly disarranged the route. During the winter, Kay produces a little booklet of German poems, while I elaborate the short story of Luba, written the previous year, into a novelette, dealing with life in New York and revolutionary circles. Presently, G suggests that the manuscripts might prove of interest to a larger public and should be preserved. We discuss the unique plan, wondering how the intellectual contraband could be smuggled into the light of day. In our perplexity, we finally take counsel with Bob, the faithful commissary. He cuts the Gordian knot with astonishing levity. You fellows just go ahead and write, and don't bother about nothing. Think I can walk off all right with a team of horses, but ain't got brains enough to get away with a bit of scribbling, eh? Just leave that to the horse thief and write till you bust the paperwork, see? Thus encouraged, with entire confidence in our resourceful friend, we give the matter serious thought, and before long we form the ambitious project of publishing a book by M. K. G. In high elation, with new interest in life, we set to work. The little magazine is suspended, and we devote all our spare time, as well as every available scrap of writing material, to the larger purpose. We decide to honor the approaching day, so pregnant with revolutionary inspiration, and as the sun bursts in brilliant splendor on the eastern skies, the 1st of May, 1895, he steals a blushing beam upon the heading of the first chapter, The Homestead Strike. End of section 29. Recording by Stephen Harvey. Section 30 of Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman. Part 2. Chapter 23. The Scales of Justice. 1. The summer fades into days of dull grey. The fog thickens on the Ohio. The prison house is dim and damp, the river sirens sound sharp and shrill, and the cells echo with coughing and wheezing. The sick line stretches longer, the men looking more forlorn and dejected. The prisoner in charge of Tier K suffers a hemorrhage and is carried to the hospital. From assistant, I am advanced to his position on the range. But one morning the levers are pulled, the cells unlocked and the men fed while I remain under key. I wonder at the peculiar oversight, and rap on the bars for the officers. The block captain orders me to desist. I request to see the warden, but am gruffly told that he cannot be disturbed in the morning. In vain I rack my brain to fathom the cause of my punishment. I review the incidents of the past weeks, ponder over each detail, but the mystery remains unsolved. Perhaps I have unwittingly offended some trusty, or I may be the object of the secret enmity of a spy. The chaplain, on his daily rounds, hands me a letter from the girl and glances in surprise at the closed door. "'Not feeling well, my boy?' he asks. "'I'm locked up, chaplain.' "'What have you done?' "'Nothing that I know of.' "'Oh, well, you'll be out soon. Don't fret, my boy.' But the days pass, and I remain in the cell. The guards look worried, and vent their ill-humour in profuse vulgarity. The deputy tries to appear mysterious, wobbles comically along the range, and sputters at me. "'Nothing. Stay where you are.' 
Jasper, the colored trusty, flits up and down the hall, tremendously busy, his black face more lustrous than ever. Numerous stools nose about the galleries, stop here and there in confidential conversation with officers and prisoners, and whisper excitedly at the front desk. Assistant Deputy Hopkins goes in and out of the block, repeatedly calls Jasper to the office, and hovers in the neighborhood of my cell. The range men talk in suppressed tones, an air of mystery pervades the cell-house. Finally, I am called to the warden. With unconcealed annoyance, he demands, What did you want? The officers locked me up. Who said you're locked up? He interrupts angrily. You're merely locked in. Where's the difference? I ask. One is locked up for cause. You're just kept in for the present. On what charge? No charge. None whatever. Take him back, officers. Close confinement becomes increasingly more dismal and dreary. By contrast with the spacious hall, the cell grows smaller and narrower, oppressing me with a sense of suffocation. My sudden isolation remains unexplained. Notwithstanding the chaplain's promise to intercede in my behalf, I remain locked in, and again return the days of solitary, with all their gloom and anguish of heart. 2. A ray of light is shed from New York. The girl writes in a hopeful vein about the progress of the movement and the intense interest in my case among radical circles. She refers to Comrade Merlino, now on a tour of agitation, and is enthusiastic about the favorable labor sentiment toward me manifested in the cities he had visited. Finally, she informs me of a plan on foot to secure a reduction of my sentence and the promising outlook for the collection of the necessary funds. From Merlino, I receive a sum of money already contributed for the purpose, together with a letter of appreciation and encouragement, concluding, Good cheer, dear comrade. The last word has not yet been spoken. My mind dwells among my friends. The breath from the world of the living fans the smouldering fires of longing. The tone of my comrades reverberates in my heart with trembling hope, but the revision of my sentence involves recourse to the courts. The sudden realization fills me with dismay. I cannot be guilty of a sacrifice of principle to gain freedom. The mere suggestion rouses the violent protest of my revolutionary traditions. In bitterness of soul, I resent my friend's ill-advised waking of the shades. I shall never leave the house of death. And yet, mail from my friends, full of expectation and confidence, arrives more frequently. Prominent lawyers have been consulted. Their unanimous opinion augurs well. The multiplication of my sentences was illegal. According to the statutes of Pennsylvania, the maximum penalty should not have exceeded seven years. The Supreme Court would undoubtedly reverse the judgment of the lower tribunal, specifically the conviction on charges not constituting a crime under the laws of the state, and so forth. I am assailed by doubts. Is it consequent in me to decline liberty apparently within reach? John Most appealed his case to the Supreme Court, and the girl also took advantage of a legal defense. Considerable propaganda resulted from it. Should I refuse the opportunity which would offer such a splendid field for agitation, would it not be folly to afford the enemy the triumph of my gradual annihilation? I would, without hesitation, reject freedom at the price of my convictions, but it involves no denial of my faith to rob the vampire of its prey. We must, if necessary, fight the beast of oppression with its own methods, scourge the law with its own tracks, as it were. Of course, the Supreme Court is but another weapon in the hands of authority, a pretense of impartial right. It decided against most, sustaining the prejudiced verdict of the trial jury. They may do the same in my case, but that very circumstance will serve to confirm our arraignment of class justice. I shall therefore endorse the efforts of my friends. But before long I am informed that an application to the higher court is not permitted. The attorneys, upon examination of the records of the trial, discovered a fatal obstacle, they said. The defendant, not being legally represented, neglected to take exceptions to the rulings of the court prejudicial to the accused. Because of the technical omission, there exists no basis for an appeal. They therefore advise an application to the Board of Pardons on the ground that the punishment in my case is excessive. They are confident that the Board will act favorably in view of the obvious unconstitutionality of the compounded sentences, the five minor indictments being indispensable parts of the major charge, and as such not constituting separate offerings. The unexpected development disquiets me. The sound of pardon is detestable. What bitter irony that the noblest intentions, the most unselfish motives, need seek pardon. I of the very source that misinterprets and perverts them. For days the implied humiliation keeps agitating me. I recoil from the thought of personally affixing my name to the meek supplication of the printed form, and finally decide to refuse. An accidental conversation with the Attorney General disturbs my resolution. I learn that in Pennsylvania the applicant's signature is not required by the pardon board. A sense of guilty hope steals over me. 
Yet, I reflect, the pardon of the Chicago anarchists had contributed much to the dissemination of our ideas. The impartial analysis of the trial evidence by Governor Altgeld completely exonerated our comrades from responsibility for the Haymark tragedy and exposed the heinous conspiracy to destroy the most devoted and able representatives of the labor movement. May not a similar purpose be served by my application for a pardon? I write to my comrades, signifying my consent. We arrange for a personal interview to discuss the details of the work. Unfortunately, the girl, a persona non grata, cannot visit me. But a mutual friend, Miss Garrison, is to call on me within two months. At my request, the chaplain forwards to her the necessary permission, and I impatiently await the first friendly face in two years. 3. As unaccountably as my punishment in the solitary comes the relief at the expiration of three weeks, the K. Hallboy is still in the hospital, and I resume the duties of range man. The guards eye me with suspicion and greater vigilance, but I soon unravel the tangled skein and learn the details of the abortive escape that caused my temporary retirement. The lock of my neighbor, Johnny Smith, had been tampered with. The youth, in solitary at the time, necessarily had the aid of another, it being impossible to reach the keyhole from the inside of the cell. The suspicion of the warden centered upon me, but investigation by the stools discovered the men actually concerned, and Dutch Adams, Spencer, Smith, and Jim Grant were chastised in the dungeon, and are now locked up, for cause, on my range. By degrees Johnny confides to me the true story of the frustrated plan. Dutch, a repeater serving his fifth bit and favourite of Hopkins, procured a piece of old iron and had it fashioned into a key in the machine shop where he was employed. He entrusted the rude instrument to Grant, a young reformatory boy, for a preliminary trial. The guileless youth easily walked into the trap, and the makeshift key was broken in the lock. With disastrous results, the tricked boys now swear vengeance upon the provocateur, but Dutch is missing from the range. He has been removed to an upper gallery, and is assigned to a coveted position in the shops. The newspapers print vivid stories of the desperate attempt to escape from Riverside, and compliment Captain Wright and the officers for so successfully protecting the community. The warden is deeply affected, and orders the additional punishment of the offenders with a bread-and-water diet. The deputy walks with inflated chest. Hopkins issues orders curtailing the privileges of the inmates, and inflicting greater hardships. The tone of the guard's sounds haughtier, more peremptory. Jasper's face wears a blissful smile. The trustees look pleased and cheerful, but sullen gloom shrouds the prison. 4. I am standing at my cell when the door of the rotunda slowly opens and the warden approaches me. A lady just called, Miss Garrison, from New York. Do you know her? She is one of my friends. I dismissed her. You can't see her. Why? The rules entitle me to a visit every three months. I have had none in two years. I want to see her. You can't. She needs a permit. The chaplain sent her one at my request. A member of the board of inspectors rescinded it by telegraph. What inspector? You can't question me. Your visitor has been refused admittance. Will you tell me the reason, warden? No reason. No reason whatever. He turns on his heel when I detain him. Warden, it's two years since I've been in the dungeon. I am in the first grade now. They point to the recently earned dark suit. I am entitled to all the privileges. Why am I deprived of visits? Not another word. He disappears through the yard door. From the galleries I hear the jeering of a trusty. A guard nearby brings his thumb to his nose and wriggles his fingers in my direction. Humiliated and angry, I return to the cell to find the monthly letter sheet on my table. I pour out all the bitterness of my heart to the girl, dwell on the warden's discrimination against me, and repeat our conversation and his refusal to admit my visitor. In conclusion, I direct her to have a Pittsburgh lawyer apply to the courts to force the prison authorities to restore to me the privileges allowed by the law to the ordinary prisoner. I drop the letter in the mailbox, hoping that my outburst and the threat of the law will induce the warden to retreat from his position. The girl will, of course, understand the significance of the epistle, aware that my reference to a court process is a diplomatic subterfuge for effect and not meant to be acted upon. But the next day the chaplain returns the letter to me. Not so rash, my boy, he warns me not unkindly. Be patient, I'll see what I can do for you. But the letter, chaplain, you've wasted your paper, Alec. I can't pass this letter, but just keep quiet, and I'll look into the matter. Weeks pass in evasive replies. Finally the chaplain advises a personal interview with the warden. The latter refers me to the inspectors. To each member of the board I address a request for a few minutes' conversation, but a month goes by without a word from the high officials. The friendly runner, Southside Johnny, offers to give me an opportunity to speak to an inspector on the payment of ten plugs of tobacco. Unfortunately, I cannot spare my small allowance. 
but I tender him a dollar bill of the money the girl sent me, artfully concealed in the buckle of a pair of suspenders. The runner is highly elated, and assures me of success, directing me to keep careful watch on the yard door. Several days later, passing along the range, engaged in my duties, I noticed Southside entering from the yard, in friendly conversation with a strange gentleman in citizen clothes. For a moment I do not realize the situation, but the next instant I am aware of Johnny's violent efforts to attract my attention. He pretends to show the man some fancy work made by the inmates, all the while drawing him closer to my door, with surreptitious nods at me. I approach my cell. "'This is Berkman, Mr. Nevin, the man who shot Frick,' Johnny remarks. The gentleman turns to me with a look of interest. "'Good morning, Berkman,' he says pleasantly. "'How long are you doing?' Twenty-two years. I'm sorry to hear that. It's rather a long sentence. Do you know who I am? Inspector Nevin, I believe. Yes. You have never seen me before? No, I sent a request to see you recently. When was that? A month ago. Strange. I was in the office three weeks ago. There was no note from you on my file. Are you sure you sent one? Quite sure. I sent a request to each inspector. What's the trouble? I inform him briefly that I have been deprived of visiting privileges. Somewhat surprised, he glances at my dark clothes and remarks, You are in the first grade, and therefore entitled to visits. When did you have your last visitor? Two years ago. Two years? he asks, almost incredulously. Did the lady from New York have a permit? The warden hurriedly enters from the yard. Mr. Nevin, he calls out anxiously, I be looking for you. Berkman was just telling me about his visitor being sent away, Captain. The inspector remarks. Yes, yes, the warden smiles forcedly. For cause. Oh. The face of Mr. Nevin assumes a grave look. Berkman, he turns to me. You'll have to apply to the secretary of the board, Mr. Breed. I am not familiar with the internal affairs. The warden links his arm with the inspector, and they walk toward the yard door. At the entrance they are met by Dutch, Adams, the shop messenger. Good morning, Mr. Nevin. The trustee greets him. Won't you issue me a special visit? My mother is sick. She wants to see me. The warden grins at the ready fiction. "'When did you have your last visit?' the inspector inquires. Two weeks ago.' "'You are entitled to one only every three months.' "'That is why I asked you for an extra, Mr. Inspector,' Dutch reports boldly. "'I know you are a kind man.' Mr. Nevin smiles good-naturedly and glances at the warden. "'Dutch is all right,' the captain nods. The inspector draws his visiting card, pencils on it, and hands it to the prisoner. End of Section 30 Recording by Stephen Harvey Section 31 of Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bo Wood Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman Section 31 Chapter 24 Thoughts That Stole Out of Prison April 2nd, 1896 My dear girl, I have craved for a long, long time to have a free talk with you but this is the first opportunity. A good friend, a lover of horse flesh, promised to see this birdie through. I hope it will reach you safely. In my local correspondence, you have been christened the immutable. I realize how difficult it is to keep up letter writing through the endless years, the points of mutual interest gradually waning. It is one of the tragedies in the existence of a prisoner. K and G have almost ceased to expect mail. But I am more fortunate. The twin writes very seldom nowadays. The correspondence of other friends is fitful. But you are never disappointing. It is not so much the contents that matter, these increasingly sound like the language of a strange world, with its bewildering flurry and ferment, disturbing the calm of cell life. But the very arrival of a letter is momentous. It brings a glow into the prisoner's heart to feel that he is remembered actively, 
with that intimate interest which alone can support a regular correspondence. And then your letters are so vital, so palpitating with the throb of our common cause. I have greatly enjoyed your communications from Paris and Vienna, the accounts of the movement and of our European comrades. Your letters are so much part of yourself. They bring me nearer to you and to life. The newspaper clippings you have referred to on various occasions have been withheld from me, nor are any radical publications permitted. I especially regret to miss Solidarity. I have not seen a single copy since its resurrection two years ago. I have followed the activities of Charles W. Mowbray and the recent tour of John Turner, so far as the press accounts are concerned. I hope you'll write more about our English comrades. I need not say much of the local life, dear. That you know from my official mail. And you can read between the lines. The action of the pardon board was a bitter disappointment to me. No less to you also, I suppose. Not that I was very enthusiastic as to a favorable decision. But that they should so cynically evade the issue. I was hardly prepared for that. I had hoped they would at least consider the case. But evidently, they were averse to going on record one way or another. The lawyers informed me that they were not even allowed an opportunity to present their arguments. The board ruled that the wrong complained of is not actual. That is, that I am not yet serving the sentence we want remitted. A lawyer's quibble. It means that I must serve the first sentence of seven years before applying for the remission of the other indictments. Discounting commutation time, I still have about a year to complete the first sentence. I doubt whether it is advisable to try again. Little justice can be expected from those quarters. But I want to submit another proposition to you Consult with our friends regarding it. It is this. There is a prisoner here who has just been pardoned by the board, whose president, the lieutenant governor, is indebted to the prisoner's lawyer for certain political services. The attorney's name is K. D. of Pittsburgh. He has intimated to his client that he will guarantee my release for $1,000, the sum to be deposited in safe hands and to be paid only in case of success. Of course, we cannot afford such a large fee, and I cannot say whether the offer is worth considering. Still, you know that almost anything can be bought from politicians. I leave the matter in your hands. The question of my visit seems tacitly settled. I can procure no permit for my friends to see me. For some obscure reason, the warden has conceived a great fear of an anarchist plot against the prison. The local trio is under special surveillance and constantly discriminated against, though K and G are permitted to receive visits. You will smile at the infantile terror of the authorities. It is brooded about that a certain anarchist lady, meaning you, I presume, in reality it was Henry's sweetheart, a jolly, devil-may-care girl, made a threat against the prison. The gossips have it that she visited Inspector Reed at his business place and requested to see me. The inspector refusing, she burst out, Well, blow your dirty walls down! I could not determine whether there is any foundation for the story, 
But it is circulated here, and the prisoners firmly believe it explains my deprivation of visits. This is a characteristic instance of local conditions. Voluntarily, I smile at Kennan's naive indignation with the brutalities he thinks possible only in Russian and Siberian prisons. He would find it almost impossible to learn the true conditions in the American prisons. He would be conducted the rounds of the show cells, always neat and clean for the purpose. He would not see the basket cell, nor the bull rings in the dungeon where the men are chained for days, nor would he be permitted to converse for hours or whole evenings with the prisoners, as he did with the exiles in Siberia. Yet, if he succeeded in learning even half the truth, he would be forced to revise his views of American penal institutions as he did in regard to Russian politicals. He would be horrified to witness the brutality that is practiced here as a matter of routine, the abuse of the insane, the petty persecution. Inhumanity is the keynote of stupidity and power. Your soul must have been harrowed by the reports of the terrible tortures in Manchuic. What is all indignation and lamenting in the face of the revival of the Inquisition? Is there no nemesis in Spain? End of section 31. Recording by Bo Wood. Section 32 of Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine Lehman, Reseda, California. Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman. Section 32. Chapter 25. How Shall the Depths Cry? 1. The change of seasons varies the tone of the prison. A cheerier atmosphere pervades the shops and the cell house in the summer. The block is airier and lighter. The guards relax their stern look in anticipation of their vacations. The men hopefully count the hours till their approaching freedom, and the gates open daily to release someone going back to the world. But heavy gloom broods over the prison in winter. The windows are closed and nailed. The vitiated air, artificially heated, is suffocating with dryness. Smoke darkens the shops, and the cells are in constant dusk. Tasks grow heavier, the punishments more severe. The officers look sullen, the men are morose and discontented. The ravings of the insane become wilder, suicides more frequent, despair and hopelessness oppress every heart. The undercurrent of rebellion, swelling with mute suffering and repression, turbulently sweeps the barriers. The severity of the authorities increases, methods of penalizing are more drastic, the prisoners fret, wax more querulous, and turn desperate with blind, spasmodic defiance. But among the more intelligent inmates, dissatisfaction manifests more coherent expression. The Lexow investigation in New York has awakened an echo in the prison. A movement is quietly initiated among the solitaries, looking toward an investigation of Riverside. I keep busy helping the men exchange notes maturing the project. Great care must be exercised to guard against treachery. Only men of proved reliability may be entrusted with the secret, and precautions taken that no officer or stool sent our design. The details of the campaign are planned on K range, with Billy Ryan, Butch, Sloan, and Jimmy Grant as the most trustworthy in command. It is decided that the attack upon the management of the penitentiary is to be initiated from the outside. 
a released prisoner is to inform the press of the abuses graft and immorality rampant in riverside the public will demand an investigation the cabal on the range will supply the investigators with data and facts that will rouse the conscience of the community and cause the dismissal of the warden and the introduction of reforms a prisoner about to be discharged is selected for the important mission of enlightening the press in great anxiety and expectation we await the newspapers the day following his liberation we scan the pages closely not a word of the penitentiary probably the released man has not yet had an opportunity to visit the editors in the joy of freedom he may have looked too deeply into the cup that cheers he will surely interview the papers the next day but the days pass into weeks without any reference in the press to the prison the trusted man has failed us the revelation of the life at riverside is of a nature not to be ignored by the press the discharged inmate has proved false to his promise bitterly the solitaries denounce him and resolve to select a more reliable man among the first candidates for liberty one after another a score of men are entrusted with the mission to the press but the papers remain silent anxiously though every day less hopefully we search their columns ryan cynically derides the faithlessness of convict promises butch rages and at the traitors but sloane is sternly confident in his own probity and cheers me as i pause at his cell never mind them rats alec you just wait till i go out here's the boy that'll keep his promise all right what i won't do to old sandy ain't worth mentionin why you still have two years ed i remind him not on your tintype alec only one and a stump how big is the stump well he chuckles looking somewhat diffident it's one year eleven months and twenty-seven days it ain't no two years though see jimmy grant grows peculiarly reserved evidently disinclined to talk he seeks to avoid me the treachery of the released men fills him with resentment and suspicion of every one he is impatient of my suggestion that the fault may lie with a servile press at the mention of our plans he bursts out savagely forget it you're no good none of you let me be he turns his back to me and angrily paces the cell his actions fill me with concern the youth seems strangely changed fortunately his time is almost served two like wildfire the news circles the prison the papers are giving sandy hell the air in the block trembles with suppressed excitement jimmy grant recently released had sent a communication to the state board of charities bringing serious charges against the management of riverside the press publishes startlingly significant excerpts from grant's letter editorially however the indictment is ignored by the majority of the pittsburgh papers one writer comments ambiguously in guarded language suggesting the improbability of the horrible practices alleged by grant another eulogizes warden wright as an intelligent and humane man who has the interest of the prisoners at heart the detailed accusations are briefly dismissed as unworthy of notice because coming from a disgruntled criminal who had not found prison life to his liking only the leader and the dispatch consider the matter seriously refer to the numerous complaints from discharged prisoners and suggest the advisability of an investigation they urge upon the warden the necessity of disproving once for all the derogatory statements regarding his management within a few days the president of the board of charities announces his decision to look over the penitentiary december is on the wane and the board is expected to visit riverside after the holidays three k and g of course neither of you has any more faith in alleged investigations than myself 
the Lexow investigation, which shocked the whole country with its expose of police corruption, has resulted in practically nothing. One or two subordinates have been scapegoated. Those higher up went unscathed, as usual. The system itself remains in statu quo. The one who has mostly profited by the spasm of morality is Goff, to whom the vice-crusade afforded an opportunity to rise from obscurity into the national limelight. Parkhurst also has subsided, probably content with the enlarged size of his flock and salary. To give the devil his due, however, I admired his perseverance and courage in face of the storm of ridicule and scorn that met his initial accusations against the glorious police department of the metropolis. But though every charge has been proved in the most absolute manner, the situation as a whole remains unchanged. It is the history of all investigations. As the Germans say, you can't convict the devil in the court of his mother-in-law. It has again been demonstrated by the congressional inquiry into the Carnegie blowhole armor plate, in the terrible revelations regarding Superintendent Brockway, of the Elmira Reformatory, a veritable den for maiming and killing, and in numerous other instances— Warden Wright also was investigated about ten years ago. A double set of books was then found, disclosing peculation of appropriations and theft of the prison product. Brutality and murder were uncovered, yet Sandy has remained in his position. We can, therefore, expect nothing from the proposed investigation by the Board of Charities. I have no doubt it will be a whitewash. But I think that we, the anarchist trio, should show our solidarity and aid the inmates with our best efforts. We must prevent the investigation resulting in a farce, so far as evidence against the management is concerned. We should leave the board no loophole, no excuse of a lack of witnesses or proofs to support Grant's charges. I am confident you will agree with me in this. I am collecting data for presentation to the investigators. I am also preparing a list of volunteer witnesses. I have 17 numbers on my range and others from various parts of this block and from the shops. They all seem anxious to testify, though I am sure some will weaken when the critical moment arrives. Several have already notified me to erase their names, but we shall have a sufficient number of witnesses. We want, preferably, such men as have personally suffered a clubbing, the bull ring, hanging by the wrists, or other punishment forbidden by the law. I have already notified the warden that I wish to testify before the investigation committee. My purpose was to anticipate his objection that there are already enough witnesses. I am the first on the list now. The completeness of the case against the authorities will surprise you. Fortunately, my position as rangeman has enabled me to gather whatever information I needed. I will send you tomorrow duplicates of the evidence to ensure greater safety for our material. For the present, I append a partial list of our exhibits. 1. Cigarettes and outside tobacco, bottle of whiskey and dope, dice, playing cards, cash money, several knives, two razors, postage stamps, outside mail, and other contraband. These are for the purpose of proving the warden a liar in denying to the press the existence of gambling in the prison, the selling of bakery and kitchen provisions for cash, the possession of weapons, and the possibility of underground communications. 2. Prison-made beer. A demonstration of the staleness of our bread and the absence of potatoes in the soup. The beer is made from fermented yeast stolen by the trustees from the bakery, also from potatoes. 3. Favoritism, special privileges of trustees, political jobs, the system of stool espionage. 4. Pennsylvania diet, basket, dungeon, 
cuffing and chaining up, neglect of the sick, punishment of the insane. 5. Names and numbers of men maltreated and clubbed. 6. Data of assaults and cutting of phrase in connection with kid business, the existence of which the warden absolutely denies. 7. Special case of A444, who attacked the warden in church because of jealousy of Lady Goldie. 8. Graft. A. Hosiery Department. Fake labels, fictitious names of manufacture, false book entries. B. Broom Shop. Convict labor hired out, contrary to law, to Lang Brothers, broom manufacturers of Allegheny, Pennsylvania. Goods sold to the United States government through sham middleman. Labels bear legend Union Broom. Sample enclosed. C. Mats, matting, mops. Product not stamped. D. Shoe and tailor shops. Prison materials used for the private needs of the warden, the officers, and their families. E. $75,000 appropriated by the state. 1893, for a new chapel. The bricks of the old building used for the new, except one outside layer. All the work done by prisoners. Architect Mr. A. Wright, the warden's son. Actual cost of chapel, $7,000. The inmates forced to attend services to overcrowd the old church. After the desired appropriation was secured, attendance became optional. F. Library. The 25-cent tax exacted from every unofficial visitor is supposed to go to the book fund. About 50 visitors per day, the year round. No new books added to the library in 10 years. Old duplicates donated by the public libraries of Pittsburgh are catalogued as purchased new books. G. Robbing the prisoners of remuneration for their labor. See copy of Act of 1883, P.L. 112. Law on Prison Labor and Wages of Convicts, Act of 1883, June 13, P.L. 112. Section 1. At the expiration of existing contracts, wardens are directed to employ the convicts under their control for and in behalf of the state. Section 2. No labor shall be hired out by contract. Section 4. All convicts under the control of the state and county officers and all inmates of reformatory institutions engaged in the manufacture of articles for general consumption shall receive quarterly wages equal to the amount of their earnings to be fixed from time to time by the authorities of the institution from which board lodging clothing and costs of trial shall be deducted and the balance paid to their families or dependents in case none such appear the amount shall be paid to the convict at the expiration of his term of imprisonment the prisoners receive no payment whatever even for overtime work except occasionally a slice of pork for supper k g Plant this and other material I'll send you in a safe place. End of section 32. Recording by Christine Lehman, Reseda, California. Section 33 of Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chad Horner from Ballyclare in County Antrim, Northern Ireland. Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman. Part 1, Chapter 26. Hiding the Evidence. It is New Year's Eve. An air of pleasant anticipation fills the prison. Tomorrow's feast is the exciting subject of conversation. Roast beef will be served for dinner with a goodly loaf of currant bread and two cigars for dessert extra men have been drafted for the kitchen they flit from block to yard looking busy and important yet halting 
every passer-by to whisper with secretive mind don't say i told you sweet potatoes to-morrow the younger inmates seem sceptical and strive to appear indifferent the while they hover about the yard door nostrils expanded sniffing the appetizing wafts from the kitchen here and there an old-timer grumbles we should have had sweet murphy's for christmas too high-priced sandy said they sneer in ill-humour the new arrivals grow uneasy perhaps they are still too expensive some study the market quotations on the delicacy but the chief cook drops in to visit his boy and confides to the rangeman that the sweet potatoes are a sure thing just arrived in county the happy news is whispered about with confident assurance yet tinged with anxiety there is great rejoicing among the men only soul the lifer is querulous he doesn't care a snap about the extra feed stomach still sour from the christmas dinner and anyhow it only makes the week a day grub more disgusting the rules are somewhat relaxed the hall men converse freely the yard gangs lounge about in cluster in little groups that separate at the approach of a superior officer men from the bakery and kitchen run in and out of the block their pockets bulging suspiciously what are you after the doorkeeper halts them oh just my sale forgot my handkerchief the guard answers the sly wink with an indulgent smile all right go ahead but don't be long if papa mitchell is about he thunders at the chief cook his bosom swelling with packages what you got there eh big family of kids you have jim first thing you know you'll wipe the hinges off the kitchen door the envied bakery and kitchen employees supply their friends with extra holiday tidbits and the solitaries dance in glee at the sight of the savoury dainty the fresh brown bread generously dotted with sweet currants it is the prelude of the promised culinary symphony the evening is cheerful with mirth and jollity the prisoners at first converse in whispers then become bolder and talk louder through the bars as night approaches the cell-house rings with unreserved hilarity and animation light-hearted chaff mingled with coarse jests and droll humour a wag of upper tier banters the passing guards his quips and sallies setting the adjoining cells in roar an inspiring imitation slowly the babble of tongues subsides as the gong sounds the order to retire someone shouts to a distant friend hey bill are you there ye yes stay there it grows quiet when suddenly my neighbour on the left sings songs fellers who's going to set up with me to greet new years a dozen voices yell with their acceptance little frenchy the spirited grey head on the top tier vociferates shrilly me too boys i'm viz you all night all is still in the cell house save for a wild indian whip now and then by the vigil keeping boys the block breathes in heavy sleep loud snoring sounds from the gallery above only the irregular thread of the felt soled guards fall muffled in the silence the clock in the upper rotunda strikes the midnight hour a siren on the ohio intones its deep chested bass another joins it then another shrill factory whistles pierce the boom of cannon the sweet chimes of a nearby church ring in joyful melody between instantly the prison is astir tin cans rattle against iron bars doors shake in fury beds and chairs squeak and screech pans slam on the floor shoes crash against the walls with a dull thud and rebound noisily on the stone unearthly yelling shouting and whistling rend the air an inventive prisoner beats a wild tattoo with a pin pan on the table a veritable bedlam of frenzy has broken loose in both wings the prisoners are celebrating the advent of the new year the voices grow hoarse and feeble the tin clanks languidly against the iron the grating of the doors sounds weaker the men are exhausted with the unwanted effort the guards stumbled up the galleries their forms swaying unsteadily in the faint flicker of the gaslight in maudlin tones they command silence and bid the men retire to bed the younger more daring challenge the order with husky howls and cat calls a defiant shout a groan and all is quiet daybreak wakes the turmoil and uproar for twenty-four hours the long repressed animal spirits are rampant no music or recreation hours honours the new year the day is passed in the sale the prisoners securely barred and locked are permitted to vent their pain and sorrow their yearnings and hopes in a saturnalia of tumult part two 
the month of january brings sedulous activity shops and block are overhauled every hook and corner is scarred and a special squad detailed to whitewash the sails the yearly clean-up not being due till spring i conclude from the unusual preparations that the expected visit of the board of charities is approaching the prisoners are agog with the coming investigation the solitaries and prospective witnesses are on the qui vive anxious lines on their faces some manifest fear of the ill will of the warden as the probable result of their testimony i seek to encourage them by promising to assume full responsibility but several men withdraw their previous consent the safety of my data causes me grave concern in view of the increasing frequency of searches deliberation finally resolves itself into the bold plan of searching my most valuable material in the cell set aside for the use of the officers it is the first cell on the range it is never locked and is ignored at searches because it is not occupied by prisoners the little bundle protected with a piece of oilskin procured from the dispensary soon reposes in the depths of the waste pipe a stout cord secures it from being washed away by the rush of water when the privy is in use i call officer mitchell's attention to the dusty condition of the cell and offer to sweep it every morning and afternoon he exceeds in an off-hand manner and twice daily i surreptitiously examine the tension of the water soaked cord renewing the string repeatedly other material and copies of my exhibits are deposited with several trustworthy friends on the range everything is ready for the investigation and we confidently await the coming of the board of charities part three the sale house rejoices at the absence of scott woods the block captain of the morning has been reduced to the ranks the disgrace is signalized by his appearance in the wall pacing the narrow path in the chilly winter blasts the guards look upon the assignment as punishment day for incurring the displeasure of the warden the keepers smile at the indiscreet scout interfering with the self-granted privileges of southside johnny one of the warden's favorites the runner who afforded me an opportunity to see inspector nevin came out victorious in the struggle with woods the latter was upbraided by captain wright in the presence of johnny who is now officially authorized in his prerequisites sufficient time was allowed to elapse to avoid comment whereupon the officer was drawn from the block i regret his absence a severe disciplinarian woods was yet very exceptional among the guards in that he sought to discourage the spying of prisoners on each other he frowned upon the trustees and strove to treat the men impartially mitchell has been changed to the morning shift to fill the vacancy made by the transfer of woods the charge of the block in the afternoon devolves upon officer mcgillivian a very corpulent man with sharp steely eyes he is considerably above the average warder in intelligence but extremely fond of jasper who now acts as his assistant the obese turnkey rarely leaving his seat at the front desk changes of keepers transfers from the shops to the two cell houses are frequent the new guards are alert and active almost daily the warden visits the ranges leaving in his wake more stringent discipline rarely do i find a chance to pause at the cells i keep in touch with the men through the medium of notes but one day several fights breaking out in the shops the block officers are requisitioned to assist in placing the combatants in the punishment cells the front is deserted and i improve the opportunity to talk to the solitaries jasper southside and bob runyon the politicians also converse at the doors bob standing suspiciously close to the bars suddenly officer mcgillvane appears in the yard door his face is flushed his eyes filling with wrath as they fasten on the men at the cells hey you fellows get away from there he shouts confound you all the old man just gave me the juice too much talking in the block i won't stand for it that's all he adds petulantly within half an hour i am hauled before the warden he looks worried deep lines of anxiety about his mouth you are reported for standing at the doors he snarls at me what are you always telling the men it's the first time the officer nothing of the kind he interrupts you're always talking to the prisoners they are in punishment and you have no business with them why was i picked out others talk too yes he drawls sarcastically then turning to the keeper he says how is that officer the man is charging you with neglect of duty i am not charging silence what have you to say mr mcgillvane 
the guard reddens with suppressed rage it isn't true captain he replies there was no one except berkman you hear what the officer says you're always breaking the rules you're plotting i know you pulling a dozen wires you are inimical to the management of the institution but i will break your connections officers take him directly to south wing you understand he is not to return to his cell have it searched at once thoroughly lock him up warden what for i demanded i have not done anything to lose my position talking is not such a serious charge very serious very serious you're too dangerous on the range i'll spoil your infernal schemes by removing you from the north block you've been there too long i want to remain there the more reason to take you away that will do now no it won't i burst out i'll stay where i am remove him mr mcilvane i am taken to the south wing and locked up in a vacant cell neglected and ill-smelling it is number two range m the first gallery facing the yard a double cell somewhat larger than those of the north block and containing a small window the walls are damp and bare save for the cupboard of printed rules and the prison calendar it is the twenty seventh of february eighteen ninety six but the calendar is of last year indicating that the cell has not been occupied since the previous november it contains the usual furnishings bedstead and soiled straw mattress a small table and a chair it feels cold and dreary in thought i picture the guards ransacking my former cell they will not discover anything my material is well hidden the warden evidently suspects my plans he fears my testimony before the investigation committee my removal is to sever my connections and now it is impossible for me to reach my data i must return to north block otherwise all our plans are doomed to fail i can't leave my friends on the range in the lurch some of them have already signified to the chaplain their desire to testify their statements will remain unsupported in the absence of my proofs i must rejoin them i have told the warden that i shall remain where i was but he probably ignored it as an empty boast i consider the situation and resolve to break up housekeeping it is the sole means of being transferred to the other shell house it will involve the loss of the grade and a trip to the dungeon perhaps even a fight with the keepers the guards fearing the broken furniture will be used for defence generally rush the prisoner with blackjacks but my return to the north wing will be assured no man in stripes can remain in the south wing alert for an approaching step i untie my shoes producing a scrap of paper a pencil and a knife i write a hurried note to k briefly informing him of the new developments and intimating that our data are safe guardedly i attract the attention of the runner on the floor beneath it is bill say through whom carl occasionally communicates with g the note rolled into a little ball i ship between the bars to the waiting prisoner now everything is prepared it is near supper time the men are coming back from work it would be advisable to wait till everybody is locked in and the shop officers depart home there will then be only three guards on duty in the block but i am in a fever of indignation and anger furiously snatching up the chair i start breaking up end of section thirty three recording by chad horner from ballyclare in county antrim northern ireland Section 34 of Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Edwards. January 20th, 2020. Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman. Chapter 27. Love's Dungeon Flower. The dungeon smells foul and musty. The darkness is almost visible, the silence oppressive. But the terror of my former experience has abated. I shall probably be kept in the underground cell for a longer time than on the previous occasion. My offense is considered very grave. Three charges have been entered against me. Destroying state property, having possession of a knife, and uttering a threat against the warden. When I saw the officers gathering at my back, 
while I was facing the captain, I realized its significance. They were preparing to assault me. Quickly, advancing to the warden, I shook my fist in his face, crying, If they touch me, I'll hold you personally responsible. He turned pale. Trying to steady his voice, he demanded, What do you mean? How dare you? I mean just what I say. I won't be clubbed. My friends will avenge me, too. He glanced at the guard standing rigid in ominous silence. One by one they retired, only two remaining, and I was taken quietly to the dungeon. The stillness is broken by a low, muffled sound. I listen intently. It is someone pacing the cell at the further end of the passage. Hello, who's there? I shout. No reply. The pacing continues. It must be silent Nick. He never talks. I prepare to pass the night on the floor. It is bare. There is no bed or blanket, and I have been deprived of my coat and shoes. It is freezing in the cell. My feet grow numb, hands cold as I huddle in the corner, my head leaning against the reeking wall, my body on the stone floor. I try to think, but my thoughts are wandering, my brain frigid. The rattling of keys wakes me from my stupor. Guards are descending into the dungeon. I wonder whether it is morning, but they pass my cell. It is not yet breakfast time. Now they pause and whisper. I recognize the mumbling speech of Deputy Greaves as he calls out to the silent prisoner. Want a drink? The double doors open noisily. Here. Give me the cup. The hoarse bass resembles that of Crazy Smithy. His centaurian voice sounds cracked since he was shot in the neck by Officer Dean. You can't have the cup, the deputy fumes. I won't drink out of your hand, goddamn you. Think I'm a cur, do you? Smithy swears and curses savagely. The doors are slammed and locked. The steps grow faint and all is silent, save the quickened footfall of Smith, who will not talk to any prisoner. I pass the long night in drowsy stupor, rousing at times to strain my ear for every sound from the rotunda above, wondering whether day is breaking. The minutes drag in dismal darkness. The loud clanking of the keys tingles in my ears like sweet music. It is morning. The guards hand me the day's allowance, two ounces of white bread and a quart of water. The wheat tastes sweet. It seems to me I've never eaten anything so delectable. But the liquid is insipid and nauseates me. At almost one bite, I swallow the slice so small and thin. It wets my appetite, and I feel ravenously hungry. At Smith's door, the scene of the previous evening is repeated. The deputy insists that the man drink out of the cup held by a guard. The prisoner refuses with a profuse flow of profanity. Suddenly there is a splash followed by a startled cry and the thud of the cell bucket on the floor. Smith has emptied the contents of his privy upon the officers. In confusion they rush out of the dungeon. Presently I hear the clatter of many feet in the cellar. There is a hubbub of suppressed voices. I recognize the rasping whisper of Hopkins, the tones of Woods, McIlvain, and others. I catch the words, both sides at once. Several cells in the dungeon are provided with double entrances, front and back, to facilitate attacks upon obstreperous prisoners. Smith is always assigned to one of these cells. I shudder as I realize that the officers are preparing to club the demented man. He has been weakened by years of unbroken solitary confinement, and his throat still bleeds occasionally from the bullet wound. Almost half his time he has been kept in the dungeon, and now he has been missing from the range twelve days. It is... Involuntarily I shut my eyes at the fearful thud of the riot clubs. The hours drag on. The monotony is broken by the keepers bringing another prisoner to the dungeon. I hear his violent sobbing from the depth of the cavern. Who is there? I hail him. I call repeatedly without receiving an answer. Perhaps the new arrival is afraid of listening guards. Ho, oh, man, I sing out. The screws have gone. Who are you? This is Alec, Alec Berkman. 
Is that you, Alec? This is Johnny. There is a familiar ring about the young voice, broken by piteous moans, but I failed to identify it. What Johnny? Johnny Davis, you know, stocking shop. I've just killed a man. In bewilderment, I listened to the story told with bursts of weeping. Johnny had returned to the shop. He thought he would try again. He wanted to earn his good time. Things went well for a while, till Dutch Adams became shop runner. He is the stool who got Grant and Johnny Smith in trouble with a fake key, and Davis would have nothing to do with him. But Dutch persisted, pestering him all the time, and then... Well, you know, Alec, the boy seemed diffident. He lied about me like hell. He told the fellows he used me. Christ, my mother might hear about it. I couldn't stand it, Alec. Honest to God, I couldn't. I, I killed the lying cur, and now, now I'll swing for it, he sobs as if his heart would break. A touch of tenderness for the poor boy is in my voice as I strive to condole with him and utter the hope that it may not be so bad after all. Perhaps Adams will not die. He is a powerful man, big and strong. He may survive. Johnny eagerly clutches at the straw. He grows more cheerful, and we talk of the coming investigation and local affairs. Perhaps the board will even clear him, he suggests. But suddenly, seized with fear, he weeps and moans again. More men are cast into the dungeon. They bring news from the world above. An epidemic of fighting seems to have broken out in the wake of recent orders. The total inhibition of talking is resulting in more serious offenses. Kid Tommy is enlarging upon his trouble. You see, fellers, he cries in a treble, dat skunk of a Pete, he pushes me into line, and I turns round to give him hell, but de screw pipes me, got no chance to chew, so I turns and biffs him on de jaw, see? But he is sure, he says, to be let out at night, or in the morning at most. Them fellers that was scrapping yesterday in de yard didn't go to the hole. They just put him in de cell. Sandy knows de committee's coming all right. Johnny interrupts the loquacious boy to inquire anxiously about Dutch Adams, and I share his joy at hearing that the man's wound is not serious. He was cut about the shoulders, but was able to walk unassisted to the hospital. Johnny overflows with quiet happiness. The others dance and sing. I recite a poem from Nekrasov. The boys don't understand a word, but the sorrow-laden tones appeal to them, and they request more Russian pieces. But Tommy is more interested in politics and is bristling with the latest news from the McGee camp. He is a great admirer of Quay. There's a smart guy for you fellows. Owns the whole keystone shebang all right all right he's boss quay you bet you he dives into national issues rails at brian 16 to 1 bill you just listen to him he'll give 16 dollars to every one he will knit and the boys are soon involved in a heated discussion of the respective merits of the two political parties tommy staunchly siding with the republican my grandfather and me father was republicans he vociferates and all me brothers vote de ticket. Me for de grand old party every time. Someone twits him on his political wisdom, challenging the boy to explain the difference in the money standards. Tommy boldly appeals to me to corroborate him. But before I have an opportunity to speak, he launches upon other issues, berating Spain for her atrocities in Cuba and insisting that this free country cannot tolerate slavery at its doors. Every topic is discussed, with Tommy orating at top speed and continually broaching new subjects. Unexpectedly, he reverts to local affairs, waxes reminiscent over former days, and loudly smacks his lips at the great feeds he enjoyed on the rare occasions when he was free to roam the back streets of Smoky City. Say, Alec, my boy, he calls to me familiarly. Many a penny I made on you, all right, how? Why? Peddling extras, of course. Say, dem was fine days, all right. Easy money. Papers went like hotcakes off the griddle. Wish you'd do it again, Alec. Invisible to each other, we chat, exchange stories and anecdotes, the boys talking incessantly as if fearful of silence. But every now and then there is a lull. We become quiet, each absorbed in his own thoughts. 
The pauses lengthen, lengthen into silence. Only the faint steps of Crazy Smith disturb the deep stillness. Late in the evening, the young prisoners are relieved, but Johnny remains and his apprehensions reawaken. Repeatedly during the night, he rouses me from my drowsy chirper to be reassured that he is not in danger of the gallows and that he will not be tried for his assault. I allay his fears by dwelling on the warden's aversion to giving publicity to the sex practices in the prison and remind the boy of the captain's official denial of their existence. These things happen almost every week, yet no one has ever been taken to court from Riverside on such charges. Johnny grows more tranquil, and we converse about his family history, talking in a frank, confidential manner. With a glow of pleasure, I become aware of the note of tenderness in his voice. Presently, he surprises me by asking, Friend Alec, what do they call you in Russian? He prefers the fond Sashenka, enunciating the strange word with quaint endearment, then diffidently confesses dislike for his own name and relates the story he had recently read of a poor castaway Cuban youth. Felipe was his name, and he was just like himself. Shall I call you Felipe, I offer? Yes, please do, Alec, dear. No, Sashenka. The springs of affection well up within me as I lie huddled on the stone floor, cold and hungry. With closed eyes I picture the boy before me with his delicate face and sensitive girlish lips. Good night, dear Sashenka, he calls. Good night, little Felipe. In the morning we are served with a slice of bread and water. I am tormented with thirst and hunger, and the small ration fails to assuage my sharp pangs. Smithy still refuses to drink out of the deputy's hand. His doors remain unopened. With tremulous anxiety, Johnny begs the deputy warden to tell him how much longer he will remain in the dungeon, but Graves curtly commands silence, applying a vile epithet to the boy. Deputy, I call, boiling over with indignation. He asked you a respectful question. I'd give him a decent answer. You mind your own business, you hear? He retorts. But I persist in defending my young friend and berate the deputy for his language. He hastens away in a towering passion, menacing me with what Smithy got. Johnny is distressed at being the innocent cause of the trouble. The threat of the deputy disquiets him, and he warns me to prepare. My cell is provided with a double entrance, and I am apprehensive of a sudden attack. But the hours pass without the deputy returning, and our fears are allayed. The boy rejoices on my account and brims over with appreciation of my intercession. The incident cements our intimacy. Our first diffidence disappears, and we become openly tender and affectionate. The conversation lags. We feel weak and worn. But every little while we hail each other with words of encouragement. Smithy incessantly paces the cell. The gnawing of the river rats reaches our ears. The silence is frequently pierced by the wild yells of the insane man, startling us with dread foreboding. The quiet grows unbearable, and Johnny calls again. What are you doing, Sashenka? Oh, nothing. Just thinking, Felipe. Am I in your thoughts, dear? Yes, Kitty, you are. Sasha, dear, I've been thinking, too. What, Felipe? You are the only one I care for. I haven't a friend in the whole place. Do you care much for me, Felipe? Will you promise not to laugh at me, Sashenka? I wouldn't laugh at you. Cross your hand over your heart. Got it, Sasha? Yes. Well, I'll tell you. I was thinking. How shall I tell you? I was thinking, Sashenka. If you were here with me, I would like to kiss you. An unaccountable sense of joy glows in my heart, and I muse in silence. What's the matter, Sashenka? Why don't you say something? Are you angry with me? No, Felipe, you foolish little boy. You're laughing at me. No, dear, I feel just as you do. Really? Yes. Oh, I'm so glad, Sashenka. In the evening, the guards descend to relieve Johnny. He is to be transferred to the basket, they inform him. 
On the way past my cell, he whispers, Hope I'll see you soon, Sashenka. A friendly officer knocks on the outer blind door of my cell. That you there, Berkman? You want to behave to the deputy. He's put you down for two more days for sassing him. I feel more lonesome at the boy's departure. The silence grows more oppressive, the hours of darkness heavier. Seven days I remain in the dungeon. At the expiration of the week, feeling stiff and feeble, I totter behind the guards on the way to the bathroom. My body looks strangely emaciated, reduced almost to a skeleton. The pangs of hunger revive sharply with the shock of the cold shower, and the craving for tobacco is overpowering at the sight of the chewing officers. I look forward to being placed in a cell, quietly exulting at my victory as I am led to the north wing. But in the cell house, the deputy warden assigns me to the lower end of range A, insane department. Exasperated by the terrible suggestion, my nerves on edge with the dungeon experience, I storm in furious protest, demanding to be returned to the hole. The deputy, startled by my violence, attempts to soothe me and finally yields. I am placed in number 35, the crank row, beginning several cells further. Upon the heels of the departing officers, the range man is at my door, bursting with the latest news. The investigation is over, the warden whitewashed. For an instant, I am aghast, failing to grasp the astounding situation. Slowly, its full significance dawns on me as Bill excitedly relates the story. It is the talk of the prison. The Board of Charities had chosen its secretary, J. Francis Torrance, an intimate friend of the warden, to conduct the investigation. As a precautionary measure, I was kept several additional days in the dungeon. Mr. Torrance has privately interviewed Dutch Adams, Young Smithy, and Bob Runyon, promising them their full commutation time, notwithstanding their bad records and irrespective of their future behavior. They were instructed by the secretary to corroborate the management, placing all blame upon me. No other witnesses were heard. The investigation was over within an hour, the committee of one retiring for dinner to the adjoining residence of the warden. Several friendly prisoners linger at my cell during the afternoon, corroborating the story of the range man and completing the details. The cell house itself bears out the situation. The change in the personnel of the men is amazing. Dutch Adams has been promoted to messenger for the front office, the most privileged political job in the prison. Bob Runyon, a third-timer and notorious kid man, has been appointed a trustee in the shops. But the most significant cue is the advancement of young Smithy to the position of rangeman. He has but recently been sentenced to a year's solitary for the broken key discovered in the lock of his door. His record is of the worst. He is a young convict of extremely violent temper who has repeatedly attacked fellow prisoners with dangerous weapons. Since his murderous assault upon the inoffensive Praying Andy, Smithy was never permitted out of his cell without the escort of two guards. And now this irresponsible man is in charge of a range? At supper, young Smithy steals up to my cell, bringing a slice of cornbread. I refuse the peace offering and charge him with treachery. At first, he stoutly protests his innocence, but gradually weakens and pleads his dire straits in mitigation. Torrance had persuaded him to testify, but he avoided incriminating me. That was done by the other two witnesses. He merely exonerated the warden from the charges preferred by James Grant. He had been clubbed four times, but he denied to the committee that the guards practice violence, and he supported the warden in his statement that the officers are not permitted to carry clubs or blackjacks. He feels that an injustice has been done me, and now that he occupies my former position, he will be able to repay the little favors I did him when he was in solitary. Indignantly, I spurn his offer. He pleads his youth, the torture of the cell, and begs my forgiveness, but I am bitter at his treachery and bid him go. Officer McElvain pauses at my door. Oh, what a change, what an awful change, he exclaims pityingly. 
I don't know whether he refers to my appearance or to the loss of range liberty, but I resent his tone of commiseration. It was he who had selected me as a victim to be reported for talking. Angrily, I turn my back to him, refusing to talk. Someone stealthily pushes a bundle of newspapers between the bars. Whole columns detail the report of the investigation, completely exonerating Warden Edward S. Wright. The base charges against the management of the penitentiary were the underhand work of anarchist Berkman, Mr. Torrance assured the press. One of the papers contains a lengthy interview with Wright, accusing me of fostering discontent and insubordination among the men. The captain expresses grave fear for the safety of the community, should the pardon board reduce my sentence, in view of the circumstance that my lawyers are preparing to renew the application at the next session. In great agitation I pace the cell. The statement of the warden is fatal to the hope of a pardon. My life in the prison will now be made still more unbearable. I shall again be locked in solitary. With despair I think of my fate in the hands of the enemy, and the sense of my utter helplessness overpowers me. End of section 34。Section 35 of Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Josh Kibbe. Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman. Part 2. Chapter 28. For Safety. Dear K, I know you must have been worried about me. Give no credence to the reports you hear. I did not try to suicide. I was very nervous and excited over the things that happened while I was in the dungeon. I saw the papers after I came up. You know what they said? I couldn't sleep. I kept pacing the floor. The screws were hanging about my cell, but I paid no attention to them. They spoke to me, but I wouldn't answer. I was in no mood for talking. They must have thought something wrong with me. The doctor came and felt my pulse, and they took me to the hospital. The warden rushed in and ordered me into a straitjacket. For safety, he said. You know Officer Irwin. He put the jacket on me. He's a pretty decent chap. I saw he hated to do it, but the evening screw is a rat. He called three times during the night, and every time he'd tighten the straps. I thought he'd cut my hands off, but I wouldn't cry for mercy, and that made him wild. They put me in the full-size jacket that winds all around you, the arms folded. They laid me, tied in the canvas on the bed, bound me to it feet and chest, with straps provided with padlocks. I was suffocating in the hot ward, could hardly breathe. In the morning they unbound me. My legs were paralyzed and I could not stand up. The doctor ordered some medicine for me. The head nurse, he's in for murder and he's rotten, taunted me with the black bottle. Every time he passed my bed, he'd say, You still alive? Wait till I fix something up for you. I refused the medicine, and then they took me down to the dispensary, lashed me to a chair, and used the pump on me. You can imagine how I felt. That went on for a week. Every night in the straitjacket, every morning the pump. Now I am back in the block, in 6A. A peculiar coincidence. It's the same cell I occupied when I first came here. Don't trust Bill Say. The warden told me he knew about the note I sent you just before I smashed up. If you got it, Bill must have read it and told Sandy. Only dear old horse thief can be relied upon. How near the boundary of joy is misery. I shall never forget the first morning in the jacket. I passed a restless night, but just as it began to dawn I must have lost consciousness. Suddenly I awoke with the most exquisite music in my ears. It seemed to me as if the heavens had opened in a burst of ecstasy. It was only a little sparrow, but never before in my life did I hear such sweet melody. I felt murder in my heart when the convict nurse drove the poor birdie from the window ledge. A. End of section 35. Section 36 of Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman Part 2, Chapter 29 Dreams of Freedom 
Like an endless miserere are the days in the solitary. No glimmer of light cheers the tomorrows. In the depths of suffering, existence becomes intolerable, and as of old, I seek refuge in the past. The stages of my life reappear as the acts of a drama which I cannot bring myself to cut short. The possibilities of the dark motive compel the imagination and halt the thought of destruction. Misery magnifies the estimate of self. The vehemence of revolt strengthens to endure. Despair engenders obstinate resistance. In its spirit, hope is trembling. Slowly, it assumes more definite shape. Escape is the sole salvation. The world of the living is dim and unreal with distance. Its voice reaches me like the pale echo of fantasy. The thought of its turbulent vitality is strange with apprehension. But the present is bitter with wretchedness and gasps desperately for relief. The efforts of my friends bring a glow of warmth into my life. The indefatigable girl has succeeded in interesting various circles. She is gathering funds for my application for a rehearing before the pardon board in the spring of 98, when my first sentence of seven years will have expired. With a touch of old-time tenderness, I think of her loyalty, her indomitable perseverance on my behalf. It is she, almost she alone, who has kept my memory green throughout the long years. Even Fedya, my constant chum, has been swirled into the vortex of narrow ambition and self-indulgence, the plaything of commonplace fate. Resentment at being thus lightly forgotten tinges my thoughts of the erstwhile twin brother of our ideal-kissed youth. By contrast, the girl is silhouetted on my horizon as the sole personification of revolutionary persistence, the earnest of its realisation. Beyond, all is darkness, the mystic world of falsehood and sham that will hate and persecute me even as its brutal high priests in the prison. Here and there the gloom is rent. An unknown sympathiser or comrade sends a greeting. I pour eagerly over the chirography and from the clear decisive signature, Voltairine de Clare, strive to mould the character and shape the features of the writer. To the girl I apply to verify my reading and rejoice in the warm interest of the convent-educated American, a friend of my much-admired comrade, Daya D. Lum, who is aiding the girl in my behalf. But the efforts for a rehearing wake no hope in my heart. My comrades, far from the prison world, do not comprehend the full significance of the situation resulting from the investigation. My underground connections are paralysed, I cannot enlighten the girl. But Nold and Bauer are on the threshold of liberty. Within two months, Carl will carry my message to New York. I can fully rely on his discretion and devotion. We have grown very intimate through common suffering. He will inform the girl that nothing is to be expected from legal procedure. Instead, he will explain to her the plan I have evolved. My position as rangeman has served me to good advantage. I have thoroughly familiarised myself with the institution. I have gathered information and explored every part of the cell house offering the least likelihood of an escape. The prison is almost impregnable. Tom's attempt to scale the wall proved disastrous, in spite of his exceptional opportunities as kitchen employee and the thick fog of the early morning. Several other attempts also were doomed to failure, the great number of guards and their vigilance precluding success. No escape has taken place since the days of Paddy McGraw, before the completion of the prison. Entirely new methods must be tried. The road to freedom leads underground. But digging out of the prison is impracticable in the modern structure of steel and rock. We must force a passage into the prison. The tunnel is to be dug from the outside. A house is to be rented in the neighbourhood of the penitentiary, and the underground passage excavated beneath the eastern wall towards the adjacent bathhouse. No officers frequent the place save at certain hours, and I shall find an opportunity to disappear into the hidden opening on the regular bi-weekly occasions when the solitaries are permitted to bathe. The project will require careful preparation, and 
considerable expense. Skilled comrades will have to be entrusted with a secret work, the greater part of which must be carried on at night. Determination and courage will make the plan feasible, successful. Such things have been done before. Not in this country, it is true, but the act will receive added significance from the circumstance that the liberation of the first American political prisoner has been accomplished by means similar to those practised by our comrades in Russia. Who knows? It may prove the symbol and precursor of Russian idealism on American soil. And what tremendous impression the consummation of the bold plan will make! What a stimulus to our propaganda as a demonstration of anarchist initiative and ability! I glow with the excitement of its great possibilities and enthuse Karl with my hopes. If the preparatory work is hastened, the execution of the plan will be facilitated by the renewed agitation within the prison. Rumours of a legislative investigation are afloat, diverting the thoughts of the administration into different channels. I shall foster the ferment to afford my comrades greater safety in the work. During the long years of my penitentiary life, I have formed many friendships. I have earned the reputation of a square man and a good fellow, have received many proofs of confidence and appreciation of my uncompromising attitude towards the generally execrated management. Most of my friends observe the unwritten ethics of informing me of their approaching release and offer to smuggle out messages or to provide me with little comforts. I invariably request them to visit the newspapers and to relate their experiences in Riverside. Some express fear of the warden's enmity, of the fatal consequences in case of their return to the penitentiary. But the bolder spirits and the accidental offenders who confidently bid me a final goodbye, unafraid of return, call directly from the prison on their Pittsburgh editors. Presently, the leader and the dispatch begin to voice their censure of the hurried whitewash by the State Board of Charities. The attitude of the press encourages the guards to manifest their discontent with the humiliating eccentricities of the senile warden. They protest against the whim subjecting them to military drill to improve their appearance and resent Captain Wright's insistence that they patronise his private tailor, high-priced and incompetent. Serious friction has also arisen between the management and Mr. Sawhill, superintendent of local industries. The prisoners rejoice at the growing irascibility of the warden and the deeper lines on his face, interpreting them as signs of worry and fear. Expectation of a new investigation is at high pitch as Judge Gordon of Philadelphia severely censures the administration of the Eastern Penitentiary, charging inhuman treatment abuse of the insane, and graft. The labour bodies of the state demand the abolition of convict competition, and the press becomes more assertive in urging an investigation of both penitentiaries. The air is charged with rumours of legislative action. The breath of spring is in the cell house. My two comrades are jubilant. The sweet odour of May wafts the resurrection. But the threshold of life is guarded by the throes of new birth. A tone of nervous excitement permeates the correspondence. Anxiety tortures the sleepless nights. The approaching return to the living is tinged with the disquietude of the unknown, the dread of the renewed struggle for existence. But the joy of coming emancipation, the wine of sunshine and liberty tingles in every fibre and hope flutters its disused wings. Our plans are complete. Carl is to visit the girl, explain my project, and serve as the medium of communication by means of our prearranged system, investing apparently innocent official letters with sabrosa meaning. The initial steps will require time. Meanwhile, K and G are to make the necessary arrangements for the publication of our book. The security of our manuscripts is a source of deep satisfaction and much merriment at the expense of the administration. The repeated searches have failed to unearth them. With characteristic daring, 
The faithful Bob had secreted them in a hole in the floor of his shop, almost under the very seat of the guard. One by one, they have been smuggled outside by a friendly officer, whom we have christened Schrauber. By degrees, Nold has gained the confidence of the former mill worker, with the result that sixty precious booklets now repose safely with a comrade in Allegheny. I am to supply the final chapters of the book through Mr. Schrauber, whose friendship Karl is about to bequeath to me. The month of May is on the wane. The last note is exchanged with my comrades. Dear Bob was not able to reach me in the morning, and now I read the lines quivering with the last pangs of release, while Nold and Bower are already beyond the walls. How I yearned for a glance at Karl, to touch hands, even in silence. But the customary privilege was refused us. Only once in the long years of our common suffering have I looked into the eyes of my devoted friend and stealthily pressed his hand like a thief in the night. No last greeting was vouchsafed me today. The loneliness seems heavier, the void more painful. The routine is violently disturbed. Reading and study are burdensome. My thoughts will not be compelled. They revert obstinately to my comrades and storm against my steel cage, trying to pierce the distance, to commune with the absent. I seek diversion in the manufacture of prison fancy work, ornamental little fruit baskets, diminutive articles of furniture, picture frames and the like. The little mementos constructed of tissue paper rolls of various design, I send to the girl, and am elated at her admiration of the beautiful workmanship and attractive colour effects. But presently she laments the wrecked condition of the goods. And upon investigation, I learn from the runner that the most dilapidated cardboard boxes are selected for my product. The rotunda turnkey in charge of the shipments is hostile, and I appeal to the chaplain but his well-meant intercession results in an order from the warden, interdicting the expressage of my work on the ground of probable notes being secreted therein. I protest against the discrimination, suggesting the dismembering of every piece to disprove the charge. But the captain derisively remarks that he is indisposed to take chances, and I am forced to resort to the subterfuge of having my articles transferred to a friendly prisoner and addressed by him to his mother in Beaver, Pennsylvania, thence to be forwarded to New York. At the same time, the rotunda keeper detains a valuable piece of ivory sent to me by the girl for the manufacture of ornamental toothpicks. The local ware, made of kitchen bones bleached in lime, turns yellow in a short time. My request for the ivory is refused, on the plea of submitting the matter to the warden's decision who rules against me. I direct the return of it to my friend, but I'm informed that the ivory has been mislaid and cannot be found. Exasperated, I charge the guard with the theft, and serve notice that I shall demand the ivory at the expiration of my time. The turnkey jeers at the wild impossibility, and I am placed for a week on Pennsylvania diet for insulting an officer. End of section 36. Recording by Kate M. Section 37 of Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman. Part 2. Chapter 30. Whitewashed Again. Christmas, 1897. My dear Carl, I have been despairing of reaching you, Sub Rosa, but the holidays brought the usual transfers, and at last my friend Shrubby is with me. Dear Carolus, I am worn out with the misery of the month since you left and the many disappointments your official letters were not convincing i fail to understand why the plan is not practicable of course you can't write openly but you have means of giving a hint as to the impossibilities you speak of you say that i have become too estranged from the outside 
and so forth which may be true yet i think the matter chiefly concerns the inside and of that i am the best judge i do not see the force of your argument when you dwell upon the application at the next session of the pardon board you mean that the other plan would jeopardize the success of the legal attempt but there is not much hope of favorable action by the board you have talked all this over before but you seem to have a different view now why only in a very small measure do your letters replace in my life the heart-to-heart -heart talks we used to have here though they were only on paper but i am much interested in your activities it seems strange that you so long the companion of my silence should now be in the very niagara of life of our movement it gives me great satisfaction that your experience here has matured you and helped to strengthen and deepen your convictions it has had a similar effect upon me you know what a voluminous reader i am i have read in fact studied every volume in the library here and now the chaplain supplies me with books from his but whether it be philosophy travel or contemporary life that falls into my hands it invariably distills into my mind the falsity of dominant ideas and the beauty the inevitability of anarchism but i do not want to enlarge upon this subject now we can discuss it through official channels you know that tony and his nephew are here we are just getting acquainted he works in the shop but as he is also coffee boy we have an opportunity to exchange notes it is fortunate that his identity is not known otherwise he would fall under special surveillance i have my eyes on tony he may prove valuable i am still in solitary with no prospect of relief you know the policy of the warden to use me as a scapegoat for everything that happens here it has become a mania with him think of it he blames me for johnny davis's cutting dutch he laid everything at my door when the legislative investigation took place it was a worse sham than the previous whitewash several members called to see me at the cell unofficially they said they got a hint of the evidence i was prepared to give and one of them suggested to me that it is not advisable for one in my position to antagonize the warden i replied that i was no toady he hinted that the authorities of the prison might help me to procure freedom if i would act discreetly i insisted that i wanted to be heard by the committee they departed promising to call me as a witness one senator remarked as he left you are too intelligent a man to be at large when the hearing opened several officers were the first to take the stand the testimony was not entirely favorable to the warden then mr sawhill was called you know him he is an independent sort of man with an eye upon the wardenship his evidence came like a bomb he charged the management with corruption and fraud and so forth the investigators took fright they closed the sessions and departed for harrisburg announcing through the press that they would visit moyaming sing footnote the eastern penitentiary of philadelphia pennsylvania and footnote and then returned to riverside but they did not return the report they submitted to the governor exonerated the warden the men were gloomy over the state of affairs a hundred prisoners were prepared to testify and much was expected from the committee i had all my facts on hand bob had fished out for me the bundle of material from its hiding-place it was in good condition in spite of the long soaking i am enclosing some new data in this letter for use in our book now that he is cleared the warden has grown even more arrogant and despotic yet some good the agitation in the press has accomplished clubbings are less frequent and the bull-ring is temporarily abolished but his hatred of me has grown venomous he holds us responsible together with dempsey and beatty for organizing the opposition to convict labor which has culminated in the mule law it is to take effect on the first of the year the prison administration is very bitter because the statute which permits only thirty five per cent of the inmates to be employed in productive labor will considerably minimize opportunities for graft but the men are rejoicing the terrible slavery in the shops has driven many to insanity and death the law is one of the rare instances of rational legislation 
its benefit to labor in general is nullified however by limiting convict competition only within the state the inspectors are already seeking a market for the prison products in other states while the convict manufacturers of new york ohio illinois etc are disposed of in pennsylvania the irony of beneficent legislation on the other hand the inmates need not suffer for lack of employment the new law allows the unlimited manufacture within the prison of products for local consumption if the wine of the management regarding the detrimental effect of idleness on the convict is sincere they could employ five times the population of the prison in the production of articles for our own needs at present all the requirements of the penitentiary are supplied from the outside the purchase of a farm following the example set by the workhouse would alone afford work for a considerable number of men i have suggested in a letter to the inspectors various methods of which every inmate of the institution could be employed among them the publication of a prison paper of course they have ignored me but what can you expect of a body of philanthropists who have the interest of the convict so much at heart that they delegated the president of the board george a kelly to oppose the parole bill a measure certainly along advanced lines of modern criminology owing to the influence of inspector kelly the bill was shelved at the last session of the legislature though the prisoners have been praying for it for years it has robbed the moneyless lifetimers of their last hope a clause in the parole bill held out to them the promise of release after twenty years of good behavior dark days are in store for the men apparently the campaign of the inspectors consists in forcing the repeal of the Bronner law by raising the hue and cry of insanity and sickness they are actually causing both by keeping half the population locked up you know how quickly the solitary drives certain classes of prisoners insane especially the more ignorant element whose mental horizon is circumscribed by their personal troubles and pain speedily fall victims think of men who cannot even read put in communicado for months at a time for years even most of the colored prisoners and those accustomed to outdoor life such as farmers and the like quickly develop the germs of consumption in close confinement now this wilful murder for it is nothing else is absolutely unnecessary the yard is big and well protected by the thirty-foot wall with armed guards patrolling it why not give the unemployed men air and exercise since the management is determined to keep them idle i suggested the idea to the warden but he berated me for my habitual interference in matters that do not concern me i often wonder at the enigma of human nature there's the captain a man seventy-two years old he should bethink himself of death of meeting his maker since he pretends to believe in religion instead he is bending all his energies to increase insanity and disease among the convicts in order to force the repeal of the law that has lessened the flow of blood money it is almost beyond belief but you have yourself witnessed the effect of a brutal atmosphere among new officers wright has been warden for thirty years he has come to regard the prison as his undisputed dominion and now he is furious at the legislative curtailment of his absolute control this letter will remind you of our bulky notes in the good old days when k g was here i miss our correspondence there are some intelligent men on the range but they are not interested in the thoughts that seethe within me and call for expression just now the chief topic of local interest after of course the usual discussion of the grub women kids and their health and troubles is the spanish war and the new dining-room in which the shop employees are to be fed en masse out of chinaware think of it some of the men are tremendously patriotic others welcome the war as a sign cure affording easy money and plenty of excitement you remember young butch and his partners mirtha tommy etc they have recently been released too wasted and broken in health to be fit for manual labor all of them have signified their intention of joining the insurrection some are enrolling in the regular army for the war butch is already in cuba i had a letter from him 
there is a passage in it that is tragically characteristic he refers to a skirmish he participated in we shot a lot of spaniards mostly from ambush he writes it was great sport it is the attitude of the military adventurer to whom a sacred cause like the cuban uprising unfortunately affords the opportunity to satisfy his lust for blood butch was a very gentle boy when he entered the prison but he has witnessed much heartlessness and cruelty during his term of three years letter growing rather long good night end of section thirty seven section thirty eight of prison memoirs of an anarchist this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org prison memoirs of an anarchist by alexander berkman part two chapter thirty one and by all forgot we wrought and wrought one a year of solitary has wasted my strength and left me feeble and languid my expectations of relief from complete isolation have been disappointed existence is grim with despair as day by day i feel my vitality ebbing the long nights are tortured with insomnia my body is racked with constant pains all my heart is dark a glimmer of light breaks through the clouds as the session of the pardon board approaches i clutch desperately at the faint hope of a favorable decision with feverish excitement i pore over the letters of the girl breathing cheer and encouraging news my application is supported by numerous labor bodies she writes comrade harry kelly has been tireless in my behalf the success of his efforts to arouse public sympathy augurs well for the application the united labor league of pennsylvania representing over a hundred thousand toilers has passed a resolution favoring my release together with other similar expressions individual and collective it will be laid before the pardon board and it is confidently expected that the authorities will not ignore the voice of organized labor in a ferment of anxiety and hope i count the days and hours irritable with impatience and apprehension as i near the fateful moment visions of liberty flutter before me glorified by the meeting with the girl and my former companions and i thrill with the return to the world as i restlessly pace the cell in the silence of the night the thought of my prison friends obtrudes upon my visions with the tenderness born of common misery i think of their fate resolving to brighten their lives with little comforts and letters that mean so much to every prisoner my act in liberty shall be in memory of the men grown close to me with the kinship of suffering the unfortunates endeared by awakened sympathy and understanding for so many years i have shared with them the sorrows and the few joys of penitentiary life i feel almost guilty to leave them but henceforth their cause shall be mine a vital part of the larger social cause it will be my constant endeavor to ameliorate their condition and i shall strain every effort for my little friend Felipe. i must secure his release how happy the boy will be to join me in liberty the flash of the dark lantern dispels my fantasies and again i walk the cell in vehement misgiving and fervent hope of to-morrow's verdict at noon i am called to the warden he must have received word from the board i reflect on the way the captain lounges in the armchair his eyes glistening his seamed face yellow and worried with an effort i control my impatience as he offers me a seat he bids the guard depart and a wild hope trembles in me he is not afraid perhaps good news sit down berkman he speaks with unwonted affability i have just received a message from harrisburg your attorney requests me to inform you that the pardon board has now reached your case it is probably under consideration at this moment i remain silent the warden scans me closely you would return to new york if released he inquires yes what are your plans well i have not formed any yet you would go back to your anarchist friends certainly you have not changed your views 
by no means a turnkey enters captain on official business he reports wait here a moment burkman the warden remarks withdrawing the officer remains in a few minutes the warden returns motioning to the guard to leave i have just been informed that the board has refused you a hearing i feel the cold perspiration running down my back the prison rumors of the warden's interference flash through my mind the board promised a rehearing at the previous application why this refusal warden i exclaim you objected to my pardon such action lies with the inspectors he replies evasively the peculiar intonation strengthens my suspicions a feeling of hopelessness possesses me i sense the warden's gaze fastened on me and i strive to control my emotion how much time have you yet he asks over eleven years how long have you been locked up this time sixteen months there is a vacancy on your range the assistant hall man is going home to-morrow you would like the position he eyes me curiously yes i'll consider it i rise weakly but he detains me by the way berkman look at this he holds up a small wooden box disclosing several casts of plaster of paris i wonder at the strange proceeding you know what they are he inquires plaster casts i think of what for what purpose look at them well now i glance indifferently at the moulds bearing the clear impression of an eagle it's the cast of a silver dollar i believe i am glad you speak truthfully i had no doubt you would know i examined your library record and found that you have drawn books on metallurgy oh you suspect me of this i flare up no not at this time he smiles in a suggestive manner you have drawn practically every book from the library i had a talk with the chaplain and he is positive that you would not be guilty of counterfeiting because it would be robbing poor people the reading of my letters must have familiarized the chaplain with anarchist ideas yes mr milligan thinks highly of you you might antagonize the management but he assures me you would not abet such a crime i am glad to hear it you would protect the federal government then i don't understand you you would protect the people from being cheated by counterfeit money the government and the people are not synonymous flushing slightly and frowning he asks but you would protect the poor yes certainly his face brightens oh quite so quite so he smiles reassuringly these moulds were found hidden in the north block no not in a cell but in the hall we suspect a certain man it's ed sloan he is located two tiers above you now berkman the management is very anxious to get to the bottom of this matter it's a crime against the people you may have heard sloan speaking to his neighbors about this no i am sure you suspect an innocent person how so sloan is a very sick man it's the last thing he'd think of well we have certain reasons for suspecting him if you should happen to hear anything just rap on the door and inform the officers you are ill they will be instructed to send for me at once i can't do it borden why not he demands i am not a spy why certainly not berkman i should not ask you to be but you have friends on the range you may learn something well think the matter over he adds dismissing me bitter disappointment at the action of the board indignation at the warden's suggestion struggle within me as i reach my cell the guard is about to lock me in when the deputy warden struts into the block officer unlock him he commands berkman the captain says you are to be assistant range man report to mr mcelvain for a broom two the unexpected relief strengthens the hope of liberty local methods are of no avail but now my opportunities for escape are more favorable considerable changes have taken place during my solitary and the first necessity is to orient myself some of my confidence have been released others were transferred during the investigation period to the south wing to disrupt my connections new men are about the cell-house and i miss many of my chums 
the lower half of the bottom ranges a and k is now exclusively occupied by the insane their numbers greatly augmented poor wingy has disappeared grown violently insane he was repeatedly lodged in the dungeon and finally sent to an asylum there my unfortunate friend had died after two months his cell is now occupied by irish mike a good-natured boy turned imbecile by solitary he hops about on all fours bleating bah bah see the goat i'm the goat bah bah i shudder at the fate i have escaped as i look at the familiar faces that were so bright with intelligence and youth now staring at me from the crank row wild-eyed and corpse-like their minds shattered their bodies wasted to a shadow my heart bleeds as i realize that sid and nick fail to recognize me their memory a total blank and patsy the pittsburgh boot black stands at the door motionless his eyes glassy lips frozen in an inane smile from cell to cell i pass the graveyard of the living dead the silence broken only by intermittent savage yells and the piteous bleeding of mike the whole day these men are locked in deprived of exercise and recreation their rations reduced because of delinquency new bughouse cases are continually added from the ranks of the prisoners forced to remain idle and kept in solitary the sight of the terrible misery almost gives a touch of consolation to my grief over johnny davis my young friend had grown ill in the foul basket he begged to be taken to the hospital but his condition did not warrant it the physician said moreover he was in punishment poor boy how he must have suffered they found him dead on the floor of his cell my body renews its strength with the exercise and greater liberty of the range the subtle hope of the warden to corrupt me has turned to my advantage i smile with scorn at his miserable estimate of human nature determined by a lifetime of corruption and hypocrisy how saddening is the shallowness of popular opinion warden wright is hailed as a progressive man a deep student of criminology who has introduced modern methods in the treatment of prisoners as an expression of respect and appreciation the national prison association has selected captain wright as its delegate to the international congress at brussels which is to take place in nineteen hundred and all the time the warden is designing new forms of torture denying the pleadings of the idle men for exercise and exerting his utmost efforts to increase sickness and insanity in the attempt to force the repeal of the convict labor law the puerility of his judgment fills me with contempt public sentiment in regard to convict competition with outside labor has swept the state the efforts of the warden disastrous though they may be to the inmates are doomed to failure no less fatuous is the conceit of his boasted experience of thirty years the so confidently uttered suspicion of ed sloan in regard to the counterfeiting charge has proved mere lip wisdom the real culprit is bob runyon the trustee basking in the warden's special graces his intimate friend john smith the witness and protege of torraine has confided to me the whole story in a final effort to set himself straight he even exhibited to me the coins made by runyon together with the original moulds cast in the trustee's cell and poor sloan still under surveillance is slowly dying of neglect the doctor charging him with eating soap to produce symptoms of illness three the year passes in a variety of interests the girl and several newly won correspondents hold the thread of outside life the twin has gradually withdrawn from our new york circles and is now entirely obscured on my horizon but the girl is staunch and devoted and i keenly anticipate her regular mail she keeps me informed of events in the international labor movement news of which is almost entirely lacking in the daily press we discuss the revolutionary expressions of the times and i learn more about pallas and lucini whose acts of the previous winter had thrown europe into a ferment of agitation i hunger for news from the agitation against the tortures in montjuic 
the revival of the inquisition rousing in me the spirit of retribution and deep compassion for my persecuted comrades in the spanish bastille beneath the suppressed tone of her letters i read the girl's suffering and pain and feel the heart pangs of her unuttered personal sorrows presently i am apprised that some prominent persons interested in my case are endeavouring to secure carnegie's signature for a renewed application to the board of pardons the girl conveys the information guardedly the absence of comet discovers to me the anguish of soul the step has caused her what terrible despair had given birth to the suggestion i wonder if the project of the underground escape had been put in operation we should not have had to suffer such humiliation why have my friends ignored the detailed plan i had submitted to them through carl i am confident of its feasibility and success if we can muster the necessary skill and outlay the animosity of the prison authorities precludes the thought of legal release the underground route very difficult and expensive though it be is the sole hope it must be realized my sub rosa communications suspended during the temporary absence of mr shawby i hint these thoughts in official mail to the girl but refrain from objecting to the carnegie idea other matters of interest i learn from correspondence with friends in philadelphia and pittsburgh the frequent letters of carl still reminiscent of his sojourn at riverside thrill with the joy of active propaganda and of his success as public speaker walter ain de Clare and sarah patton lend color to my existence by discursive epistles of great charm and rebellious thought often i pause to wonder at the miracle of my mail passing the censorial eyes but the chaplain is a busy man careful perusal of every letter would involve too great a demand upon his time the correspondence with mattie i turn over to my neighbor pasquale a young italian serving sixteen years who has developed a violent passion for the pretty face on the photograph the roguish eyes and sweet lips exert but a passing impression upon me my thoughts turn to johnny my young friend in the convict grave deep snow is on the ground it must be cold beneath the sod the white shroud is pressing pressing heavy upon the lone boy like the suffocating night of the basket cell but in the spring little blades of green will sprout and perhaps a rosebud will timidly burst and flower all white and perfume the air and shed its autumn tears upon the convict grave of johnny end of section thirty eight section thirty nine of prison memoirs of an anarchist this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org prison memoirs of an anarchist by alexander berkman part two chapter thirty two the deviousness of reform law applied february fourteenth eighteen ninety nine dear carolus the greeks thought the gods spiteful creatures when things begin to look brighter for a man they grow envious you'll be surprised mr schwabby has turned into an enemy mostly my own fault that's the sting of it it will explain to you the failure of the former sub rosa route the present one is safe but very temporary it happened last fall from assistant i was advanced to hall man having charge of the crank row on range a a new order curtailed the rations of the insane no cornbread cheese or hash only bread and coffee as range man i help to feed and generally have extras left on the wagon some one sick or refusing food etc i used to distribute the extras on the q t among the men deprived of them one day just before christmas an officer happened to notice patsy chewing a piece of cheese the poor fellow was quite an imbecile he did not know enough to hide what i gave him well you are aware that corn-bread tom does not love me he reported me i admitted the charge to the warden and tried to tell him how hungry the men were he wouldn't hear of it saying that the insane should not overload their stomachs i was ordered locked up within a month i was out again but imagine my surprise when shrubby refused even to talk to me 
at first i could not fathom the mystery later i learned that he was reprimanded losing ten days pay for allowing me to feed the demented he knew nothing about it of course but he was at the time in special charge of crank row the shrobby had been telling my friends that i got him in trouble wilfully he seems to nurse his grievance with much bitterness he apparently hates me now with the hatred we often feel toward those who know our secrets but he realizes he has nothing to fear from me many changes have taken place since you left you would hardly recognize the block if you returned better stay out though no more talking through the waste pipes the new privies have standing water electricity is gradually taking the place of candles the garish light is almost driving me blind and the innovation has created a new problem how to light our pipes we are given the same monthly allowance of matches each package supposed to contain thirty but usually have twenty-seven and last month i received only twenty-five i made a kick but it was in vain the worst of it is fully a third of the matches are damp and don't light while we used candles we managed somehow borrowing a few matches occasionally from non-smokers but now that candles are abolished the difficulty is very serious i split each match into four sometimes i succeed in making six there is a man on the range who is an artist at it he can make eight cuts out of a match all serviceable too even at that there is a famine and i have been forced to return to the stone age with flint and tinder i draw the fire of prometheus the mess-room is in full blast the sight of a thousand men bent over their food in complete silence officers flanking each table is by no means appetizing but during the spanish war the place resembled the cell-house on new year's eve the patriotic warden daily read to the diners the latest news and such cheering and wild yelling you have never heard especially did the hobson exploit fire the spirit of jingoism but the enthusiasm suddenly cooled when the men realized that they were wasting precious minutes hurrahing and then leaving the table hungry when the bell terminated the meal some tried to pocket the uneaten beans and rice but the guards detected them and after that the warden's war reports were accompanied only with loud munching and champing another innovation is exercise your interviews with the reporters and those of other released prisoners have at last forced the warden to allow the idle men an hour's recreation in inclement weather they walk in the cell house on fine days in the yard the reform was instituted last autumn and the improvement in health is remarkable the doctor is enthusiastically in favor of the privilege the sick line has been so considerably reduced that he estimates his time saving at two hours daily some of the boys tell me they have almost entirely ceased masturbating the shop employees envy the idlers now many have purposely precipitated trouble in order to be put in solitary and thus enjoy an hour in the open but sandy got next and now those locked up for cause are excluded from exercise here are some data for our book the population at the end of last year was nine hundred fifty six the lowest point in over a decade the warden admits that the war has decreased crime the inspector's report refers to the improved economic conditions as compared with the panicky times of the opening years in the nineties but the authorities do not appear very happy over the reduction in the riverside population you understand the reason the smaller the total the less men may be exploited in the industries i am not prepared to say whether there is collusion between the judges and the administration of the prison but it is very significant that the class of offenders formerly sent to the workhouse are being increasingly sentenced to the penitentiary and an unusual number are transferred here from the reformatory at huntington and the reform school of morganza the old-timers joke about the warden telephoning to the criminal court to notify the judges how many men are wanted for the stocking shop the unions might be interested in the methods of nullifying the convict labor law in every shop twice as many are employed as the statute allows the illegal are carried on the books as men working on state account that is 
as cleaners and clerks not as producers thus it happens that in the mat shop for instance more men are booked as clerks and sweepers than are employed on the looms in the broom shop there are thirty supposed clerks and fifteen cleaners to a total of fifty-three producers legally permitted this is the way the legislation works on which the labor bodies have expended such tremendous efforts the broom shop is still contracted to lang brothers with their own foreman in charge and his son a guard in the prison enough for to-day when i hear of the safe arrival of this letter i may have more intimate things to discuss a end of section thirty nine section forty of prison memoirs of an anarchist this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org prison memoirs of an anarchist by alexander berkman part two chapter thirty three the tunnel one the adverse decision of the board of pardons terminates all hope of release by legal means had the board refused to commute my sentence after hearing the argument another attempt could be made later on but the refusal to grant a rehearing the crafty stratagem to circumvent even the presentation of my case reveals the duplicity of the previous promise and the guilty consciousness of the illegality of my multiplied sentences the authorities are determined that i should remain in the prison confident that it will prove my tomb realizing this fires my defiance and all the stubborn resistance of my being there is no hope of surviving my term at best even with the full benefit of the commutation time which will hardly be granted me in view of the attitude of the prison management i still have over nine years to serve but existence is becoming increasingly more unbearable long confinement and the solitary have drained my vitality to endure the nine years is almost a physical impossibility i must therefore concentrate all my energy and efforts upon escape my position as range man is of utmost advantage i have access to every part of the cell house excepting the crank row the incident of feeding the insane has put an embargo upon my communication with them a special hall boy having been assigned to care for the deranged but within my area on the range are the recent arrivals in the sane solitaries the division of my duties with the new man merely facilitates my task and affords me more leisure the longing for liberty constantly besets my mind suggesting various projects the idea of escape daily strengthens into the determination born of despair it possesses me with an exclusive passion shaping every thought moulding every action by degrees i curtailed correspondence with my prison chums that i may devote the solitude of the evening to the development of my plans the underground tunnel masters my mind with the boldness of its conception its tremendous possibilities but the execution why do my friends regard the matter so indifferently their tepidity irritates me often i lash myself into wild anger with karl for having failed to impress my comrades with the feasibility of the plan to fire them with the enthusiasm of activity my sub rosa route is sporadic and uncertain repeatedly i have hinted to my friends the bitter surprise i feel at their provoking indifference but my reproaches have been studiously ignored i cannot believe that conditions in the movement preclude the realization of my suggestion these things have been accomplished in russia why not in america the attempt should be made if only for its propagandistic effect true the project will require considerable outlay and the work of skilled and trustworthy men have we no such in our ranks in parsons and lum this country has produced her sheliabovs is the genius of america not equal to a hartman footnote hartman engineered the tunnel beneath the moscow railway undermined in an unsuccessful attempt to kill alexander the second in eighteen eighty and footnote the tacit scepticism of my correspondents pain me and rouses my resentment they evidently lack faith in the judgment of one who has been so long separated from their world 
from the interests and struggles of the living the consciousness of my helplessness without aid from the outside gnaws at me filling my days with bitterness but i will persevere i will compel their attention and their activity i their enthusiasm with utmost zeal i cultivate the acquaintance of tony the months of frequent correspondence and occasional personal meetings have developed a spirit of congeniality and good will i exert my ingenuity to create opportunities for stolen interviews and closer comradeship through the aid of a friendly officer i procure for tony the privilege of assisting his range man after shop hours thus enabling him to communicate with me to greater advantage gradually we become intimate and i learn the story of his life rich in adventure and experience an alsatian small and wiry tony is a man of quick wit with a considerable dash of the french man about him he is intelligent and daring the very man to carry out my plan for days i debate in my mind the momentous question shall i confide the project to tony it would be placing myself in his power jeopardizing the sole hope of my life yet it is the only way i must rely on my intuition of the man's worth my nights are sleepless excruciating with the agony of indecision but my friend's sentence is nearing completion we shall need time for discussion and preparation for thorough consideration of every detail at last i resolve to take the decisive step and the next day i reveal the secret to tony his manner allays apprehension serene and self-possessed he listens gravely to my plan smiles with apparent satisfaction and briefly announces that it shall be done only the shining eyes of my reticent comrade betray his elation at the bold scheme and his joy in the adventure he is confident that the idea is feasible suggesting the careful elaboration of details and the invention of a cipher to ensure greater safety for our correspondence the precaution is necessary it will prove an inestimable value upon his release with great circumspection the cryptogram is prepared based on a discarded system of german shorthand but somewhat altered and further involved by the use of words of our own coinage the cipher thus perfected will defy the skill of the most expert but developments within the prison necessitate changes in the project the building operations near the bathhouse destroy the serviceability of the latter for my purpose we consider several new routes but soon realize that lack of familiarity with the construction of the penitentiary gas and sewer systems may defeat our success there are no means of procuring the necessary information tony is confined to the shop while i am never permitted out of the cell house in vain i strive to solve the difficulty weeks pass without bringing light my providence comes unexpectedly in the guise of a fight in the yard the combatants are locked up on my range one of them proves to be mac an aged prisoner serving a third term during his previous confinement he had filled the position of fireman one of his duties consisting in weekly flushing of the sewers he is thoroughly familiar with the underground piping of the yard but his reputation among the inmates is tinged with the odor of sycophancy he is however the only means of solving my difficulty and i diligently set myself to gain his friendship i lighten his solitary by numerous expressions of my sympathy often secretly supplying him with little extras procured from my kitchen friends the loquacious old man is glad of an opportunity to converse and i devote every propitious moment to listening to his long-winded stories of the great jobs he had accomplished in his time the celebrated guns with whom he had associated the great hauls he had made and blowed in with th fellers i suffer his chatter patiently encouraging the recital of his prison experiences and leading him on to dwell upon his last bit he becomes reminiscent of his friends in riverside bewails the early graves of some others gone bugs and rejoices over his good chum patty mcgraw managing to escape the ever interesting subject gives mac a new start and he waxes enthusiastic over the ingenuity of patty 
while i expressed surprise that he himself had never attempted to take french leave what he bristles up think i'm such a dummy and with great detail he discloses his plan way in eighties to swim through the sewer i scoff at his folly you must have been a chump mac to think it could be done i remark i was was i what do you know about the piping eh now let me tell you just wait and snatching up his library slate he draws a complete diagram of the prison sewerage in the extreme southwest corner of the yard he indicates a blind underground alley what's this i ask in surprise never knew that did yer it's a little tunnel connectin th cellar with th females see not a dozen men in th dump no t not eve in a good many screws passage ain't been used for a long time in amazement i scanned the diagram i had noticed a little trap door at the very point in the yard indicated in the drawing and i had often wondered what purpose it might serve my heart dances with joy at the happy solution of my difficulty the blind alley will greatly facilitate our work it is within fifteen feet or twenty at most of the southwestern wall its situation is very favorable there are no shops in the vicinity the place is never visited by guards or prisoners the happy discovery quickly matures the details of my plan a house is to be rented opposite the southern wall on sterling street preferably it is to be situated very near to the point where the wall adjoins the cell house building dug in a direct line across the street and underneath the south wall the tunnel will connect with the blind alley i shall manage the rest too slowly the autumn wanes the crisp days of the indian summer linger as if unwilling to depart but i am impatient with anxiety and long for the winter another month and tony will be free time lags with tardy step but at last the weeks dwarf into days and with joyful heart we count the last hours to-morrow my friend will greet the sunshine he will at once communicate with my comrades and urge the immediate realization of the great plan his self-confidence and faith will carry conviction and stir them with enthusiasm for the undertaking a house is to be bought or rented without loss of time and the environs inspected perhaps operations could not begin till spring meanwhile funds are to be collected to further the work unfortunately the girl a splendid organizer is absent from the country but my friends will carefully follow the directions i have entrusted to tony and through him i shall keep in touch with the developments i have little opportunity for sub rosa mail by means of our cipher however we can correspond officially without risk of the censor's understanding or even suspecting the innocent-looking flourishes scattered through the page with the trusted tony my thoughts walk beyond the gates and again and again i rehearse every step in the project and study every detail my mind dwells in the outside in silent preoccupation i perform my duties on the range more rarely i converse with the prisoners i must take care to comply with the rules and to retain my position to lose it would be disastrous to all my hopes of escape as i passed the vacant cell in which i had spent the last year of my solitary the piteous chirping of a sparrow breaks in upon my thoughts the little visitor almost frozen hops on the bar above my assistant swings the duster to drive it away but the sparrow hovers about the door and suddenly flutters to my shoulder in surprise i pet the bird it seems quite tame why it's dick the assistant exclaims think of him coming back my hands tremble as i examine the little bird with great joy i discover the faint marks of blue ink i had smeared under its wings last summer when the warden had ordered my little companion thrown out of the window how wonderful that it should return and recognize the old friend and the cell tenderly i warm and feed the bird what strange sights my little pet must have seen since he was driven out into the world what struggles and sorrows he has suffered the bright eyes look cheerily into mine speaking mute confidence and joy while he pecks from my hand crumbs of bread and sugar foolish birdie to return to prison for shelter and food cold and cruel must be the world my little dick or is it friendship that is stronger than even love of liberty so may it be 
almost daily i see men pass through the gates and soon return again driven back by the world even like you little dick yet others there are who would rather go cold and hungry in freedom than be warm and fed in prison even like me little dick and still others there be who would risk life and liberty for the sake of their friendship even like you and i hope tony little dick end of section forty section forty one of prison memoirs of an anarchist this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by josh kibbe prison memoirs of an anarchist by alexander berkman part two chapter thirty four the death of dick sub rosa january fifteen nineteen hundred Tony, I write in an agony of despair. I am locked up again. It was all on account of my bird. You remember my feathered pet, Dick? Last summer, the warden ordered him put out. But when cold weather set in, Dick returned. Would he believe it? He came back to my old cell and recognized me when I passed by. I kept him, and he grew as tame as before. He had become a bit wild in the life outside. On Christmas Day, as Dick was playing near my cell, Bob Runyon the stool, you know, came by and deliberately kicked the bird. When I saw Dick turn over on his side, his little eyes rolling in the throes of death, I rushed at Runyon and knocked him down. He was not hurt much, and everything could have passed off quietly, as no screw was about. But the stool reported me to the deputy, and I was locked up. Mitchell's just been talking to me. The good old fellow was fond of Dick, and he promises to get me back on the range. He is keeping the position vacant for me, he says. He put a man in my place who has only a few more weeks to serve. Then I'm to take charge again. I am not disappointed at your information that the work will have to wait till spring. It's unavoidable, but I am happy that preparations have been started. How about those revolvers, though? You haven't changed your mind, I hope. In one of your letters you seem to hint that the matter has been attended to. How can that be? Jim the plumber, you know he can be trusted, has been on the lookout for a week. He assures me that nothing came so far. Why do you delay? I hope you didn't throw the package through the cellar window when Jim wasn't at his post. Hardly probable. But if you did, what the devil could have become of it? I see no sign here of the things being discovered. There would surely be a terrible hubbub. Look to it and write at once. A. End of section 41. Section 42 of Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman. Part 2. Chapter 35. An Alliance with the Birds. Part 1. The disappearance of the revolvers is shrouded in mystery. In vain I rack my brain to fathom the precarious situation. It defies comprehension and torments me with misgivings. Jim's certainty that the weapons did not pass between the bars of the cellar momentarily allays my dread. But Tony's vehement insistence that he had delivered the package throws me into a panic of fear. My firm faith in the two confidants distracts me with uncertainty and suspense. It is incredible that Tony should seek to deceive me, yet Jim has kept constant vigil at the point of delivery. There is little probability of his having missed the package. But supposing he has, what has become of it? Perhaps it fell into some dark corner of the cellar. The place must be searched at once. Desperate with anxiety, I resort to the most reckless means to afford Jim an opportunity to visit the cellar. I ransack the cell-house for old papers and rags, with miserly hand I gather all odds and ends, broken tools, pieces of wood, a bucket full of sawdust. Trembling with fear of discovery, I empty the treasure into the sewer at the end of the hall and tightly jam the elbow of the waste pipe. The smell of excrement fills the block, the cell privies overrun and inundate the hall. The stench is overpowering. Steadily the water rises. 
threatening to flood the cell house. The place is in a turmoil. The solitary shout and rattle on the bars. The guards rush about in confusion. The block captain yells, Hey, Jasper, hurry! Call the plumber! Get Jim! Quick! But repeated investigation of the cellar fails to disclose the weapons. In constant dread of dire possibilities, I tremble at every step, fancying lurking suspicion, sudden discovery, and disaster. But the days pass. The calm of the prison routine is undisturbed, giving no indication of untoward happening or agitation. By degrees my fears subside. The inexplicable disappearance of the revolvers is fraught with danger. The mystery is disquieting, but it has fortunately brought no results, and must apparently remain unsolved. Unexpectedly my fears are re-aroused. Called to the desk by Officer Mitchell for the distribution of the monthly allowance of matches, I casually glance out of the yard door. At the extreme northwestern end, Assistant Deputy Hopkins loiters near the wall, slowly walking on the grass. The unusual presence of the overseer at the abandoned gate wakes my suspicion. The singular idling of the energetic guard, his furtive eyeing of the ground, strengthens my worst apprehensions. Something must have happened. Are they suspecting the tunnel? But work has not been commenced. Besides, it is to terminate at the very opposite point of the yard, fully a thousand feet distant. In perplexity, I wonder at the peculiar actions of Hopkins. Had the weapons been found, every inmate would immediately be subjected to a search, and shops and cell-house ransacked. In anxious speculation, I pass a sleepless night. Morning dawns without bringing a solution. But after breakfast, the cell-house becomes strangely quiet. The shop employees remain locked in. The range men are ordered to their cells, and guards from the yard and shops march into the block and noisily ascend the galleries. The deputy and Hopkins scurry about the hall. The rotunda door is thrown open with a clang, and the sharp command of the warden resounds through the cell house. General search! I glance hurriedly over my table and shelf. Surprises of suspected prisoners are frequent, and I am always prepared. But some contraband is on hand. Quickly I snatch my writing material from the womb of the bed tick. In the very act of destroying several sketches of the previous year, a bright thought flashes across my mind. There is nothing dangerous about them, save the theft of the paper. Prison types in the streets of New York, Parkhurst and the prostitute, Libertas, a study in philology, the slavery of tradition, harmless products of evening leisure. Let them find the booklets. I'll be severely reprimanded for appropriating material from the shops, but my sketches will serve to divert suspicion. The warden will secretly rejoice that my mind is not busy with more dangerous activities. But the sudden search signifies grave developments. General overhaulings involving temporary suspension of the industries and consequent financial loss are rare. The search of the entire prison is not due till spring, its precipitancy confirms my worst fears. The weapons have undoubtedly been found. Jim's failure to get possession of them assumes a peculiar aspect. It is possible, of course, that some guard, unexpectedly passing through the cellar, discovered the bundle between the bars and appropriated it without attracting Jim's notice. Yet the latter's confident assertion of his presence at the window at the appointed moment indicates another probability. The thought is painful, disquieting, but who knows? In an atmosphere of fear and distrust and almost universal espionage, the best friendships are tinged with suspicion. It may be that Jim, afraid of consequences, surrendered the weapons to the warden. He would have no difficulty in explaining the discovery without further betrayal of my confidence. Yet Jim, a peat man of international renown, enjoys the reputation of a thoroughly square man and loyal friend. He has given me repeated proof of his confidence, and I am disinclined to accuse a possibly innocent man. It is fortunate, however, that his information is limited to the weapons. No doubt he suspects some sort of escape, but I have left him in ignorance of my real plans. With these, Tony alone is entrusted. The reflection is reassuring. Even if indiscretion on Tony's part is responsible for the accident, he has demonstrated his friendship. Realizing the danger of his mission, he may have thrown in the weapons between the cellar bars, ignoring my directions of previously ascertaining the presence of Jim at his post. 
but the discovery of the revolvers vindicates the veracity of Tony and strengthens my confidence in him. My fate rests in the hands of a loyal comrade, a friend who has already dared great peril for my sake. The general search is over, bringing to light quantities of various contraband. The counterfeit outfit, whose product has been circulating beyond the walls of the prison, is discovered, resulting in a secret investigation by federal officials. In the general excitement, the sketches among my effects have been ignored and left in my possession, but no clue has been found in connection with the weapons. The authorities are still further mystified by the discovery that the lock on the trapdoor in the roof of the cell-house building had been tampered with. With an effort I suppress a smile at the puzzled bewilderment of the kindly old Mitchell, as, with much secrecy, he confides to me the information. I marvel at the official stupidity that failed to make the discovery the previous year, when, by the aid of Jim and my young friend Russell, I had climbed to the top of the cell-house while the inmates were at church, and wrenched off the lock of the trapdoor, leaving in its place an apparent counterpart provided by Jim. With the key in our possession we watched for an opportunity to reach the outside roof when certain changes in the block created insurmountable obstacles forcing the abandonment of the project. Russell was unhappy over the discovery, the impulsive young prisoner steadfastly refusing to be reconciled to the failure. His time, however, being short, I have been urging him to accept the inevitable. The constant dwelling upon escape makes imprisonment more unbearable. The passing of his remaining two years would be hastened by the determination to serve out his sentence. The boy listens quietly to my advice, his blue eyes dancing with merriment, a sly smile on the delicate lips. "'You're right, Alec,' he replies gravely. "'But say, last night I thought out a scheme. It's great, and we're sure to make our getaway.' With minute detail he pictures the impossible plan of sawing through the bars of the cell at night, holding up the guards, binding and gagging them, and then the road would be clear. The innocent boy, for all his back-country reputation of a bad man, is not aware that then is the very threshold of difficulties. I seek to explain to him that, the guards being disposed of, we should find ourselves trapped in the cell-house. The solid steel double doors leading to the yard are securely locked, key in the sole possession of the captain of the night watch, who cannot be reached except through the well-guarded rotunda. But the boy is not to be daunted. "'We'll have to storm the rotunda, then,' he remarks calmly, and at once proceeds to map out a plan of campaign. He smiles incredulously at my refusal to participate in the wild scheme. "'Oh, yes, you will, Alec. I don't believe a word you say. I know you're keen to make a getaway.' His confidence, somewhat shaken by my resolution, he announces that he will go it alone. The declaration fills me with trepidation. The reckless youth will throw away his life. His attempt may frustrate my own success. But it is in vain to dissuade him by direct means. I know the determination of the boy. The smiling face veils the boundless self-assurance of exuberant youth combined with indomitable courage. The redundance of animal vitality and the rebellious spirit have violently disturbed the inertia of his rural home, aggravating its staid descendants of Dutch forebears. The taunt of ne'er-do-well has dripped bitter poison into the innocent pranks of Russell, stamping the brand of desperado upon the good-natured boy. I tax my ingenuity to delay the carrying out of his project. He has secreted the saws I have procured from the girl for the attempt of the previous year, and his determination is impatient to make the dash for liberty. Only his devotion to me and respect for my wishes still hold the impetuous boy in leash, but each day his restlessness increases. More insistently he urges my participation and a definite explanation of my attitude. At a loss to invent new objections, I almost despair of dissuading Russell from his desperate purpose. From day to day I secure his solemn promise to await my final decision the while I vaguely hope for some development that would force the abandonment of his plan. But nothing disturbs the routine, and I grow nervous with dread, lest the boy, reckless with impatience, thwart my great project. Part 2 The weather is moderating. The window sashes in the hall are being lowered. The signs of approaching spring multiply. I chafe at the lack of news from Tony, who had departed on his mission to New York, 
With greedy eyes I follow the chaplain on his rounds of mail delivery. Impatient of his constant pauses on the galleries, I hasten along the range to meet the postman. "'Any letters for me, Mr. Milligan?' I ask, with an effort to steady my voice. "'No, my boy.' My eyes devour the mail in his hand. "'None today, Alec,' he adds. "'This is for your neighbour, Pasquale.' I feel apprehensive at Tony's silence. Another twenty-four hours must elapse before the chaplain returns. Perhaps there will be no mail for me tomorrow, either. What can be the matter with my friend? So many dangers menace his every step. He might be sick. Some accident. Anxious days pass without mail. Russell is becoming more insistent, threatening a break. The solitaries murmur at my neglect. I am nervous and irritable. For two weeks I have not heard from Tony. Something terrible must have happened. In a ferment of dread, I keep watch on the upper rotunda. The noon hour is approaching. The chaplain fumbles with his keys. The door opens, and he trips along the ranges. Stealthily I follow him under the galleries, pretending to dust the bars. He descends to the hall. Good morning, chaplain. I seek to attract his attention, wistfully peering at the mail in his hand. Good morning, my boy. Feeling good today? Thank you. Pretty fair. My voice trembles at his delay, but I fear betraying my anxiety by renewed questioning. He passes me, and I feel sick with disappointment. Now he pauses. Alec, he calls. I mislaid a letter for you yesterday. Here it is. With shaking hand I unfold the sheet. In a fever of hope and fear I pore over it in the solitude of the cell. My heart palpitates violently as I scan each word and letter, seeking hidden meaning, analyzing every flourish and dash, carefully distilling the minute lines, fusing the significant dots into the structure of meaning. Glorious! A house has been rented, 28 Sterling Street, almost opposite the gate of the south wall. Funds are on hand. Work is to begin at once. With nimble step I walk the range. The river wafts sweet fragrance to my cell. The joy of spring is in my heart. Every hour brings me nearer to liberty. The faithful comrades are steadily working underground. Perhaps within a month, or two at most, the tunnel will be completed. I count the days, crossing off each morning the date on my calendar. The news from Tony is cheerful, encouraging. The work is progressing smoothly. The prospects of success are splendid. I grow merry at the efforts of uninitiated friends in New York to carry out the suggestions of the attorneys to apply to the Superior Court of the State for a writ on the ground of the unconstitutionality of my sentence. I consult gravely with Mr. Milligan upon the advisability of the step, the amiable chaplain affording me the opportunity of an extra allowance of letter paper. I thank my comrades for their efforts and urge the necessity of collecting funds for the appeal to the upper court Repeatedly I ask the advice of the chaplain in the legal matter, confident that my apparent enthusiasm will reach the ears of the warden. The artifice will mask my secret project and lull suspicion. My official letters breathe assurance of success, and with much show of confidence I impress upon the trustees my sanguine expectation of release. I discuss the subject with officers and stools till presently the prison is agog with the prospective liberation of its fourth oldest inmate. The solitaries charge me with messages to friends, and the deputy warden offers advice on behaviour beyond the walls. The moment is propitious for a bold stroke. Confined to the cell-house, I shall be unable to reach the tunnel. The privilege of the yard is imperative. It is June. Unfledged birdies frequently fall from their nests, and I induce the kindly runner Southside Johnny to procure for me a brace of sparlings. I christen the little orphans Dick and Sis, and the memory of my previous birds is revived among inmates and officers. Old Mitchell is in ecstasy over the intelligence and adaptability of my new feathered friends, but the birds languish and waste in the close air of the block. They need sunshine and gravel and the dusty street to bathe in. Gradually, I insist the sympathies of the new doctor by the curious performances of my pets. One day the warden strolls in and joins in admiration of the wonderful birds. Who trained them? he inquires. This man, the physician indicates me. A slight frown flits over the warden's face. Old Mitchell winks at me, encouragingly. Captain, I approach the warden. The birds are sickly for lack of air. 
Will you permit me to give them an airing in the yard? But why don't you let them go? You have no permission to keep them. Oh, it would be a pity to throw them out. The doctor intercedes. They are too tame to take care of themselves. Well, then, the warden decides, let Jasper take them out every day. They will not go with anyone except myself, I inform him. They follow me everywhere. The warden hesitates. Why not let Berkman go out with them for a few moments, the doctor suggests. I hear you expect to be free soon, he remarks to me casually. Your case is up for revision? Yes. Well, Berkman, the warden motions to me, I will permit you ten minutes in the yard after your sweeping is done. What time are you through with it? At 9.30 a.m. Mr. Mitchell, every morning at 9.30 you will pass Berkman through the doors for ten minutes on the watch. Then turning to me, he adds, you are to stay near the greenhouse. There is plenty of sand there. If you cross the deadline of the sidewalk or exceed your time a single minute, you will be punished. End of section 42 Recording by Stephen Harvey Section 43 of Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Grant. Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman. Part 2, Chapter 36, The Underground. May 10th, 1900. My dear Tony, your letters intoxicate me with hope and joy. No sooner have I sipped the rich aroma than I am athirst for more nectar. Right often, dear friend, it is the only solace of suspense. Do not worry about this end of the line. All is well. By stratagem, I have at last procured the privilege of the yard, only for a few minutes every morning, but I am judiciously extending my prescribed time and area. The prospects are bright here. Everyone talks of my application to the Superior Court, and peace reigns, you understand. A pity I cannot write directly to my dear, faithful comrades, your co-workers. You shall be the medium. Transmit to them my deepest appreciation. Tell Yankee and Ibsen and our Italian comrades what I feel. I know I need not explain it further to you. No one realizes better than myself the terrible risks they are taking, the fearful toil in silence and darkness, almost within hearing of the guards, the danger, the heroic self-sacrifice. What money could buy such devotion? I grow faint with the thought of their peril. I could almost cry at the beautiful demonstration of solidarity and friendship Dear comrades, I feel proud of you, and proud of the great truth of anarchism that can produce such disciples, such spirit. I embrace you, my noble comrades, and may you speed the day that will make me happy with the sight of your faces, the touch of your hands. June 5th. Dear Tony, your silence was unbearable. The suspense is terrible. Was it really necessary to halt operations so long? I am surprised you did not foresee the shortage of air and the lack of light. You would have saved so much time. It is a great relief to know that the work is progressing again, and very fortunate indeed that Yankee understands electricity. It must be hellish work to pump air into the shaft. Take precautions against the whir of the machinery. The piano idea is great. Keep her playing and singing as much as possible, and be sure you have all windows open. The beasts on the wall will be soothed by the music, and it will drown the noises underground. Have an electric button connected from the piano to the shaft. When the player sees anything suspicious on the street or the guards on the wall, she can at once notify the comrades to stop work. I am enclosing the wall and yard measurements, you asked. But why do you need them? Don't bother with unnecessary things. From house beneath the street, direct toward the southwestern wall. For that, you can procure measurements outside. On the inside, you require none. 
go under wall about 20 to 30 feet till you strike wall of blind alley. Cut into it and all will be complete. Right of progress without delay. Greetings to all. June 20th. Tony, your letters bewilder me. Why has the route been changed? You were to go southwest, yet you say now you are near the east wall. It's simply incredible, Tony. Your explanation is not convincing. If you found a gas main near the gate, you would have gone around it. Besides, the gate is out of your way anyhow. Why did you take that direction at all? I wish, Tony, you would follow my instructions and the original plan. Your failure to report the change immediately may prove fatal. I could have informed you, once you were near the southeastern gate, to go directly underneath. Then you would have saved digging under the wall. There is no stone foundation, of course, beneath the gate. Now that you have turned the southeast corner, you will have to come under the wall there, and it is the worst possible place, because that particular part used to be a swamp, and I have learned that it was filled with extra masonry. Another point, an old abandoned natural gas well is somewhere under the east wall, about 300 feet from the gate. Tell our friends to be on the lookout for fumes. It is a very dangerous place. Special precautions must be taken. Do not mind my brusqueness, dear Tony. My nerves are on edge. The suspense is driving me mad. And I must mask my feelings and smile and look indifferent. But I haven't a moment's peace. I imagine the most terrible things when you fail to write. Please be more punctual. I know you have your hands full, but I fear I'll go insane before this thing is over. Tell me especially how far you intend going along the east wall and where you'll come out. This complicates the matter. You have already gone a longer distance than would have been necessary per original plan. It was a grave mistake, and if you are not such a devoted friend, I'd feel very cross with you. Right at once. I am arranging a new sub rosa routine. They are building in the yard. Many outside drivers, you understand. Tunnel. A. House on Sterling Street from which the tunnel started. B. Point at which the tunnel entered under the east wall. C. Mat shop near which the author was permitted to take his birds for ten minutes every day for exercise. D. North Block, where the author was confined at the time of the tunnel episode. E. South Block. Dear Tony, I am in great haste to send this. You know the shed opposite the east wall. It is only a wooden floor and is not frequented much by officers. A few cons are there from the stone pile. I'll attend to them. Make directly for that shed. It's a short distance from wall. I enclose measurements. Tony, you distract me beyond words. What has become of your caution, your judgment? A hole in the grass will not do. I am absolutely opposed to it. There are a score of men on the stone pile and several screws. It is sure to be discovered. And even if you leave the upper crust intact for a foot or two, how am I to dive into the hole in the presence of so many? You don't seem to have considered that. There is only one way, the one I explained in my last. Go to the shed. It's only a little more work. 30 to 40 feet, no more. Tell the comrades the grass idea is impossible. A little more effort, friends, and all will be well. Answer at once. Dear Tony, why do you insist on the hole in the ground? I tell you again, it will not do. I won't consider it for a moment. I am on the inside. You must let me decide what can or cannot be done here. I am prepared to risk everything for liberty, would risk my life a thousand times. I am too desperate now for anyone to block my escape. I'd break through a wall of guards if necessary. But I still have a little judgment, though I am almost insane with the suspense and anxiety. 
If you insist on the whole, I'll make the break. Though there is not one chance in a hundred for success, I beg of you, Tony, the thing must be dug to the shed. It's only a little way. After such a tremendous effort, can we jeopardize it all so lightly? I assure you, the success of the whole plan is unthinkable. They'd all see me go down into it. I'd be followed at once. What's the use of talking? Besides, you know, I have no revolvers. Of course, I'll have a weapon, but it will not help the escape. Another thing, your change of plans has forced me to get an assistant. The man is reliable, and I have only confided to him parts of the project. I need him to investigate around the shed, take measurements, etc. I am not permitted anywhere near the wall, but you need not trouble about this. I'll be responsible for my friend, but I tell you about it so that you prepare two pair of overalls instead of one. Also, leave two revolvers in the house, money and cipher directions for us where to go. None of our comrades is to wait for us. Let them all leave as soon as everything is ready. But be sure you don't stop at the hole. Go to the shed, absolutely. Tony, the hole will not do. The more I think of it, the more impossible I find it. I am sending an urgent call for money to the editor. You know whom I mean. Get in communication with him at once. Use the money to continue work to shed. Direct to Box A7, Allegheny City, Pennsylvania, June 25th, 1900. Dear Comrade, the chaplain was very kind to permit me an extra sheet of paper on urgent business. I write to you in a very great extremity. You are aware of the efforts of my friends to appeal my case. Read carefully, please. I have lost faith in their attorneys. I have engaged my own lawyers, lawyers in quotation marks, a prison joke, you see. I have utmost confidence in these lawyers. They will absolutely procure my release, even if it is not a pardon, you understand. I mean, we'll go to the superior court, different from a pardon board, another prison joke. My friends are short of money. We need some at once. The work is started, but cannot be finished for lack of funds. Mark well what I say. I'll not be responsible for anything. The worst may happen unless money is procured at once. You have influence. I rely on you to understand and to act promptly. Your comrade, Alexander Berkman. My poor Tony, I can see how this thing has gone on your nerves. To think that you, you, the cautious Tony, should be so reckless to send me a telegram. You could have ruined the whole thing. I had trouble explaining to the chaplain, but it's all right now. Of course, if it must be the whole, it can't be helped. I understood the meaning of your wire from the seventh bar on the east wall, ten feet to west. We'll be there on the minute, 3 p.m., but July 4th won't do. It's a holiday. No work. My friend will be locked up. Can't leave him in the lurch. It will have to be next day, July 5th. It's only three days more. I wish it was over. I can't bear the worry and suspense anymore. May it be my Independence Day. July 6th. Tony, it's terrible. It's all over. Couldn't make it. Went there on time, but found a big pile of stone and brick right on top of the spot. Impossible to do anything. I warned you they were building near there. I was seen at the wall. Am now strictly forbidden to leave the cell house. But my friend has been there a dozen times since. The hole can't be reached. A mountain of stones hides it. It won't be discovered for a little while. Telegraph at once to New York for more money. You must continue to the shed. I can force my way there if need be. It's the only hope. Don't lose a minute. July 13th. Tony, a hundred dollars was sent to the office for me from New York. I told Chaplin it is for my appeal. I am sending the money to you. Have work continue at once. There is still hope. Nothing suspected. But the wire that you pushed through the grass to indicate the spot was not found by my friend. Too much stone over it. Go to shed at once. July 16th. Tunnel discovered. Lose no time. Leave the city immediately. I am locked up on suspicion.
End of section 43. Section 44 of Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine Lehman, Reseda, California. Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman. Section 44, Chapter 37 anxious days the discovery of the tunnel overwhelms me with the violence of an avalanche the plan of continuing the work the trembling hope of escape of liberty life all is suddenly terminated my nerves tense with the months of suspense and anxiety relax abruptly with torpid brain i wonder is it possible is it really possible an air of uneasiness as of lurking danger fills the prison vague rumors are afloat a wholesale jail delivery had been planned the walls were to be dynamited the guards killed an escape has actually taken place it is whispered about the warden wears a look of bewilderment and fear the officers are alert with suspicion the inmates manifest disappointment and nervous impatience. The routine is violently disturbed. The shops are closed, the men locked in the cells. The discovery of the tunnel mystifies the prison and the city authorities. Some children, at play on the street, had accidentally wandered into the yard of the deserted house opposite the prison gates. The piles of freshly dug soil attracted their attention. A boy, stumbling into the cellar, was frightened by the sight of the deep cavern. His mother notified the agent of the house, who, by a peculiar coincidence, proved to be an officer of the penitentiary. But in vain are the efforts of the prison authorities to discover any sign of the tunnel within the walls. Days pass in the fruitless investigation of the yard. The outlet of the tunnel within the prison cannot be found. Perhaps the underground passage does not extend to the penitentiary. The warden voices his firm conviction that the walls have not been penetrated. Evidently, it was not the prison, he argues, which was the objective point of the diggers. The authorities of the city of Allegheny decide to investigate the passage from the house on Sterling Street, but the men that essay to crawl through the narrow tunnel are forced to abandon their mission, driven back by the fumes of escaping gas. It is suggested that the unknown diggers, whatever their purpose, have been trapped in the abandoned gas well and perished before the arrival of aid. The fearful stench no doubt indicates the decomposition of human bodies. The terrible accident has forced the inmates of 28 Sterling Street to suspend their efforts before completing the work. The condition of the house the half-eaten meal on the table, the clothing scattered about the rooms, the general disorder, all seem to point to precipitate flight. The persistence of the assertion of a fatal accident disquiets me, in spite of my knowledge to the contrary. Yet, perhaps the reckless Tony, in his endeavor to force the wire signal through the upper crust, perished in the well. The thought unnerves me with horror, till it is announced that a negro whom the police had induced to crawl the length of the tunnel brought positive assurance that no life was sacrificed in the underground work still the prison authorities are unable to find the objective point and it is finally decided to tear up the streets beneath which the tunnel winds its mysterious way the undermined place inside the walls at last being discovered after a week of digging at various points in the yard the warden reluctantly admits the apparent purpose of the tunnel at the same time informing the press that the evident design was the liberation of the anarchist prisoner he corroborates his view by the circumstance that I had been reported for unpermitted presence at the east wall, pretending to collect gravel for my birds. Assistant Deputy Warden Hopkins further asserts having seen and talked with Carl Nold near the criminal house a short time before the discovery of the tunnel. 
the developments fraught with danger to my friends greatly alarm me fortunately no clue can be found in the house save a note in cipher which apparently defies the skill of experts the warden on his sunday rounds passes my cell then turns as if suddenly recollecting something here berkman he says blandly producing a paper the press is offering a considerable reward to anyone who will decipher the note found in the sterling street house it's reproduced here see if you can't make it out i scan the paper carefully quickly reading tony's directions for my movements after the escape then returning the paper i remark indifferently i can read several languages captain but this is beyond me the police and detective bureaus of the twin cities make the announcement that a thorough investigation conclusively demonstrates that the tunnel was intended for william boyd a prisoner serving twelve years for a series of daring forgeries his pals had succeeded in clearing fifty thousand dollars on forged bonds and it is they who did the wonderful feat underground to secure the liberty of the valuable penman the controversy between the authorities of allegheny and the management of the prison is full of animosity and bitterness wardens of prisons chiefs of police and detective departments of various cities are consulted upon the mystery of the ingenious diggers and the discussion in the press waxes warm and antagonistic presently the chief of police of allegheny suffers a change of heart and sides with the warden as against his personal enemy the head of the pittsburgh detective bureau the confusion of published views and my persistent denial of complicity in the tunnel cause the much worried warden to fluctuate a number of men are made the victims of his mental uncertainty following my exile into solitary pat mcgraw is locked up as a possible beneficiary of the planned escape in eighteen ninety he had slipped through the roof of the prison the warden argues and it is therefore reasonable to assume that the man is meditating another delivery jack robinson cronin nan and a score of others are in turn suspected by captain wright and ordered locked up during the preliminary investigation but because of absolute lack of clues the prisoners are presently returned to work and the number of suspects is reduced to myself and boyd the warden having discovered that the latter had recently made an attempt to escape by forcing an entry into the cupola of the shop he was employed in only to find the place useless for his purpose a process of elimination and the espionage of the trustees gradually center exclusive suspicion upon myself in surprise i learn that young russell has been cited before the captain the fear of indiscretion on the part of the boy startles me from my torpor i must employ every device to confound the authorities and save my friends fortunately none of the tunnelers have yet been arrested the controversy between the city officials and the prison management having favored inaction my comrades cannot be jeopardized by russell his information is limited to the mere knowledge of the specific person for whom the tunnel was intended the names of my friends are entirely unfamiliar to him my heart goes out to the young prisoner as i reflect that never once had he manifested curiosity concerning the men at the secret work desperate with confinement and passionately yearning for liberty though he was he had yet offered to sacrifice his longings to aid my escape how transported with joy was the generous youth when i resolved to share my opportunity with him he had given faithful service in attempting to locate the tunnel entrance the poor boy had been quite distracted at our failure to find the spot i feel confident russell will not betray the secret in his keeping yet the persistent questioning by the warden and inspectors is perceptibly working on the boy's mind he is so young and inexperienced barely nineteen a slip of the tongue an inadvertent remark might convert suspicion into conviction every day russell is called to the office 
causing me torments of apprehension and dread till a glance at the returning prisoner smiling encouragingly as he passes my cell informs me that the danger is past for the day with a deep pang i observe the increasing pallor of his face the growing restlessness in his eyes the languid step the continuous inquisition is breaking him down with quivering voice he whispers as he passes alec i'm afraid of them the warden has threatened him he informs me if he persists in his pretended ignorance of the tunnel his friendship for me is well known the warden reasons we have often been seen together in the cell-house and yard i must surely have confided to russell my plans of escape the big strapping youth is dwindling to a shadow under the terrible strain dear faithful friend how guilty i feel toward you how torn in my inmost heart to have suspected your devotion even for that brief instant when in a panic of fear you had denied to the warden all knowledge of the slip of paper found in your cell it cast suspicion upon me as the writer of the strange jewish scrawl the warden scorned my explanation that russell's desire to learn hebrew was the sole reason for my writing the alphabet for him the mutual denial seemed to point to some secret the scrawl was similar to the cipher note found in the sterling street house the warden insisted how strange that i should have so successfully confounded the inspectors with the contradictory testimony regarding the tunnel that they returned me to my position on the range and yet the insignificant incident of russell's hieroglyphic imitation of the hebrew alphabet should have given the warden a pretext to order me into solitary how distracted and bitter i must have felt to charge the boy with treachery his very reticence strengthened my suspicion and all the while the tears welled into his throat choking the innocent lad beyond speech how little i suspected the terrible wound my hasty imputation had caused my devoted friend in silence he suffered for months without opportunity to explain when at last by mere accident i learned the fatal mistake in vain i strive to direct my thoughts into different channels my misunderstanding of russell plagues me with recurring persistence the unjust accusation torments my sleepless nights it was a moment of intense joy that i experienced as i humbly begged his pardon to-day when i met him in the captain's office a deep sense of relief almost of peace filled me at his unhesitating oh never mind alec it's all right we were both excited i was overcome by thankfulness and admiration of the noble boy and the next instant the sight of his wan face his wasted form pierced me as with a knife thrust with the earnest conviction of strong faith i sought to explain to the board of inspectors the unfortunate error regarding the jewish writing but they smiled doubtfully it was too late their opinion of a pre-arranged agreement with russell was settled but the testimony of assistant deputy hopkins that he had seen and conversed with nold a few weeks before the discovery of the tunnel and that he saw him enter the criminal house afforded me an opportunity to divide the views among the inspectors i experienced little difficulty in convincing two members of the board that nold could not possibly have been connected with the tunnel because for almost a year previously and since he had been in the employ of a st louis firm they accepted my offer to prove by the official timetables of the company that nold was in st louis on the very day that hopkins claimed to have spoken with him the fortunate and very natural error of hopkins in mistaking the similar appearance of tony for that of carl enabled me to discredit the chief link connecting my friends with the tunnel the diverging views of the police officials of the twin cities still further confounded the inspectors and i was gravely informed by them that the charge of attempted escape against me had not been conclusively substantiated they ordered my reinstatement as rangeman 
but the captain, on learning the verdict, at once charged me before the board with conducting a secret correspondence with Russell. On the pretext of the alleged Hebrew note, the inspectors confirmed the warden's judgment, and I was sentenced to the solitary, and immediately locked up in the south wing. End of section 44 Recording by Christine Lehman, Reseda, California Section 45 of Prism Memoirs of an Anarchist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chad Horner from Ballyclare in County Antrim, Northern Ireland, situated in the northeast of the island of Ireland. Prism Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman. Part 2, Chapter 38 How Men Their Brothers Mean. Section 1 the solitary is stifling with the august heat the hall windows high above the floor cast a sickly light shrouding the bottom range in darksome gloom at every point my gaze meets the irritating white of the walls in spots of yellow with damp the long days are oppressive with silence the stone cage echoes my languid footsteps mournfully once more i feel cast into the night torn from the midst of the living the failure of the tunnel forever excludes the hope of liberty terrified by the possibilities of the planned escape the warden's determination dims my fate i shall end my days in strictest seclusion he has informed me severe punishment is visited upon any one daring to converse with me even officers are forbidden to pause at my cell old evans the night guard is afraid even to answer my greeting since he was disciplined with the loss of ten days pay for being seen at my door it was not his fault poor old man the night was sultry the sashes of the hall window opposite my cell were tightly closed almost suffocated with the foul air i requested the passing evans to raise the window it had been ordered shut by the warden he informed me as he turned to leave three sharp raps on the bars of the upper rotunda almost rooted him to the spot with amusement it was two a m no one was supposed to be there at night come here evans I recognized the curt tones of the warden. What business have you at that man's door? I could distinctly hear each word, cutting the stillness of the night. In vain the frightened officer sought to explain. He had merely answered a question. He had stopped but a moment. I've been watching you there for half an hour, the irate warden insisted. Report to me in the morning. Since then the guards on their rounds merely glance between the bars and pass on in silence. I have been removed within closer observation of the nightly prowling captain, and am now located near the rotunda, in the second cell on the ground floor, range Y. The stringent orders of exceptional surveillance have so terrorized my friends that they do not venture to look in my direction. A single officer has been assigned to the vicinity of my door, his sole duty to keep me under observation. I feel buried alive. Communication with my comrades has been interrupted, the warden detaining my meal. I am deprived of books and papers, all my privileges curtailed. If only I had my birds, the company of my little pets would give me consolation, but they have been taken from me, and I fear the guards have killed them. Deprived of work and exercise, I pass the days in the solitary, monotonous, interminable. Section 2 By degrees, anxiety over my friends is allied. The mystery of the tunnel remains unsolved. The warden reiterates his moral certainty that the underground passage was intended for the liberation of the anarchist prisoner. The views of the police and detective officials of the twin cities are hopelessly divergent. Each side asserts thorough familiarity with the case, and positive conviction regarding the guilty parties. But the alleged clues proving misleading, the matter is finally abandoned. The passage has been filled with cement, and the official investigation is terminated. The safety of my comrades shed a ray of light into the darkness of my existence. It is consoling to reflect that, disastrous as the failure is to myself, my friends will not be made victims of my longing for liberty. At no time since the discovery of the tunnel has suspicion been directed to the right persons. The narrow official horizon does not extend beyond the familiar names of the girl, Nold, and Bauer. These have been pointed at by the accusing finger repeatedly. But the men actually concerned in the secret attempt have not even been mentioned. No danger threatens him from the failure of my plans. 
in the communication to a local newspaper nold has incontrovertibly proved his continuous residence in st louis for a period covering a year previous to the tunnel and afterwards bower has recently married at no time have the police been in ignorance of his whereabouts and they are aware that my former fellow prisoner is to be discounted as a participator in the attempted escape indeed the prison officials must have learned from my mail that the big german is regarded by my friends as an ex-comrade merely but the suspicion of the authorities directed toward the girl with a pang of bitterness i think of her unfortunate absence from the country during the momentous period of the underground work with resentment i reflect that but for that i might now be at liberty her skill as an organizer her growing influence in the movement her energy and devotion would have assured the success of the undertaking but tony's unaccountable delay had resulted in her departure without learning of my plans it is to him to his obstinacy and conceit that the failure of the project is mostly due staunch and faithful though he is in turn i lay the responsibility at the door of this friend and that lashing myself into furious rage at the renegade who had appropriated a considerable sum of the money intended for the continuation of the underground work yet the outbursts of passion spent i strive to find consolation in the correctness of the intuitive judgment that prompted the selection of my lawyers the devoted comrades who so heroically toiled for my sake in the bowels of the earth half naked they had laboured through the weary days and nights stretched at full length in the narrow passage their bodies perspiring and chilled in turn their hands bleeding with the terrible toil and though the weeks and months of nerve-wracking work and confinement in the tunnel of constant dread of detection and anxiety over the result my comrades had uttered no word of doubt or fear in full reliance upon their invisible friend what self-sacrifice in behalf of one whom some of you had never even known dear beloved comrades had you succeeded my life could never repay your almost superhuman efforts and love only the future years of active devotion to our great common cause could in a measure express my thankfulness and pride in you whoever wherever you are nor were your heroism your skill and indomitable perseverance without avail you have given an invaluable demonstration of the elemental reality of the ideal of the marvellous strength and courage born of solidaric purpose of the heights devotion to a great cause can ascend and the lesson has not been lost almost unanimous is the voice of the press only anarchists could have achieved the wonderful feat the subject of the tunnel fascinates my mind how little thought i had given to my comrades toiling underground in the anxious days of my own apprehension and suspense with increasing vividness i visualized their trepidation the constant fear of discovery the Akurlian efforts in spite of ever-present danger how terrible must have been their despair at the inability to continue the work of a successful termination my reflections fill me with renewed strength i must live i must live to meet those heroic men to take them by the hand and with silent lips pour my heart into their eyes i shall be proud of their comradeship and strive to be worthy of it section three the lines form in the hallway and silently march to the shops i peer through the bars for the sight of a familiar face brings cheer and the memory of the days on the range my friends unseen for years pass by my cell how big jack was wasted the deep chest is sunk in the face drawn and yellow the reddish spots about the cheekbones poor jack so strong and energetic how languid and weak his step is now and jimmy is all broken up with rheumatism and hops and crutches with difficulty i recognize harry fisher the two years have completely changed the young morganza boy he looks old at seventeen the rosy cheeks are ghastly white the delicate features immobile hard and large bright eyes dull and glassy vividly my friends stand before me in the youth and strength of their first arrival how changed their appearance my poor chums readers of the prison blossoms helpers in our investigation efforts what wrecks the torture of hell has made of you i recall with sadness the first years of my imprisonment and my coldly impersonal valuation of social victims there is evans the aged burglar smiling furtively at me from the line far in the distance seems the day 
when i read his marginal note upon a magazine article i sent him concerning the stupendous cost of crime i had felt quite piqued at the flippancy of his comment we come high but they must have us with the severe intellectuality of revolutionary tradition i thought of him and his kind as inevitable fungus growths the rotten fruit of a decaying society unfortunate derelicts indeed yet parasites almost devoid of humanity but the threads of comradeship have slowly been woven by common misery the touch of sympathy has discovered the man beneath the criminal the crust of sullen suspicion has melted at the breath of kindness warming into view the palpitating human heart old evans and sammy and bob what suffering and pain must have chilled their very souls with the winter of savage bitterness and the resurrection trembles with them how terrible man's ignorance that forever condemns itself to be scourged by its own blind fury and these my friends davis and russell these innocently guilty what worse punishment could society inflict upon itself than the loss of their latent nobility which it had killed not entirely in vain are the years of suffering that have wakened my kinship with the humanity of les miserables whom social stupidity has cast into the valley of death end of section forty five section forty six of prison memoirs of an anarchist this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman Part 2, Chapter 39 A New Plan of Escape My new neighbour turns my thoughts into a different channel. It is Fighting Tom, returned after several years of absence. By means of a string attached to a wire, we swing notes to each other at night, and Tom startles me by the confession that he was the author of the mysterious note I had received soon after my arrival in the penitentiary. An escape was being planned, he informs me, and I was to be let in by his recommendation. But, one of the conspirators getting cold feet, the plot was betrayed to the warden, whereupon Tom sent the snitch to the hospital. As a result, however, he was kept in solitary till his release. In the prison, he had become proficient as a broom-maker, and it was his intention to follow the trade. There was nothing in the crooked line, he thought, and he resolved to be honest. But on the day of his discharge, he was arrested at the gate by officers from Illinois on an old charge. He swore vengeance against Assistant Deputy Hopkins, before whom he had once accidentally let drop the remark that he would never return to Illinois because he was wanted there. He lived the five years in the Joliet prison in the sole hope of getting square with the man who had so meanly betrayed him. Upon his release, he returned to Pittsburgh, determined to kill Hopkins. On the night of his arrival, he broke into the latter's residence, prepared to avenge his wrongs, but the assistant deputy had left the previous day on his vacation. Furious at being baffled, Tom was about to set fire to the house when the light of his match fell upon a silver trinket on the bureau of the bedroom. It fascinated him. He could not take his eyes off it. Suddenly, he was seized with a desire to examine the contents of the house. The old passion was upon him. He could not resist. Hardly conscious of his actions, he gathered the silverware into a tablecloth and quietly stole out of the house. He was arrested the next day as he was trying to pawn his booty. An old offender, he received a sentence of ten years. Since his arrival, eight months ago, he has been kept in solitary. His health is broken. He has no hope of surviving his sentence. But if he is to die, he swears he is going to take his man along. Aware of the determination of fighting Tom, I realise that the safety of the hated officer is conditioned by Tom's lack of opportunity to carry out his revenge. I feel little sympathy for Hopkins, whose craftiness in worming out the secrets of prisoners has placed him on the payroll of the Pinkerton Agency. But I exert myself to persuade Tom that it would be sheer insanity thus deliberately to put his head in the noose. He is still a young man, barely thirty. It is not worth while sacrificing his life for the sneak of a guard. However, 
Tom remains stubborn. My arguments seem merely to rouse his resistance and strengthen his resolution. But closer acquaintance reveals to me his exceeding conceit over his art and technique as a second-story expert. I play upon his vanity, scoffing at the crudity of his plans of revenge. Would it not be more in conformity with his reputation as a skilled gun, I argue, to do the job in a smoother manner? Tom assumes a sceptical attitude, but, by degrees, grows more interested. Presently, with unexpected enthusiasm, he warms to the suggestion of a break. Once outside, well, I'll get him all right, he chuckles. The plan of escape completely absorbs us. On alternate nights, we take turns in timing the rounds of the guards, the appearance of the night captain, the opening of the rotunda door. Numerous details, seemingly insignificant, yet potentially fatal, are to be mastered. Many obstacles bar the way of success. But time and perseverance will surmount them. Tom is thoroughly engrossed with the project. I realise the desperation of the undertaking, but the sole alternative is slow death in the solitary. It is the last resort. With utmost care, we make our preparations. The summer is long past. The dense fogs of the season will aid our escape. We hasten to complete all details, in great nervous tension with the excitement of the work. The time is drawing near for deciding upon a definite date. But Tom's state of mind fills me with apprehension. He has become taciturn of late. Yesterday he seemed peculiarly glum, sullenly refusing to answer my signal. Again and again I knock on the wall, calling for a reply to my last note. Tom remains silent. Occasionally a heavy groan issues from his cell, but my repeated signals remain unanswered. In alarm, I stay awake all night, in the hope of inducing a guard to investigate the cause of the groaning. But my attempts to speak to the officers are ignored. The next morning, I behold Tom carried on a stretcher from his cell and learn with horror that he had bled to death during the night. The peculiar death of my friend preys on my mind. Was it suicide or accident? Tom had been weakened by long confinement. In some manner, he may have ruptured a blood vessel, dying for lack of medical aid. It is hardly probable that he would commit suicide on the eve of our attempt. Yet, certain references in his notes of late, ignored at the time, assume new significance. He was apparently under the delusion that Hopkins was after him. Once or twice my friend had expressed fear for his safety. He might be poisoned, he hinted. I had laughed the matter away, familiar with the sporadic delusions of men in solitary. Close confinement exerts a similar effect upon the majority of prisoners. Some are especially predisposed to autosuggestion. Young Sid used to manifest every symptom of the diseases he read about. Perhaps poor Tom's delusion was responsible for his death. Spencer, too, had committed suicide a month before his release, in the firm conviction that the warden would not permit his discharge. It may be that, in a fit of sudden despondency, Tom had ended his life. Perhaps I could have saved my friend. I did not realise how constantly he brooded over the danger he believed himself threatened with. How little I knew of the terrible struggle that must have been going on in his tortured heart. Yet we were so intimate. I believed I understood his every feeling and emotion. The thought of Tom possesses my mind. The news from the girl about Bresci's execution of the King of Italy rouses little interest in me. Bresci avenged the peasants and the women and children shot before the palace for humbly begging bread. He did well, and the agitation resulting from his act may advance the cause. But it will have no bearing on my fate. The last hope of escape has departed with my poor friend. I am doomed to perish here. And Bresci will perish in prison. 
but the comrades will eulogize him and his act and continue their efforts to regenerate the world. Yet, I feel that the individual, in certain cases, is of more direct and immediate consequence than humanity. What is the latter but the aggregate of individual existences? And shall these, the best of them, forever be sacrificed for the metaphysical collectivity? Here, all around me, a thousand unfortunates daily suffer the torture of Calvary, forsaken by God and man. They bleed and struggle and suicide with the desperate cry for a little sunshine and life. How shall they be helped? How helped amid the injustice and brutality of a society whose chief monuments are prisons? And so we must suffer, and suicide, and countless others after us, till the play of social forces shall transform human history into the history of true humanity. And meanwhile, our bones will bleach on the long, dreary road. Bereft of the last hope of freedom, I grow indifferent to life. The monotony of the narrow cell daily becomes more loathsome. My whole body being longs for rest. Rest. No more to awaken. The world will not miss me. An atom of matter. I shall return to endless space. Everything will pursue its wanted course, but I shall know no more of the bitter struggle and strife. My friends will sorrow, and yet be glad my pain is over, and continue on their way. A new Breshis will arise, and more kings will fall. And then all, friend and enemy, will go my way, and new generations will be born and die, and humanity and the world be whirled into space and disappear. And again the little stage will be set, and the same history, and the same facts will come and go. The playthings of cosmic forces renewing and transforming forever. How insignificant it all is in the eye of reason. How small and puny life and all its pain and travail. With eyes closed, I behold myself suspended by the neck from the upper bars of the cell. My body swings gently against the door, striking it softly once, twice. Just like Pasquale, when he hanged himself in the cell next to mine some months ago. A few twitches and the last breath is gone. My face grows livid, my body rigid. Slowly, it cools. The night guard passes. What's this, eh? He rings the rotunda bell. Keys clang, the lever is drawn and my door unlocked. An officer draws a knife sharply across the rope at my bars. My body sinks to the floor, my head striking against the iron bedstead. The doctor kneels at my side. I feel his hand over my heart. Now he rises. Good job, Doc? I recognise the deputy's voice. The physician nods. Damn glad of it, Hopkins sneers. The warden enters, a grin on his parchment face. With an oath, I spring to my feet. In terror, the officers rush from the cell. Ah, I fooled you, didn't I, you murderers? The thought of the enemy's triumph fans the embers of life. It engenders defiance and strengthens stubborn resistance. End of section 46. Recording by Kate M. Section 47 of Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Jarrow. Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman. Part 1, Chapter 15, Done to Death. In my utter isolation, the world outside appears like a faint memory, unreal and dim. The deprivation of newspapers has entirely severed me from the living, Letters from my comrades have become rare and irregular. They sound strangely cold and impersonal. The life of the prison is also receding. No communication reaches me from my friends. Pious John, the range man, is unsympathetic. 
he still bears me ill will from the days of the jail. Only young Russell still remembers me. I tremble for the reckless boy as I hear his low cough, apprising me of the stiff he unerringly shoots between the bars while the double file of prisoners marches past my door. He looks pale and haggard, the old buoyant step now languid and heavy. A tone of apprehension pervades his notes. He is constantly harassed by the officers, he writes. His task has been increased. He is nervous and weak, and his health is declining. In the broken sentences, I sense some vague misgiving, as of impending calamity. With intense thankfulness, I think of Russell. Again, I live through the hopes and fears that drew us into closer friendship. The days of terrible anxiety incident to the tunnel project. My heart goes out to the faithful boy whose loyalty and discretion have so much aided the safety of my comrades. A strange longing for his companionship possesses me. In the gnawing loneliness, his face floats before me, casting the spell of a friendly presence, his strong features softened by sorrow, his eyes grown large with the same sweet sadness of little Felipe. A peculiar tenderness steals into my thoughts of the boy. I look forward eagerly to his notes. Impatiently, I scan the faces in the passing line, wistful for the sight of the youth, and my heart beats faster at his fleeting smile. How sorrowful he looks! Now he is gone. The hours are weary with silence and solitude. Listlessly, I turn to the pages of my library book. If only I had the birds, I should find solace in their thoughtful eyes. Dick and Sis would understand and feel with me. But my poor little friends have disappeared. Only Russell remains. My only friend. I shall not see him when he returns to the cell at noon. The line passes on the opposite side of the hall. But in the afternoon... When the men are again unlocked for work, I shall look into his eyes for a happy moment, and perhaps the dear boy will have a message for me. He is so tender-hearted. His correspondence is full of sympathy and encouragement, and he strives to cheer me with the good news. Another day is gone. His sentence is nearing its end. He will at once secure a position and save every penny to aid in my release. Tacitly I concur in his ardent hope. It would break his heart to be disillusioned. 2. The passing weeks and months bring no break in the dreary monotony. The call of the robin on the river bank rouses no echo in my heart. No sign of awakening spring brightens the constant semi-darkness of the solitary. The dampness of the cell is piercing my bones. Every movement racks my body with pain. My eyes are tortured with the eternal white of the walls. Somber shadows brood around me. I long for a bit of sunshine. I wait patiently at the door. Perhaps it is clear today. My cell faces west. Maybe the setting sun will steal a glance upon me. For hours I stand with naked breast close to the bars. I must not miss a friendly ray. It may suddenly peep into the cell and turn away from me, unseen in the gloom. Now a bright beam plays on my neck and shoulders, and I press closer to the door to welcome the dear stranger. He caresses me with soft touch. Perhaps it is the soul of little Dick pouring out his tender greeting in this song of light. Or maybe the astral aura of my beloved Uncle Maxim, bringing warmth and hope. Sweet conceit of oriental thought, barren of joy in life. The sun is fading. It feels chilly in the twilight. 
and now the solitary is once more bleak and cold. As his release approaches, the tone of native confidence becomes more assertive in Russell's letter. The boy is jubilant and full of vitality. Within three months, he will breathe the air of freedom. A note of sadness that leaves me behind permeates his communications, but he is enthusiastic over his project of aiding me to liberty. Eagerly every day I anticipate his mute greeting as he passes in the line. This morning I saw him hold up two fingers, the third crooked, in the sign of the remaining two and a stump. A joyous light in his eyes, his step firmer, more elastic. But in the afternoon he is missing from the line. With sudden apprehension I wonder at his absence. Could I have overlooked him in the closely walking ranks? It is barely possible. Perhaps he has remained in his cell, not feeling well. It may be nothing serious. He will surely be in the line tomorrow. For three days, every morning and afternoon, I anxiously scrutinize the faces of the passing men, but Russell is not among them. His absence torments me with a thousand fears. Maybe the warden has renewed his inquisition of the boy. Perhaps he got into a fight in the shop. In the dungeon now, he'll lose his commutation time. Unable to bear the suspense, I'm about to appeal to the chaplain when a friendly runner surreptitiously hands me a note. With difficulty, I recognize my friend's bold handwriting in the uneven, nervous scrawl. Russell is in the hospital. At work in the shop, he writes, he had suffered a chill. The doctor committed him to the ward for observation. But the officers and the convict nurses accuse him of shamming to evade work. They threaten to have him return to the shop, and he implores me to have the chaplain intercede for him. He feels weak and feverish, and the thoughts of being left alone in the cell in his present condition fills him with horror. I send an urgent request to see the chaplain, but the guard informs me that Mr. Milligan is absent. He's not expected at the office till the following week. I prevail upon the kindly Mitchell, recently transferred to the South Block, to deliver a note to the warden, in which I appeal on behalf of Russell. But several days pass, and still no reply from Captain Wright. Finally, I pretend severe pains in the bowels, to afford Frank, the doctor's assistant, an opportunity to pause at my cell. As the medicine boy pours a prescribed pint of horse salts through the funnel inserted between the bars, I hastily inquire, Is Russell still in the ward, Frank? How is he? What Russell? he asks indifferently. Russell Schroyer, put four days ago under observation. Oh, that poor kid! Why, he is paralyzed! For an instant I am speechless with terror. No, it, it cannot be. Some mistake. Frank, I mean young Schroyer, from the construction shop. He's number 2608. Your friend Russell. I know who you mean. I'm sorry for the boy. He is paralyzed, all right. But no, it can't be. Why, Frank, it was just a chill and a little weakness. Look here, Alec. I know you're square, and you can keep a secret all right. I'll tell you something, if you won't give me away. Yes, yes, Frank, what is it? Shh, shh. You know Flem, the night nurse? Doing a five-spot for murder? His father and the warden are old cronies. That's how he got to be nurse. Don't know a damn thing about it, and careless as hell. Always makes mistakes. Well, Doc ordered an injection for Russell. Now don't ever say I told you. Flam got the wrong bottle. Gave the poor boy some acid in the injection. Paralyzed the kid he did, the damn murderer. I 
pass the night in anguish. Clutching desperately at the faint hope that it cannot be, some mistake, perhaps Frank, has exaggerated. But in the morning, the medicine boy confirms my worst fear. The doctor has said the boy will die. Russell does not realize the situation. There is something wrong with his legs, the poor boy writes. He is unable to move them and suffers great pain. It can't be fever, he thinks, but the physician will not tell him what is the matter. The kindly Frank is sympathetic. Every day he passes notes between us, and I try to encourage Russell. He will improve, I assure him. His time is short, and fresh air and liberty will soon restore him. My words seem to soothe my friend, and he grows more cheerful when unexpectedly he learns the truth from the wrangling nurses. His notes grow piteous with misery. Tears fill my eyes as I read his despairing cry. Oh, Alec, I am so young. I don't want to die. He implores me to visit him. If I could only come to nurse him, he is sure he would improve. He distrusts the convict attendants, who harry and banter the country lad. Their heartless abuse is irritating the sick boy beyond patience. Exasperated by the taunts of the night nurse, Russell yesterday threw a saucer at him. He was reported to the doctor, who threatened to send the paralyzed youth to the dungeon. Plagued and tormented in great suffering, Russell grows bitter and complaining. The nurses and officers are persecuting him, he writes. They will soon do him to death if I will not come to his rescue. If he could go to an outside hospital, he is sure to recover. Every evening Frank brings sadder news. Russell is feeling worse. He is so nervous. The doctor has ordered the nurses to wear slippers. The doors in the ward have been lined with cotton to deaden the noise of slamming. But even the sight of a moving figure throws Russell into convulsions. There is no hope, Frank reports. Decomposition has already set in. The boy is in terrible agony. He is constantly crying with pain and calling for me. Distraught with anxiety and yearning to see my sick friend, I resolve upon a way to visit the hospital. In the morning, as the guard hands me the bread ration and shuts my cell, I slip my hand between the sill and the door. With an involuntary cry, I withdraw my maimed and bleeding fingers. The overseer conducts me to the dispensary. By tacit permission of the friendly medicine boy, I pass to the second floor, where the wards are located, and quickly steal to Russell's bedside. The look of mute joy on the agonized face subdues the excruciating pain in my hand. Oh, dear Alec, he whispers. I'm so glad they let you come. I'll get well if you'll nurse me. The shadow of death is in his eyes. The body exudes decomposition. Bereft of speech, I gently press his white, emaciated hand. The weary eyes close, and the boy falls into slumber. Silently, I touch his dry lips and steal away. In the afternoon, I appeal to the warden to permit me to nurse my friend. It is the boy's dying wish. It will ease his last hours. The captain refers me to the inspectors, but Mr. Reed informs me that it would be subversive of discipline to grant my request. Thereupon I ask permission to arrange a collection among the prisoners. Russell firmly believes that he would improve in an outside hospital, and the pardon board might grant the petition. Friendless prisoners are often allowed to circulate subscription lists among the inmates, and two years previously I had collected $123 for the pardon of a lifetimer. 
but the warden curtly refuses my plea, remarking that it is dangerous to permit me to associate with the men. I suggest a chaplain for the mission, or some prisoner selected by the authorities, but this offer is also vetoed, the warden berating me for having taken advantage of my presence in the dispensary to see Russell clandestinely and threatening to punish me with the dungeon. I plead with him for permission to visit the sick boy, who is hungry for a friendly presence and constantly calling for me. Apparently touched by my emotion, the captain yields. He will permit me to visit Russell, he informs me, on condition that a guard be present at the meeting. For a moment I hesitate. The desire to see my friend struggles against the fear of irritating him by the sight of the hated uniform. But I cannot expose the dying youth to this indignity and pain. Angered by my refusal, perhaps disappointed in the hope of learning the secret of the tunnel from the visit, the warden forbids me hereafter to enter the hospital. Late at night, Frank appears at my cell. He looks very grave as he whispers, Alec, you must bear up. Russell? Yes, Alec. Worse, tell me, Frank. He is dead. Bear up, Alec. His last thought was of you. He was unconscious all afternoon, but just before the end, it was 9.33. He sat up in bed so suddenly he frightened me. His arm shot out, and he cried. Goodbye, Alec. End of section 47. Recording by Lynn Jarrow. Section 48 of Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phyllis Vincelli. Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman. Part 2. Chapter 41. The Shock at Buffalo. 1. July 10th, 1901. Dear girl, this is from the hospital, Sub Rosa, just out of the straitjacket after eight days. For over a year, I was in the strictest solitary. For a long time, mail and reading matter were denied me. I have no words to describe the horror of the last months. I have passed through a great crisis. Two of my best friends died in a frightful manner. The death of Russell especially affected me. He was very young, and my dearest and most devoted friend, and he died a terrible death. The doctor charged the boy with shamming, but now he says it was spinal meningitis. I cannot tell you the awful truth. It was nothing short of murder, and my poor friend rotted away by inches. When he died, they found his back one mass of bed sores. If you could read the pitiful letters he wrote, begging to see me and to be nursed by me. But the warden wouldn't permit it. In some manner his agony seemed to affect me, and I began to experience the pains and symptoms that Russell described in his notes. I knew it was my sick fancy. I strove against it, but presently my legs showed signs of paralysis, and I suffered excruciating pain in the spinal column, just like Russell. I was afraid that I would be done to death like my poor friend. I grew suspicious of every guard and would barely touch the food for fear of its being poisoned. My head was working, they said, and all the time I knew it was my diseased imagination, and I was in terror of going mad. 
I tried so hard to fight it, but it would always creep up and get hold of me stronger and stronger. Another week of solitary would have killed me. I was on the verge of suicide. I demanded to be relieved from the cell, and the warden ordered me punished. I was put in the straitjacket. They bound my body in canvas, strapped my arms to the bed, and chained my feet to the posts. I was kept that way eight days, unable to move, rotting in my own excrement. Released prisoners called the attention of our new inspector to my case. He refused to believe that such things were being done in the penitentiary. Reports spread that I was going blind and insane. Then the inspector visited the hospital and had me released from the jacket. I'm in pretty bad shape, but they put me in the general ward now, and I'm glad of the chance to send you this note. Sasha. 2. Direct to Box A7, Allegheny City, Pennsylvania, July 25th, 1901. Dear Sonia, I cannot tell you how happy I am to be allowed to write to you again. My privileges have been restored by our new inspector, a very kindly man. He has relieved me from the cell, and now I am again on the range. The inspector requested me to deny to my friends the reports which have recently appeared in the papers concerning my condition. I have not been well of late, but now I hope to improve. My eyes are very poor. The inspector has given me permission to have a specialist examine them. Please arrange for it through our local comrades. There is another piece of very good news, dear friend. A new commutation law has been passed, which reduces my sentence by two and a half years. It still leaves me a long time, of course, almost four years here and another year to the workhouse. However, it is a considerable gain, and if I should not get into solitary again, I may, I am almost afraid to utter the thought, I may live to come out. I feel as if I'm being resurrected. The new law benefits the short-timers proportionately much more than the men with longer sentences. Only the poor lifers do not share in it. We were very anxious for a while, as there were many rumors that the law would be declared unconstitutional. Fortunately, the attempt to nullify its benefits proved ineffectual. Think of men who will see something unconstitutional in allowing the prisoners a little more good time than the commutation statute of forty years ago. As if a little kindness to the unfortunates, really justice, is incompatible with the spirit of Jefferson. We were greatly worried over the fate of this statute, but at last the first batch has been released, and there is much rejoicing over it. There is a peculiar history about this new law which may interest you. It sheds a significant sidelight. It was especially designed for the benefit of a high federal officer who was recently convicted of aiding two wealthy Philadelphia tobacco manufacturers to defraud the government of a few million by using counterfeit tax stamps. Their influence secured the introduction of the commutation bill and its hasty passage. The law would have cut their sentences almost in two, but certain newspapers seemed to have taken offense at having been kept in ignorance of the deal, and protests began to be voiced. The matter finally came up before the Attorney General of the United States, who decided that the men in whose special interest the law was engineered could not benefit by it because a state law does not affect U.S. prisoners, the latter being subject to the Federal Commutation Act. Imagine the discomfiture of the politicians. An attempt was even made to suspend the operation of the statute. Fortunately, it failed. 
and now the common state prisoners, who were not at all meant to profit, are being released. The legislature has unwittingly given some unfortunates here much happiness. I was interrupted in this writing by being called out for a visit. I could hardly credit it. The first comrade I have been allowed to see in nine years. It was Harry Gordon, and I was so overcome by the sight of the dear friend I could barely speak. He must have prevailed upon the new inspector to issue a permit. The latter is now acting warden, owing to the serious illness of Captain Wright. Perhaps he will allow me to see my sister. Will you kindly communicate with her at once? Meantime, I shall try to secure a pass, with renewed hope, and always with green memory of you, Alex. 3. Sabrosa, December 20th, 1901. Dearest girl, I know how your visit and my strange behavior have affected you. The sight of your face after all these years completely unnerved me. I could not think, I could not speak. It was as if all my dreams of freedom, the whole world of the living, were concentrated in the shiny little trinket that was dangling from your watch chain. I couldn't take my eyes off of it. I couldn't keep my hand from playing with it. It absorbed my whole being, and all the time I felt how nervous you were at my silence, and I couldn't utter a word. Perhaps it would have been better for us not to have seen each other under the present conditions. It was lucky they did not recognize you. They took you for my sister, though I believe your identity was suspected after you had left. You would surely not have been permitted the visit had the old warden been here. He was ill at the time. He never got over the shock of the tunnel, and finally he has been persuaded by the prison physician, who has secret aspirations to the wardenship, that the anxieties of his position are a menace to his advanced age. Considerable dissatisfaction has also developed of late against the warden among the inspectors. Well, he has resigned at last, thank goodness. The prisoners have been praying for it for years, and some of the boys on the range celebrated the event by getting drunk on wood alcohol. The new warden has just assumed charge, and we hope for improvement. He is a physician by profession, with the title of major in the Pennsylvania militia. It was entirely uncalled for on the part of the officious friend, whoever he may have been, to cause you unnecessary worry over my health and my renewed persecution. You remember that in July the new inspector released me from the straitjacket and assigned me to work on the range, but I was locked up again in October after the McKinley incident. The president of the board of inspectors was at the time in New York. He inquired by wire what I was doing. Upon being informed that I was working on the range, he ordered me into solitary. The new warden, on assuming office, sent for me. They give you a bad reputation, he said, but I will let you out of the cell if you'll promise to do what is right by me. He spoke brusquely, in the manner of a man closing a business deal, with the power of dictating terms. He reminded me of Bismarck at Versailles. Yet he did not seem unkind. The thought of escape was probably in his mind. But the new law has germinated the hope of survival. My weakened condition and the unexpected shortening of my sentence have at last decided me to abandon the idea of escape. I therefore replied to the warden, I will do what is right by you if you treat me right. Thereupon he assigned me to work on the range. It is almost like liberty to have the freedom of the cell house after the close solitary. And you, dear friend, 
In your letters I feel how terribly torn you are by the events of the recent months. I lived in great fear for your safety, and I can barely credit the good news that you are at liberty. It seems almost a miracle. I followed the newspapers with great anxiety. The whole country seemed to be swept with the fury of revenge. To a considerable extent, the press fanned the fires of persecution. Here in the prison, very little sincere grief was manifested. Out of hearing of the guards, the men passed very uncomplimentary remarks about the dead president. The average prisoner corresponds to the average citizen. Their patriotism is very passive, except when stimulated by personal interest or artificially excited. But if the press mirrored the sentiment of the people, the nation must have suddenly relapsed into cannibalism. There were moments when I was in mortal dread for your very life and for the safety of the other arrested comrades. In previous letters, you hinted that it was official rivalry and jealousy and your absence from New York to which you owe your release. You may be right, yet I believe that your attitude of proud self-respect and your admirable self-control contributed much to the result. You were splendid, dear, and I was especially moved by your remark that you would faithfully nurse the wounded man if he required your services, but the poor boy, condemned and deserted by all, needed and deserved your sympathy and aid more than the president. More strikingly than your letters, that remark discovered to me the great change wrought in us by the ripening years. Yes, in us, in both, for my heart echoed your beautiful sentiment. How impossible such a thought would have been to us in the days of a decade ago. We should have considered it treason to the spirit of revolution. It would have outraged all our traditions even to admit the humanity of an official representative of capitalism. Is it not very significant that we too, you living in the very heart of anarchist thought and activity, and I in the atmosphere of absolute suppression and solitude, should have arrived at the same evolutionary point after a decade of divergent paths? You have alluded, in a recent letter, to the ennobling and broadening influence of sorrow. Yet not upon every one does it exert a similar effect. Some natures grow embittered and shrink with the poison of misery. I often wonder at my lack of bitterness and enmity, even against the old warden, and surely I have good cause to hate him. Is it because of greater maturity? I rather think it is temperamentally conditioned. The love of the people the hatred of oppression of our younger days, vital as these sentiments were with us, were mental rather than emotional. Fortunately so, I think. For those like Feja and Louis and Pauline and numerous others soon have their emotionally inflated idealism punctured on the thorny path of the social Protestant only aspirations that spontaneously leap from the depths of our soul persist in the face of antagonistic forces the revolutionist is born beneath our love and hatred of former days lay inherent rebellion and the passionate desire for liberty and life in the long years of isolation i have looked deeply into my heart with open mind and sincere purpose, I have revised every emotion and every thought. Away from my former atmosphere and the disturbing influence of the world's turmoil, I have divested myself of all traditions and accepted beliefs. I have studied the sciences and the humanities, contemplated life, and pondered over human destiny. For weeks and months I would be absorbed in the domain of pure reason, or discuss with Leibniz the question of free will, 
and seek to penetrate beyond Spencer and to the unknowable. Political science and economics, law and criminology, I studied them with unprejudiced mind and sought to slacken my soul's thirst by delving deeply into religion and theology, seeking the key to life at the feet of Mrs. Eddy expectantly listening for the voice of disembodied, studying Korshanity and theosophy, absorbing the prana of knowledge and power, and concentrating upon the wisdom of the yogi. And after years of contemplation and study, chastened by much sorrow and suffering, I arise from the broken fetters of the world's folly and illusions, to behold the threshold of a new life of liberty and equality. My youth's ideal of a free humanity in the vague future has become clarified and crystallized into the living truth of anarchy as the sustaining elemental force of my everyday existence. Often I have wondered in the years gone by, was not wisdom dear at the price of enthusiasm? At thirty, one is not so reckless, not so fanatical and one-sided as at twenty. With maturity, we become more universal, but life is a Shylock that cannot be cheated of his due. For every lesson it teaches us, we have a wound or a scar to show. We grow broader, but too often the heart contracts as the mind expands and the fires are burning down while we are learning. At such moments, my mind would revert to the days when the momentarily expected approach of the social revolution absorbed our exclusive interest. The raging present and its conflicting currents passed us by, while our eyes were riveted upon the dawn in thrilling expectancy of the sunrise. Life and its manifold expressions were vexatious to the spirit of revolt, and poetry, literature, and art were scorned as hindrances to progress unless they sounded the toxin of immediate revolution. Humanity was sharply divided in two warring camps, the noble people, the producers, who yearned for the light of the new gospel, and the hated oppressors the exploiters, who craftily strove to obscure the rising day that was to give back to man his heritage. If only the good people were given an opportunity to hear the great truth, how joyfully they would embrace anarchy and walk in triumph into the promised land. The splendid naivete of the days that resented as a personal reflection the least misgivings of the future the enthusiasm that discounted the power of inherent prejudice and predilection. Magnificent was the day of hearts on fire with the hatred of oppression and the love of liberty. Woe, indeed, to the man or the people whose soul never warmed with the spark of Prometheus, for it is youth that has climbed the heights, but maturity has clarified the way and the stupendous task of human regeneration will be accomplished only by the purified vision of hearts that grow not cold. And you, my dear friend, with the deeper insight of time, you have yet happily kept your heart young. I have rejoiced at it in your letters of recent years, and it is especially evident from the sentiments you have expressed regarding the happening at Buffalo. I share your view entirely. For that very reason, it is the more distressing to disagree with you in one very important particular, the value of Leon's act. I know the terrible ordeal you have passed through, the fiendish persecution to which you have been subjected. Worse than all must have been to you the general lack of understanding for such phenomena, and sadder yet, the despicable attitude of some would-be radicals in denouncing the man and his act. But I am confident 
that you will not mistake my expressed disagreement for condemnation. We need not discuss the phase of attentat, which manifested the rebellion of a tortured soul, the individual protest against social wrong. Such phenomena are the natural result of evil conditions, as inevitable as the flooding of the river banks by the swelling mountain torrents. But I cannot agree with you regarding the social value of Leon's act. I have read of the beautiful personality of the youth, of his inability to adapt himself to brutal conditions, and the rebellion of his soul. It throws a significant light onto the causes of the attentat. Indeed, it is at once the greatest tragedy of martyrdom and the most terrible indictment of society that it forces the noblest men and women to shed human blood though their souls shrink from it. But the more imperative it is that drastic methods of this character be resorted to only as a last extremity. To prove a value, they must be motivated by social rather than individual necessity, and be directed against a real and immediate enemy of the people. The significance of such a deed is understood by the popular mind, and in that alone is the propagandistic educational importance of the attentat, except if it is exclusively an act of terrorism. Now, I do not believe that this deed was terroristic, and I doubt whether it was educational, because the social necessity for its performance was not manifest. That you may not misunderstand, I repeat, as an expression of personal revolt, it was inevitable, and in itself an indictment of existing conditions. But the background of social necessity was lacking, and therefore the value of the act was to a great extent nullified. In Russia, where political oppression is popularly felt, such a deed would be of great value. But the scheme of political subjection is more subtle in America, and though McKinley was the chief representative of our modern slavery, he could not be considered in the light of a direct and immediate enemy of the people. While in an absolutism the autocrat is visible and tangible, the real despotism of republican institutions is far deeper, more insidious, because it rests on the popular delusion of self-government and independence. That is the subtle source of democratic tyranny, and as such, it cannot be reached with a bullet. In modern capitalism, exploitation rather than oppression is the real enemy of the people. Oppression is but its handmaid, Hence the battle is to be waged in the economic rather than the political field. It is therefore that I regard my own act as far more significant and educational than Leon's. It was directed against a tangible, real oppressor, visualized as such by the people. As long as misery and tyranny fill the world, social contrasts and consequent hatreds will persist, and the noblest of the race, our Cholgasis, burst forth in rockets of iron. But does this lightning really illumine the social horizon, or merely confuse minds with the succeeding darkness? The struggle of labor against capital is a class war, essentially and chiefly economic. In that arena the battles must be fought. It was not these considerations, of course, that inspired the nationwide manhunt, or the attitude even of alleged radicals. Their cowardice has filled me with loathing and sadness. The brutal farce of the trial, the hypocrisy of the whole proceeding, the thirst for the blood of the martyr, these make one almost despair of humanity. I must close. The friend to smuggle out this letter will be uneasy about its bulk. Send me sign of receipt, 
and I hope that you may be permitted a little rest and peace to recover from the nightmare of the last months. Sasha End of Section 48《Section 49 of Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phyllis Vincelli — Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman — Part 2 — Chapter 42 Marred Lives 1. The discussion with the girl is a source of much mortification. Harassed on every side, persecuted by the authorities, and hounded even into the street, my friend, in her hour of bitterness, confounds my appreciative disagreement with the denunciation of stupidity and inertia. I realize the inadequacy of the written word, and despair at the hopelessness of human understanding, as I vainly seek to elucidate the meaning of the buffalo tragedy to friendly guards and prisoners. Continued correspondence with the girl accentuates the divergence of our views, painfully discovering the fundamental difference of attitude underlying even common conclusions. By degrees, the stress of activities reacts upon my friend's correspondence. Our discussion lags and soon ceases entirely. The world of the outside, temporarily brought closer, again recedes and the urgency of the immediate absorbs me in the life of the prison. 2. A spirit of hopefulness breathes in the cell house. The new commutation law is bringing liberty appreciably nearer. In the shops and yard, the men excitedly discuss the increased good time, and prisoners flit about with paper and pencil, seeking a tutored friend to figure out their time of release. Even the solitaries on the verge of despair and the long-timers facing a vista of cheerless years are instilled with new courage and hope. The tenor of conversation is altered. With the appointment of the new warden, the constant grumbling over the food has ceased. Pleasant surprise is manifest at the welcome change in the grub. I wonder at the tolerant silence regarding the disappointing Christmas dinner. The men impatiently frown down the occasional kicker. The warden is green, they argue. He did not know that we are supposed to get currant bread for the holidays. He will do better. Just give him a chance to. The improvement in the daily meals is enlarged upon, and the men thrill with amazed expectancy at the incredible report, oysters for New Year's dinner. With gratification, we hear the major's expression of disgust at the filthy condition of the prison, his condemnation of the basket cell and dungeon as barbarous, and the promise of radical reforms. As an earnest of his regime, he has released from solitary the men whom Warden Wright had punished for having served as witnesses in the defense of Murphy and Mong. Greedy for the large reward, Hopkins and his stools had accused the two men of a mysterious murder committed in Elk City several years previously. The criminal trial involving the suicide of an officer whom the warden had forced to testify against the defendants, resulted in the acquittal of the prisoners, whereupon Captain Wright ordered the convict witnesses for the defense to be punished. Footnote. Officer Robert G. Hunter, who committed suicide August thirtieth, 1901, 
in Clarion, Pennsylvania, where the trial took place. He left a written confession, in which he accused Warden E. S. Wright of forcing him to testify against men whom he knew to be innocent. End footnote. The new warden, himself a physician, introduces hygienic rules, abolishes the holy stoning of the cell-house floor because of the detrimental effect of the dust, and decides to separate the consumptive and syphilitic prisoners from the comparatively healthy ones. Footnote. The process of whitening stone floors by pulverizing sand into their surfaces. End footnote. Upon examination, 40% of the population are discovered in various stages of tuberculosis and 20% insane. The death rate from consumption is found to range between 25 and 60%. At light tasks in the block and the yard, the major finds employment for the sickly inmates. Special gangs are assigned to keeping the prison clean the rest of the men at work in the shop. With the exception of a number of dangerously insane who are to be committed to an asylum, every prisoner in the institution is at work, and the vexed problem of idleness resulting from the anti-convict labor law is thus solved. The change of diet, better hygiene, and the abolition of the dungeon produce a noticeable improvement in the life of the prison. The gloom of the cell house perceptibly lifts, and presently the men are surprised at music hour, between six and seven in the evening, with the strains of merry ragtime by the newly organized penitentiary band. 3. New faces greet me on the range but many old friends are missing. Billy Ryan is dead of consumption. Frenchy and Ben have become insane. Little Matt, the Duquesne striker, committed suicide. In sad remembrance I think of them, grown close and dear in the years of mutual suffering. Some of the old-timers have survived, but broken in spirit and health. Praying Andy is still in the block, his mind clouded, his lips constantly moving in prayer. Me innocent, the old man reiterates. God, him no. Last month the board has again refused to pardon the lifetimer. Now he is bereft of hope. Me have me no more money. My children, they save and save and bring me for pardon, and now no more money. Alec Kalane has also been refused by the board at the same session. He is the oldest man in the prison, in point of service, and the most popular lifer. His innocence of murder is one of the traditions of Riverside. In the boat he had rented to a party of picnickers, a woman was found dead, no clue could be discovered, and Alec was sentenced to life because he could not be forced to divulge the names of the men who had hired his boat. He pauses to tell me the sad news. The authorities have opposed his pardon, demanding that he furnish the information desired by them. He looks seer with confinement, his eyes full of mute sadness that can find no words. His face is deeply seamed, his features grave, almost immobile. In the long years of our friendship, I have never seen Alec laugh. Once or twice he smiled, and his whole being seemed radiant with rare sweetness. He speaks abruptly, with a perceptible effort. Yes, Alex, he is saying. It's true. They refused me. But they pardoned Mac, I retort hotly. He confessed to a cold-blooded murder, and he's only been in four years. Good luck, he remarks. How good luck? 
Mac's father accidentally struck oil on his farm. Well, what of it? Three hundred barrels a day. Rich. Got his son a pardon. But on what ground did they dismiss your application? They know you are innocent. District attorney came to me. You're innocent, we know. Tell us who did the murder. I had nothing to tell. Pardon refused. Is there any hope later on, Alec? When the present administration are all dead, perhaps. Slowly he passes on, at the approach of a guard. He walks weakly, with halting step. Old Sammy is back again, his limp heavier, shoulders bent lower. I'm here again, friend Alec, he smiles apologetically. What could I do? The old woman died, and my boys went off somewhere. The farm was sold that I was born in. His voice trembles with emotion. I couldn't find the boys, and no one wanted me, and wouldn't give me any work. Go to the pogey, they told me. Footnote. Poor house. And footnote. I couldn't, Alec. I've worked all me life. I don't want no charity. I made a bluff. He smiles between tears. Broken to his store, and here I am. With surprise, I recognize Tough Monk among the first-grade men. For years, he had been kept in stripes and constantly punished for bad work in the hosiery department. He was called the laziest man in prison. Not once in five years had he accomplished his task but the new warden transferred him to the construction shop where Monk was employed at his trade of blacksmith. I hate that damn sock making, he tells me. I've struck it right now, and the major says I'm the best worker in the shop. Wouldn't believe it, eh, would ya? Major promised me a ten spot for the fancy iron work I did for them electric posts in the yard. Says it's artistic, see? That's me all right. It's work I like. I won't lose any time either. Warden says old Sandy was a fool for making me knit socks with them big paws of mine. The major's all right, all right. With a glow of pleasure, I meet smiling Al, my colored friend from the jail. The good-natured boy looks old and infirm. His kindness has involved him in much trouble. He has been repeatedly punished for shouldering the faults of others, and now the inspectors have informed him that he is to lose the greater part of his commutation time. He has grown wan with worry over the uncertainty of release. Every morning is tense with expectation. Might be I goes today, Alec, he hopefully smiles as I pause at his cell. But the weeks pass. The suspense is torturing the young Negro, and he is visibly failing day by day. A familiar voice greets me. Hello, Burke. Ain't you glad to see an old pal? Big Dave beams on me with his cheerful smile. No, Davy. I hoped you wouldn't come back. He becomes very grave. Yes, I swore I'd swing sooner than come back. Didn't get a chance, you see, he explains, his tone full of bitterness. I goes to work and gets a job, and good job too, and I keeps way from the booze and me pals. But the damn bulls was after me, got me sacked from me job three times, and then I knocked one of them on the head. Damn his soul to hell, wished I'd killed him. Old offender, they says to the judge and he soaks me for a seventh spot. I was a sucker all right for trying to be straight. Four. In the large cage at the center of the block, the men employed about the cell house congregate in their idle moments. The shadows steal silently in and out of the enclosure, watchful of the approach of a guard. Within sounds the hum of subdued conversation, the men lounging about the sawdust barrel, 
absorbed in Snakes Wilson's recital of his protracted struggle with old Sandy. He relates vividly his persistent waking at night, violent stamping on the floor, cries of murder, I see snakes. With admiring glances, the young prisoners hang upon the lips of the old criminal, whose perseverance in shamming finally forced the former warden to assign snakes a special room in the hospital, where his snake-seeing propensities would become dormant, to suffer again violent awakening the moment he would be transferred to a cell. For ten years the struggle continued, involving numerous clubbings, the dungeon, and the straitjacket, till the warden yielded and Snakes was permanently established in the comparative freedom of the special room. Little groups stand about the cage, boisterous with the wit of the four-eyed Yeg, who styles himself Bill Nye, or excitedly discussing the intricacies of the commutation law, the chances of Pittsburgh winning the baseball pennant the following season and next Sunday's dinner. With much animation, the rumored resignation of the deputy Warren is discussed. The major is gradually weeding out the old gang, it is gossiped. A colonel of the militia is to secure the position of assistant to the warden. This source of conversation is inexhaustible, every detail of local life serving for endless discussion and heated debate. But at the lookout's whimpered warning of an approaching guard, the circle breaks up, each man pretending to be busy dusting and cleaning. Officer Mitchell passes by. With short legs wide apart, he stands surveying the assembled idlers from beneath his fierce-looking eyebrows. Quiet as me grandmother at church, ain't ye? All of a sudden, too. And mighty busy, every damn one of you. You snakes there. What business you got there, eh? I've just come in for a broom. You old reprobate, you. I saw you sneaking there an hour ago, and you've been chawing the rag to beat the band. Think this is a bar room, do you? Get to your cells, all of you. He trudges slowly away, mumbling, You loafers, when I catch you here again, don't you dare talk so loud. One by one, the men steal back into the cage, jokingly teasing each other upon their happy escape. Presently, several rangemen join the group. Conversation becomes animated. Voices are raised in dispute. But anger subsides, and a hush falls upon the men as blind Charlie gropes his way along the wall. Bill Nye reaches for his hand and leads him to a seat on the barrel. Feeling better today, Charlie? he asks gently. Yes, I think a little better, the blind man says in an uncertain, hesitating manner. His face wears a bewildered expression, as if he has not yet become resigned to his great misfortune. It happened only a few months ago. In company with two friends, considerably the worse for liquor, he was passing a house on the outskirts of Allegheny. It was growing dark, and they wanted a drink. Charlie knocked at the door. A head appeared at an upper window. Robbers! Someone suddenly cried. There was a flash. With a cry of pain, Charlie caught at his eyes. He staggered, then turned round and round, helpless in a daze. He couldn't see his companions. The house and the street disappeared, and all was utter darkness. The ground seemed to give beneath his feet, and Charlie fell down upon his face, moaning and calling to his friends. But they had fled in terror, and he was alone in the darkness, alone and blind. I'm glad you're feeling better, Charlie, Bill Nye says kindly. How are your eyes? I think a bit better, 
The gunshot had severed the optic nerves in both eyes. His sight is destroyed forever. But with the incomplete realization of sudden calamity, Charlie believes his eyesight only temporarily injured. Billy, he says presently, when I woke this morning, it, it didn't seem so dark. It, it was like a film over my eyes. Perhaps it may get better yet. His voice quivers with the expectancy of having his hope confirmed. Ah, what you're kidding yourself for, Snakes interposes. Shut up, you big stiff, Bill flares up, grabbing Snakes by the throat. Charlie, he adds, I once got paralyzed in my left eye. It looked just like yours now, and I felt as if there was a film on it. Do you see things like in a fog, Charlie? Yes, yes, j just like that. Well, that's the way it was with me. But little by little, things got to be lighter, and now the eye's as good as ever. Is that right, Billy? Charlie inquires anxiously. What did you do? Well, the doc put things in my eye. The croaker here is giving you some applications, ain't he? Yes, but he says it's for the inflammation. That's right. That's what the doctors told me. You just take it easy, Charlie. Don't worry. You'll come out all right. See if you don't. Bill reddens guiltily at the unintended expression, but quickly holds up a warning finger to silence the giggling snowball kid. Then, with sudden vehemence, he exclaims, By God, Charlie, if I ever meet that judge of yours on a dark night, I'll choke him with these here hands, so help me. It's a damn shame to send you here in this condition. You should have gone to a hospital. That's what I say. But cheer up, old boy. You won't have to serve your three years. You can bet on that. We'll all club together to get your case up for a pardon, won't we, boys? With unwanted energy, the old yegg makes the rounds of the cage, taking pledges of contributions. Dr. George appears around the corner, industriously polishing the brasswork, and Bill appeals to him to corroborate his diagnosis of the blind man's condition. A smile of timid joy suffuses the sightless face as Bill Nye slaps him on the shoulder, crying jovially, "'What did I tell you, eh? You'll be okay soon, and meantime keep your mind busy.' how to avenge the injustice done you. And with a violent wink in the direction of snakes, the yegg launches upon a reminiscence of his youth. As far as he can remember, he relates, the spirit of vengeance was strong within him. He has always religiously revenged any wrong he was made to suffer, but the incident that afforded him the greatest joy was an experience of his boyhood. He was fifteen then, and living with his widowed mother and three elder sisters in a small country place. One evening, as the family gathered in the large sitting room, his sister Mary said something which deeply offended him. In great rage, he left the house. Just as he was crossing the street, he was met by a tall, well-dressed gentleman, evidently a stranger in the town. The man guardedly inquired whether the boy could direct him to some address where one might pass the evening pleasantly. Quick as a flash, a brilliant idea struck me, Bill narrates, warming to his story. Never sure to them, anyhow, he remarks parenthetically. But here was my revenge. You mean a whorehouse, don't you? I ask the fellow. Yes. That's what was wanted, my man says. Why, says I to him, kind of suddenly, see the house right there across the street? That's the place you want. And I point out to him the house where the old lady and my three sisters are all sitting around the table, expectant-like, waiting for me, you know. Well, the man gives me a quarter, and up he goes, knocks on the door, and steps right in. 
I hide in a dark corner to see what's coming, you know, and sure enough, presently the door opens with a bang and something comes out with a rush and falls on the veranda, and mother, she's got a broom in her hand, and the girls, every blessed one of them, out with flat iron and dustpan and biff baff, they rain it upon that thing on the steps. I thought I'd split my sides laughing. By and by, I return to the house, and mother and sisters are kind of excited. And I says, innocent-like, what's up, girls? Well, you ought to hear them. Talk, did they? That beast of a man, the dirty thing that came to the house and insulted us with. They couldn't even mention the awful things he said. And Mary, that's the sis I got mad at, she cries, Oh, Billy, you're so big and strong. I wish you was here when that nasty old thing came up. The boys are hilarious over the story, and Dr. George motions me aside to talk over old times. With a hearty pressure, I greet my friend, whom I had not seen since the days of the first investigation. Suspected of complicity, he had been removed to the shops, and only recently returned to his former position in the block. His beautiful thick hair has grown thin and gray. He looks aged and worn. With sadness, I notice his tone of bitterness. They almost killed me, Alec, he says. If it wasn't for my wife, I'd murder that old warden. Throughout his long confinement, his wife had faithfully stood by him, her unfailing courage and devotion sustaining him in the hours of darkness and despair. The dear girl, he muses, I'd be dead if it wasn't for her. But his release is approaching. He has almost served the sentence of sixteen years for alleged complicity in the bank robbery at Leechburg, during which the cashier was killed. The other two men convicted of the crime had both died in prison. The doctor alone has survived, thanks to the dear girl, he repeats. But the six months at the workhouse fill him with apprehension. He has been informed that the place is a veritable inferno, even worse than the penitentiary. However, his wife is faithfully at work, trying to have the workhouse sentence suspended, and full liberty may be at hand. End of section 49《Section 50 of Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phyllis Vincelli — Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman — Part 2 — Chapter 43 Passing the Love of Woman The presence of my old friend is a source of much pleasure. George is an intelligent man. The long years of incarceration have not circumscribed his intellectual horizon. The approach of release is intensifying his interest in the life beyond the gates, and we pass the idle hours conversing over subjects of mutual interest discussing social theories and problems of the day he has a broad grasp of affairs but his temperament and catholic traditions are antagonistic to the ideas dear to me yet his attitude is free from personalities and narrow prejudice and our talks are conducted along scientific and philosophical lines the recent death of Liebknecht and the American lecture tour of Peter Kropotkin afford opportunity for the discussion of modern social questions. There are many subjects of mutual interest, and my friend 
whose great-grandfather was among the signers of the Declaration, waxes eloquent in denunciation of his country's policy of extermination in the Philippines and the growing imperialistic tendencies of the Republic. A Democrat of the Jeffersonian type, he is virulent against the old warden on account of his favoritism and discrimination. His prison experience, he informs me, has considerably altered the views of democracy he once entertained. Why, Alec, there is no justice, he says vehemently. No, not even in the best democracy. Ten years ago, I would have staked my life on the courts. Today, I know they are a failure. Our whole jurisprudence is wrong. You see, I've been here nine years. I have met and made friends with hundreds of criminals. Some were pretty desperate, and many of them scoundrels. But I have to meet one yet in whom I couldn't discover some good quality if he's scratched right. Look at that fellow there. He points to a young prisoner scrubbing an upper range. That's Johnny the Hunk. He's in for murder. Now, what did the judge and jury know about him? Just this. He was a hard-working boy in the mills. One Saturday, he attended a wedding with a chum of his. They were both drunk when they went out into the street. They were boisterous, and a policeman tried to arrest them. Johnny's chum resisted. The cop must have lost his head. He shot the fellow dead. It was right near Johnny's home, and he ran in and got a pistol and killed the policeman. Must have been crazy with drink. Well... They were going to hang him, but he was only a kid, hardly sixteen. They gave him fifteen years. Now he's all in. They've just ruined the boy's life. Now what kind of a boy is he, do you know? Guess what he did. It was only a few months ago. Some screw told him that the widow of the cop he shot is hard up. She has three children and takes in washing. You know what Johnny did? He went around among the cons got together fifty dollars on the fancy paperwork he is making. He's an artist at it. He sent the woman the money and begged her to forgive him. Is that true, doctor? Every word. I went to Milligan's office on some business, and the boy had just sent the money to the woman. The chaplain was so much moved by it, he told me the whole story. But wait, that isn't all. You know what that woman did? What? She wrote to Johnny that he was a dirty murderer and that if he ever goes up for a pardon, she will oppose it. She didn't want anything to do with him, she wrote, but she kept the money. How did Johnny take it? It's really wonderful about human nature. The boy cried over the letter and told the chaplain that he wouldn't write to her again. But every minute he can spare, he works on that fancy work and every month he sends her money. That's the criminal the judge sentenced to 15 years in this hell. My friend is firmly convinced that the law is entirely impotent to deal with our social ills. Why, look at the courts, he exclaims. They don't concern themselves with crime. They merely punish the criminal, absolutely indifferent to his antecedents and environment and the predisposing causes. But George, I rejoin, it is the economic system of exploitation, the dependence upon a master for your livelihood, want, and the fear of want, which are responsible for most crimes. Only partly so, Alec. If it wasn't for the corruption in our public life, and the commercial scourge that holds everything for sale, and the spirit of materialism which has cheapened human life, there would not be so much violence and crime even under what you call the capitalist system. At any rate, there's no doubt the law is an absolute failure in dealing with crime. The criminal belongs to the sphere of therapeutics. Give him to the doctor instead of the jailer. You mean, George, that the criminal is to be considered a product of anthropological and physical factors. But don't you see that you must also examine society? to determine to what extent social conditions are responsible for criminal actions? And if that were done, 
I believe most crimes would be found to be misdirected energy, misdirected because of false standards, wrong environment, and unenlightened self-interest. Well, I haven't given much thought to that phase of the question, but aside of social conditions, see what a bitch the penal institutions are making of it. For one thing, the promiscuous mingling of young and old, without regard to relative depravity and criminality, is converting prisons into veritable schools of crime and vice. The blackjack and the dungeon are surely not the proper means of reclamation, no matter what the social causes of crime. Restraint and penal methods can't reform. The very idea of punishment precludes betterment. True reformation can emanate only from voluntary impulse, inspired and cultivated by intelligent advice and kind treatment. But reformation, which is the result of fear, lacks the very essentials of its object, and will vanish like smoke the moment fear abates. And you know, Alec, the reformatories are even worse than the prisons. Look at the fellows here from the various reform schools. Why, it's a disgrace— the boys who come from the outside are decent fellows, but those kids from the reformatories, one-third of the cons here have graduated there. They're terrible. You can spot them by looking at them. They are worse than street prostitutes. My friend is very bitter against the prison element, variously known as the girls, sallies, and punks, who for gain traffic in sexual gratification but he takes a broad view of the moral aspect of homosexuality. His denunciation is against the commerce in carnal desires. As a medical man and a student, he is deeply interested in the manifestation of suppressed sex. He speaks with profound sympathy of the brilliant English man of letters whom the world of cant and stupidity has driven into prison and to death because his sex life did not conform to the accepted standards. In detail, my friend traces the various phases of his psychic development since his imprisonment, and I warm toward him with a sense of intense humanity as he reveals the intimate emotions of his being. A general medical practitioner, he has not come in personal contact with cases of homosexuality. He had heard of pederasty, but like the majority of his colleagues, he had neither understanding for nor sympathy with the sex practices he considered abnormal and vicious. In prison, he was horrified at the perversion that frequently came under his observation. For two years, the very thought of such matters filled him with disgust. He even refused to speak to the men and boys known to be homosexual, unconditionally condemning them. With my prejudices rather than my reason, he remarks. But the forces of suppression were at work. Now, this is in confidence, Alec, he cautions me. I know you will understand. Probably you yourself have experienced the same thing. I'm glad I can talk to someone about it. The other fellows here wouldn't understand it. it. Makes me sick to see how they all grow indignant over a fellow who is caught. And the officers, too. Oh, you know as well as I that quite a number of them are addicted to these practices. Well, I'll tell you. I suppose it's the same story with everyone here, especially the long-timers. I was terribly dejected and hopeless when I came. Sixteen years. I didn't believe for a moment I could live through it. I was abusing myself pretty badly. Still, after a while, when I got work and began to take an interest in this life, I got over it. But as time went, the sex instinct awakened. I was young, about twenty-five, strong and healthy. Sometimes I thought I'd get crazy with passion. You remember when we were selling together on that upper range on R? You were in the stocking shop then, weren't you? Don't you remember? Of course I remember, George. You were in the cell next mine. We could see out on the river. It was in the summer. We could hear the excursion boats and the girls singing and dancing. That, too, 
helped to turn me back to onanism. I really believe the whole blessed range used to indulge them. Think of the precious material fed to the fishes. He smiles. The privies, you know, empty into the river. Some geniuses may have been lost to the world in those orgies. Yes, orgies. That's just what they were. As a matter of fact, I don't believe there is a single man in the prison who doesn't abuse himself at one time or another. If there is, he's a mighty exception. I have known some men to masturbate four and five times a day. Kept it up for months, too. Yes, and they either get the con or go bugs. As a medical man, I think that self-abuse, if practiced no more frequently than ordinary coition, would be no more injurious than the latter. But it can't be done. It grows on you terribly. And the second stage is more dangerous than the first. What do you call the second? Well, the first is the dejection stage. Hopeless and despondent, you seek forgetfulness in onanism. You don't care what happens. It's what I might call mechanical self-abuse, not induced by actual sex desire. This stage passes with your dejection, as soon as you begin to take an interest in the new life, as all of us are forced to do before long. The second stage is the psychic and mental. It is not the result of dejection. With the gradual adaptation to the new conditions, a comparatively normal life begins, manifesting sexual desires. At this stage, your self-abuse is induced by actual need. It is the more dangerous phase because the frequency of the practice grows with the recurrent thought of home, your wife, or sweetheart. While the first was mechanical, giving no special pleasure, and resulting only in increasing lassitude, the second stage revolves about the charms of some loved woman or one desired and affords intense joy. Therein is its allurement and danger. And that's why the habit gains in strength. The more miserable the life, the more frequently you will fall back upon your sole source of pleasure. Many become helpless victims. I have noticed that prisoners of lower intelligence are the worst in this respect. I have had the same experience. The narrower your mental horizon, the more you dwell upon your personal troubles and wrongs. That is probably the reason why the more illiterate go insane with confinement. No doubt of it. You have had exceptional opportunities for observation of the solitaries and the new men. What did you notice, Alec? Well, in some respects, the existence of a prisoner is like the life of a factory worker. As a rule, men used to outdoor life suffer most from solitary. They are less able to adapt themselves to the close quarters, and the foul air quickly attacks their lungs. Besides, those who have no interests beyond their personal life soon become victims of insanity. I've always advised new men to interest themselves in some study or fancy work. It's their only salvation. If you yourself have survived, it's because you lived in your theories and ideals, I'm sure of it and I continued my medical studies and sought to absorb myself in scientific subjects. For a moment, George pauses. The veins of his forehead protrude, as if he is undergoing a severe mental struggle. Presently, he says, Alec, I'm going to speak very frankly to you. I'm much interested in the subject. I'll give you my intimate experiences, and I want you to be as frank with me. I think it's one of the most important things, and I want to learn all I can about it. Very little is known about it, and much less understood. About what, George? About homosexuality. I have spoken of the second phase of onanism. With a strong effort, I overcame it. Not entirely, of course, but I have succeeded in regulating the practice, indulging in it at certain intervals. But as the months and years passed, my emotions manifested themselves. It was like a psychic awakening. The desire to love something was strong upon me. 
Once I caught a little mouse in my cell and tamed it a bit. It would eat out of my hand and come around at meal times, and by and by it would stay all evening to play with me. I learned to love it. Honestly, Alec, I cried when it died. And then, for a long time, I felt as if there was a void in my heart. I wanted something to love. It just swept me with a wild craving for affection. Somehow the thought of women gradually faded from my mind. When I saw my wife, I was just like a dear friend. But I didn't feel for her sexually. One day, as I was passing in the hall, I noticed a young boy. He had been in only a short time, and he was rosy-cheeked with a smooth little face and sweet lips. He reminded me of a girl I used to court before I married. After that, I frequently surprised myself thinking of the lad. I felt no desire toward him except just to know him and get friendly. I became acquainted with him, and when he heard I was a medical man, he would often call to consult me about the stomach trouble he suffered. The doctor here persisted in giving the poor kid salts and physics all the time. Well, Alec... I could hardly believe it myself, but I grew so fond of the boy I was miserable when a day passed without my seeing him. I would take big chances to get near him. I was rangeman then, and he was assistant on a top tier. We often had opportunities to talk. I got him interested in literature and advised him what to read, for he didn't know what to do with his time. He had a fine character, that boy, and he was bright and intelligent. At first, it was only a liking for him, but it increased all the time till I couldn't think of any woman. But don't misunderstand me, Alec. It wasn't that I wanted a kid. I swear to you, the other youths had no attraction for me whatever. But this boy, his name was Floyd. He became so dear to me, I, I used to give him everything I could get. I had a friendly guard, and he'd bring me fruit and things. Sometimes I'd just die to eat it, but I always gave it to Floyd. And, Alec, you remember when I was down in the dungeon six days? Well, it was for the sake of that boy. He did something, and I took the blame on myself. And the last time, they kept me nine days chained up. I hit a fellow for abusing Floyd. He was small and couldn't defend himself. I did not realize it at the time, Alec, but I know now that I was simply in love with the boy, wildly, madly in love. It came very gradually. For two years I loved him without the least taint of sex desire. It was the purest affection I ever felt in my life. It was all absorbing, and I would have sacrificed my life for him if he asked it. But by degrees, the psychic stage began to manifest all the expressions of love between the opposite sexes. I remember the first time he kissed me. It was early in the morning. Only the rangemen were out, and I stole up to his cell to give him a delicacy. He put both hands between the bars and pressed his lips to mine. Alec, I tell you, never in my life had I experienced such bliss at that moment. It's five years ago, but it thrills me every time I think of it. It came suddenly. I didn't expect it. It was entirely spontaneous. Our eyes met, and it seemed as if something drew us together. He told me he was very fond of me. From then on, we became lovers. I used to neglect my work and risk great danger to get a chance to kiss and embrace him. I grew terribly jealous, too, though I had no cause. I passed through every phase of a passionate love. With this difference, though, I felt a touch of the old disgust at the thought of actual sex contact. That I didn't do. It seemed to me a desecration of the boy and of my love for him. But after a while, that feeling also wore off, and I desired sexual relation with him. He said he loved me enough to do even that for me, though he had never done it before. He hadn't been in any reformatory, you know, and yet, somehow, I couldn't bring myself to do it. I loved the lad too much for it. Perhaps you'll smile, Alec, but it was real, true love. 
when Floyd was unexpectedly transferred to the other block. I felt I would be the happiest man if only I could touch his hand again or get one more kiss. You, you're laughing, he asks abruptly, a touch of anxiety in his voice. No, George, I am grateful for your confidence. I think it's a wonderful thing. And George, I had felt the same horror and disgust at these things as you did, but now I think quite differently about them. Really, Alec, I'm glad you say so. Often I was troubled. Is it viciousness or what, I wondered. But I could never talk to anyone about it. They take everything here in such a filthy sense, yet I knew in my heart that it was a true, honest emotion. George, I think it a very beautiful emotion, just as beautiful as love for a woman. I had a friend here. His name was Russell. Perhaps you remember him. I felt no physical passion toward him, but I think I loved him with all my heart. His death was a most terrible shock to me. It almost drove me insane. Silently, George holds out his hand. End of Section 50《Section 51 of Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chuck Williamson — Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist — by Alexander Berkman — Part 2 — Chapter 44 — Loves — Daring. Castle on the Ohio, August 18th, 1902. My dear Careless, you know the saying, Der eine hat den Beutel, der andere das Geld? I find it a difficult problem to keep in touch with my correspondence. I have the leisure, but theirs is the advantage of the paper supply. Thus runs the world. But you, a most faithful correspondent, have been neglected a long while. Therefore, this unexpected sub rosa chance is for you. My dear boy, whatever your experiences since you left me, don't fashion your philosophy in the image of disappointment. All life is a multiplied pain. Its highest expressions, love and friendship, are sources of the most heartbreaking sorrow. That has been my experience, no doubt yours also. And you are aware that here, under prison conditions, the disappointments, the grief and anguish are so much more acute, more bitter and lasting. What then? Shall one seal his emotions or barricade his heart? Ah, if it were possible, it would be wiser, some claim. But remember, dear Carl, mere wisdom is a barren life. I think it a your horizon. The more absorbed you are in your immediate environment and dependent upon it, the sooner you decay. Morally and mentally, you can, in a measure, escape the sordidness of life only by living for something higher. Perhaps that is the secret of my survival. Wider interests have given me strength. In other phases there are. From your own experience, you know what sustaining satisfaction is found in prison in the constant fight for the feeling of human dignity because of the constant attempt to strangle your sense of self-respect. I have seen prisoners offer most desperate resistance in the defense of their manhood. On my part, it has been a continuous struggle. Do you remember the last time I was in the dungeon? It was on the occasion of Comrade Kropotkin's presence in this country. 
during his last lecture tour. The old warden was here then. He informed me that I would not be permitted to see our grand old man. I had a tilt with him, but I did not succeed in procuring a visiting card. A few days later, I received a letter from Peter. On the envelope under my name was marked Political Prisoner. The warden was furious. We have no political prisoners in a free country, he thundered, tearing up the envelope. But you have political grifters, I retorted. We argued the matter heatedly, and I demanded the envelope. The warden insisted that I apologize. Of course I refused, and I had to spend three days in the dungeon. There have been many changes since then. Your coming to Pittsburgh last year, and the threat to expose this place, they knew you had the facts, helped to bring matters to a point. They assigned me to a range, and I am still holding the position. The new warden is treating me more decently. He wants no trouble with me, he told me, but he has proved a great disappointment. He started in with promising reforms, but gradually he has fallen into the old ways. In some respects, his regime is even worse than the previous one. He has introduced a system of economy which barely affords us sufficient food. The dungeon and basket, which he had at first abolished, are in operation again, and the discipline is daily becoming more drastic. The result is more brutality and clubbings, more fights and cutting affairs, and general discontent. The new management cannot plead ignorance. For the last Fourth of July, the men gave a demonstration of the effects of humane treatment. The warden had assembled the inmates in the chapel, promising to let them pass the day in the yard on condition of good behavior. The inspectors and the old guards advised against it, arguing the great risk of such a proceeding. But the major decided to try the experiment. He put the men on their honor and turned them loose in the yard. He was not disappointed. The day passed beautifully, without the least mishap. There was not even a single report. We began to breathe easier, when, presently, the whole system was reversed. It was partly due to the influence of the old officers upon the warden, and the latter completely lost his head when a trustee made his escape from the hospital. It seemed to have terrorized the warden into abandoning all reforms. He has also been censured by the inspectors because of the reduced profits from the industries. Now the tasks have been increased, and even the sick and consumptives are forced to work. The labor bodies of the state have been protesting in vain. How miserably weak is the giant of toil! because unconscious of his strength. The men are groaning and wishing old Sandy back. In short, things are just as they were during your time. Men and wardens may come and go, but the system prevails. More and more, I am persuaded of the great truth. Given authority and the opportunity for exploitation, the results will be essentially the same, no matter what particular set of men or of principles happens to be in the saddle. Fortunately, I am on the home run. I am glad you felt that the failure of my application to the Supreme Court would not depress me. I built no castles upon it, yet I am glad it has been tried. It was well to demonstrate once more that neither lower courts, pardon boards, nor higher tribunals are interested in doing justice. My lawyers have such a strong case from the legal standpoint 
that the state pardon board resorted to every possible trick to avoid the presentation of it and now the supreme court thought it the better part of wisdom to ignore the arguments that i am being illegally detained they simply refused the application with a few meaningless phrases that entirely evade the question at issue well to hell with them i have two in a stump stump eleven months and i feel the courage of perseverance but i hope that the next legislature will not repeal the new commutation law there is considerable talk of it for the politicians are angry that their efforts on behalf of the wealthy u s grafters in the eastern penitentiary failed they begrudge the common prisoner the increased allowance of good time however i shall make it of course you understand that both french leave and dutch act are out of the question now i have decided to stay till i can walk through the gates in reference to french leave have you read about the biddle affair i think it was the most remarkable attempt in the history of the country think of the wife of the jail warden helping prisoners to escape the boys here were simply wild with joy everyone hoped they would make good their escape and old sammy told me he prayed they shouldn't be caught but all the bloodhounds of the law were unchained the biddle boys got no chance at all the story is this the brothers biddle jack and ed and walter dorman while in the act of robbing a store killed a man it was dorman who fired the shot but he turned state's evidence the state rewards treachery dorman escaped the noose but the two brothers were sentenced to die as is customary they were visited in the jail by the gospel ladies among them the wife of the warden you probably remember him sofal he was deputy warden when we were in jail and a rat he was too well ed was a good-looking man with soft manners and so forth mrs sofal fell in love with him it was mutual i believe now witness the heroism a woman is capable of when she loves mrs sofal determined to save the two brothers i understand they promised her to quit their criminal life every day she would visit the condemned men to console them pretending to read the gospel she would stand close to the doors to give them an opportunity to saw through the bars she supplied them with revolvers, and they agreed to escape together. Of course, she could not go back to her husband, for she loved Ed, loved him well enough never even to see her children again. The night for the escape was set. The brothers intended to separate immediately after the break, subsequently to meet together with Mrs. Sofal. But the latter insisted on going with them ed begged her not to he knew that it would be sheer suicide for all of them but she persisted and ed acquiesced fully realizing that it would prove fatal don't you think it showed a noble trait in the boy he did not want her to think that he was deserting her the escape from the jail was made successfully they even had a few hours start <sighs> but snow had fallen and it was easy to trace two men and a woman in a sleigh the brutality of the man hunters is past belief when the detectives came upon the boys they fired their winchesters into the two brothers even when the wounded were stretched on the ground bleeding and helpless a detective emptied his revolver into ed killing him jack died later and mrs sofal was placed in jail you 
can imagine the savage fury of the respectable mob. Mrs. Sofel was denounced by her husband, and all the good women cried unclean and clamored for the punishment of their unfortunate sister. She is now here, serving two years for aiding in the escape. I caught a glimpse of her when she came in. She has a sympathetic face that bears signs of deep suffering. She must have gone through a terrible ordeal. Think of the struggle before she decided upon the desperate step. Then the days and weeks of anxiety as the boys were sawing the bars and preparing for the last escape. I should appreciate the love of a woman whose affection is stronger than the iron fetters of convention. In some ways, this woman reminds me of the girl. The type that possesses the courage and strength to rise above all considerations for the sake of the man or the cause held dear. How little the world understands the vital forces of life. A. End of section 51. Section 52 of Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chuck Williamson. Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman. Part 2, Chapter 45, The Bloom of the Barren Staff, 1. It is September the 19th. The cell house is silent and gray in the afternoon dusk. In the yard, the rain walks with heavy strides, hastening whither the shadows have gone. I stand at the door in reverie. In the somber light, I see myself led through the gate yonder. It was ten years ago this day. The walls towered menacingly in the dark. The iron gripped my heart, and I was lost in despair. I should not have believed then that I could survive the long years of misery and pain. But the nimble feet of the rain patter hopefully, its tears dissipate the clouds and bring light. And soon I shall step into the sunshine and come forth, grown and matured, as the world must have grown in the struggle of suffering. Fresh fish, a range man announces, pointing to the long line of striped men, trudging dejectedly across the yard and stumbling against one another in the unaccustomed lockstep. The door opens, and Alec Colain, the lifetimer, motions to me. He walks with measured even step along the hall. Range man Cause and Harry, my young assistant, stealthily crowd with him into my cell. The air of mystery about them arouses my apprehension. What's the matter, boys? I ask. They hesitate and glance at each other, smiling diffidently. You speak, Colleen, Harry whispers. The lifetimer carefully unwraps a little package, and I become aware of the sweet scent of flowers perfuming the cell. The old prisoner stammers in confusion as he presents me with a rose, big and red. Oh, we uh, swiped it in the greenhouse, he says. For you, Alec, Harry adds. For your tenth anniversary, corrects Cause. Good luck to you, Alec. Mutely, they grip my hand and steal out of the cell. In solitude, I muse over the touching remembrance. These men, they are the shame society hides within the gray wall. 
walls. These and others like them, daily they come to be buried alive in this cell. All through the long years they have been coming, and the end is not yet. Robbed of joy and life, their being is discounted in the economy of existence. And all the while the world has been advancing, it is said. Science and philosophy, art and letters have made great strides. But wherein is the improvement that augments misery and crowds the prisons? The discovery of the X-ray will further scientific research, I am told. But where is the X-ray of social insight that will discover in human understanding and mutual aid the elements of true progress? Deceptive is the advance that involves the ruthless sacrifice of peace and health and life. Superficial and unstable the civilization that rests upon the treacherous sands of strife and warfare. The progress of science and industry, far from promoting man's happiness and social harmony, merely accentuates discontent and sharpens the contrasts. The knowledge gained at so much cost of suffering and sacrifice bears bitter fruit, for lack of wisdom to apply the lessons learned. There are no limits to the achievements of man, were not humanity divided against itself, exhausting its best energies in sanguinary conflict, suicidal and unnecessary. And these, the thousands stepmothered by cruel stupidity, are the victims castigated by society for her own folly and sins. There is young Harry, a child of the slums, he has never known the touch of a loving hand. Motherless, his father a drunkard, the heavy arm of the law was laid upon him at the age of ten. From reform school to reformatory, the social orphan has been driven about. You know, Alec, he says, I never had no real square meal to feel full, you know, except once on Christmas and a ref. At the age of nineteen, he has not seen a day of liberty since early childhood. Three years ago, he was transferred to the penitentiary, under a sentence of sixteen years for an attempted escape from the Morganza Reform School, which resulted in the death of a keeper. The latter was foreman in the tailor shop, in which Harry was employed together with a number of other youths. The officer had induced Harry to do overwork above the regular task, for which he rewarded the boy with an occasional dainty of buttered bread or a piece of corn cake. By degrees, Harry's voluntary effort became part of his routine work, and the reward and delicacies came more rarely. But when they entirely ceased, the boy rebelled refusing to exert himself above the required task. He was reported, but the superintendent censured the keeper for the unauthorized increase of work. Harry was elated, but presently began systematic persecution that made the boy's life daily more unbearable. In innumerable ways, the hostile guards sought to revenge his defeat upon the lad, till at last... Driven in desperation, Harry resolved upon escape. With several other inmates, the fourteen-year-old boy planned to flee to the Rocky Mountains, there to hunt the wild Indians and live the independent and carefree life of Jesse James. You know, Alec, Harry confides to me, reminiscently, you could have made it easy. There was eleven of us, but the kids was all sore on the foreman. He abused and beat us, and some of the boys wouldn't go, except we knocked a screw out first. It was me pal, Naki, that hit him foist, good and hard, and didn't I hit him lightly. But they all said in court that I hit him both times. Naki's people had money, and 
He beat the case, but I got soaked sixteen years. His eyes fill with tears, and he says plaintively, I haven't been outside since I was a little kid, and now I'm sick and will die here, maybe. Two. Conversing in low tones, we sweep the range. I shorten my strokes to enable Harry to keep pace. Weakly, he drags the broom across the floor. His appearance is pitifully grotesque. The sickly features, pale with the color of the prison whitewash, resemble a little child's. But the eyes look oldish in the wrinkled sockets, his head painfully out of proportion with the puny, stunted body. Now and again he turns his gaze on me, and in his face there is a melancholy wonder, as if he is seeking something that has passed him by. Often I ponder, is there a crime more appealing and heinous than the one society has committed upon him, who is neither man nor youth and never was child? Crushed by the heel of brutality, the plant had never budded. Yet there is the making of a true man in him. His mentality is pathetically primitive, but he possesses character and courage and latent virgin forces. His emotional frankness borders on the incredible. He is unmoral and unsocial, as a field daisy might be surrounded by giant trees, yet timidly tenacious of its own being. It distresses me to witness the yearning that comes into his eyes at the mention of the outside. Often chance, he reiterates, he'd be so careful not to get into trouble. He would like to keep company with a nice girl, he confides, blushingly. He had never had one. But he fears his days are numbered. His lungs are getting very bad. And now that his father has died, he has no one to help him get a pardon. Perhaps father wouldn't have helped him either. He was always drunk and never cared for his children. He had no business to have any children, Harry comments passionately. And he can't expect any assistance from his sister. The poor girl barely makes a living in the factory. She's been working ever so long in the pickle works, Harry explains. That fella, the boss there, must be rich. It's a big factory, he adds naively. He ought to give her enough to marry on. But he figures he will die in prison. There is no one to aid him, and he has no friends. I never had no friend, he says wistfully. There ain't no real friends. De older boys and de refs always used me, and they used all de kids. But they was no friends. And everyone was against me in the court, and they put all the blame on me. Everybody was always against me, he repeats bitterly. Alone in the cell, I ponder over his words. Everyone was always against me, I hear the boy say. I wake at night with a quivering cry in the darkness. Everybody against me, motherless in childhood reared in the fumes of brutal inebriation, cast into the slums to be crushed under the wheels of Law's juggernaut was the fate of this social orphan. Is this the fruit of progress? This the spirit of our Christian civilization? In the hours of solitude, the scheme of existence unfolds in kaleidoscope before me. In variegated design and divergent angle, it presents an endless panorama of stunted minds and tortured bodies, of universal misery and wretchedness in the elemental aspect of the boy's desolate life. And I beheld all the suffering and agony resolve themselves in the dominance of the established, in tradition and custom that heavily encrust humanity. 
weighing down the already fettered soul till its wings break and it beats helplessly against the artificial barriers the blanched face of misery is silhouetted against the night the silent sobs with the piteous cry of the crushed boy and i hear the cry and it fills my whole being with the sense of terrible wrong and injustice with the shame of my kind that sheds crocodile tears while it swallows its helpless prey the submerged moan in the dark i will echo their agony to the ears of the world i have suffered with them i have looked into the heart of pain and with its voice and anguish i will speak to humanity to wake it from sloth and apathy and lend hope to despair the month's speed in preparation for the great work i must equip myself for the mission for the combat with the world that struggles so desperately to defend its chains the day of my resurrection is approaching and i will devote my new life to the service of my fellow sufferers the world shall hear the tortured it shall behold the shame it has buried within these walls yet not eliminated the ghosts of its crime shall rise and harrow its ears till the social conscience is roused to the cry of its victims and perhaps with eyes once opened it will behold the misery and suffering in the world beyond and man will pause in his strife and mad race to ask himself wherefore whither end of section fifty two Section 53 of Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman. Part 2, Chapter 46. A Child's Heart Hunger with deep gratification i observed the unfoldment of harry's mind my friendship has wakened in him hope and interest in life merely to please me he smilingly reiterated he would apply himself to reading the mapped out course but as time passed he became absorbed in the studies developing a thirst for knowledge that is transforming his primitive intelligence into a mentality of great power and character Often I marvel at the peculiar strength and aspiration springing from the depths of a prison friendship. I do not believe in friendship, Alec, Harry says, as we ply our brooms in the day's work. But now I feel that I wouldn't be here if I had had then a real friend. It wasn't only that we suffer together, but you have made me feel that our minds can rise above these rules and bars. You know, the screws have warned me against you, and I was afraid of you. I didn't know how to put it, Alec. But the first time we had that long talk last year, I felt as if something walked right over from you to me. And since then, I have had something to live for. You know, I have seen so much of the priests. I have no use for the church, and I don't believe in immortality. But the idea I got from you clung to me it was so persistent i really think there is such a thing as immortality of an idea for an instant the old look of helpless wonder is in his face as if he is at a loss to master the thought he pauses in his work his eyes fastened on mine i got it alec he says an eager smile lighting up his pallid features you remember the story you told me about them fellers oh he quickly corrects himself when i get excited i drop into my former bad english well you know the story you told me of the prisoners in siberia how they escape sometimes and the peasants though forbidden to house them put food outside of their huts so that an escaped man may not starve to death you remember alec yes harry 
i'm glad you haven't forgotten it forgotten why alec a few weeks ago sitting at my door i saw a sparrow hopping about in the hall it looked cold and hungry i threw a piece of bread to it but the warden came by and made me pick it up and drive the bird away somehow i thought of the peasants in siberia and how they share their food with escaped men why should the bird starve so long as i have bread now every night i place a few pieces near the door and in the morning just when it begins to dawn and every one is asleep the bird steals up and gets her breakfast it's the immortality of an idea alec part two the inclement weather has laid a heavy hand upon Harry. The foul, hot air of the cell house is aggravating his complaint, and now the physician has pronounced him in an advanced stage of consumption. The disease is ravaging the population. Hygienic rules are ignored, and no precautions are taken against contagion. Harry's health is fast failing. He walks with an evident effort, but bravely straightens as he meets my gaze i feel quite strong alec he says i don't believe it's the con it's just a bad cold he clings tenaciously to this slender hope but now and then the cunning of suspicion tests my faith pretending to wash his hands he asks can i use your towel alec sure you're not afraid my apparent confidence seems to allay his fears and he visibly rallies with renewed hope. I strive to lighten his work on the range, and his friend Kaz, who attends the officer's table, shares with the sick boy the scraps of fruit and cake left after their meals. The kind-hearted Italian, serving a sentence of twenty years, spends his leisure weaving hair chains in the dim light of the cell, and invests the proceeds in warm underwear for his consumptive friend. I don't need it myself. I'm too hot-blooded anyhow. He lightly waves aside Harry's objections. He shudders as the hollow cough shakes the feeble frame and anxiously hovers over the boy, mothering him with unobtrusive tenderness. At the first sign of spring, Kaz conspires with me to procure for Harry the privilege of the yard. The consumptives are deprived of air, immured in the shop or block, and in the evening locked in the cells. In view of my long service and the shortness of my remaining time, the inspectors have promised me fifteen minutes' exercise in the yard. I have not touched the soil since the discovery of the tunnel in July 1900, almost four years ago. But Harry is in greater need of fresh air, and perhaps we shall be able to procure the privilege for him instead. His health would improve, and in the meantime we will bring his case before the pardon board it was an outrage to send him to the penitentiary cause asserts vehemently harry was barely fourteen then a mere child think of a judge who will give such a kid sixteen years why it means death but what can you expect remember the little boy who was sent here it was somewhere around ninety-seven he was just twelve years old and he didn't look more than ten. They brought him here in knickerbockers, and the fellows had to bend over double to keep in lockstep with him. He looked just like a baby in the line. The first pair of long pants he ever put on was stripes, and he was so frightened he'd stand at the door and cry all the time. Well, they got ashamed of themselves, after a while and sent him away to some reformatory but he spent about six months here then oh what's the use talking cos concludes hopelessly it's a rotten world all right but maybe we can get harry a pardon honest alec i feel as if he's my own child we've been friends since the day he came in and he's a good boy only he never had a chance make a list alec I'll ask the chaplain how much I've got in the office. I think it's twenty-two or maybe twenty-three dollars. It's all for Harry. The spring warms into summer before the diamond quarter donations total the amount required by the attorney to carry 
Harry's case to the pardon board. But the sick boy is missing from the range. For weeks his dry, hacking cough resounded in the night, keeping the men awake, till at last the doctor ordered him transferred to the hospital. His place on the range has been taken by Big Swede, a tall, sallow faced man who shuffles along the hall, moaning in pain. The passing guards mimic him and poke him jocularly in the ribs. Hey, you, get a move on and quit your shamming. He starts in a fright, pressing both hands against his side. He shrinks at the officer's touch. You faker, we're next to you, all right. An uncomprehending, sickly smile spreads over the seer face as he murmurs plaintively, Yes, sir, me seek, very seek. End of section 53. Recording by John Brandon. Recording. Section 54 of Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman. Part 2. Chapter 47. Chum. The able bodied men have been withdrawn to the shops, and only the old and decrepit remain in the cell house. But even the light duties of assistant prove too difficult for the Swede. The guards insist that he's shamming. Every night he is placed in a straitjacket and gagged to stifle his groans. I protest against the mistreatment and am cited to the office. The deputy's desk is occupied by Big Head, the officer of the hosiery department, now promoted to the position of second assistant deputy. He greets me with a malicious grin. I knew you wouldn't behave, he chuckles. Know you too damn well from the stocking shop. The gigantic colonel, the new deputy, loose-jointed and broad, strolls in with long, swinging step. He glances over the report against me. Is that all? He inquires of the guard in cold, impassive voice. Yes, sir. Go back to your work, Berkman. But in the afternoon, Officer Bighead struts into the cell house in charge of the barber gang. As I take my turn in the first chair, the guard hastens toward me. Get out of that chair, he commands. It ain't your turn. You take that chair, pointing toward the second barber, a former boilermaker dreaded by the men as a butcher. It is my turn in this chair, I reply, keeping my seat. That's so, Mr. Officer, the Negro barber chimes in. Shut up the officer bellows. Will you get out of that chair? He advances towards me threateningly. I won't, I retort, looking him squarely in the eye. Suppressed giggling passes along the waiting line. The keeper turns purple and strides toward the office to report me. Part 2 This is awful, Alec. I'm so sorry you're locked up. You were in the right, too. Kaz whispers at my cell. But never mind, old boy, he smiles reassuringly. You can count on me, all right. And you've got other friends. Here's a stiff someone sends you. He wants an answer right away. I'll call for it. The note mystifies me. The large, bold writing is unfamiliar. I cannot identify the signature. Jim M. The contents are puzzling. His sympathies are with me, the writer says. He has learned all the details of the trouble and feels that I acted in the defense of my rights. It is an outrage to lock me up for resenting undeserved humiliation at the hands of an unfriendly guard, and he cannot bear to see me thus persecuted. My time is short, and the present trouble, if not corrected, may cause the loss of my commutation. He will immediately appeal to the warden to do me justice. but. He should like to hear from me before taking action. I wonder at the identity of the writer. Evidently not a prisoner. Intercession with the warden would be out of the question. 
yet i cannot account for any officer who would take this attitude or employ such means of communicating with me presently cos saunters past the cell got your answer ready he whispers who gave you the note cos i don't know if i should tell you of course you must tell me i won't answer this note unless i know to whom i'm writing well alec he hesitates he didn't say if i may tell you then better go and ask him first considerable time elapses before cos returns from the delay i judge that the man is in a distant part of the institution and not easily accessible at last the kindly face of the italian appears at the cell it's all right alec he says who is he i ask impatiently i'll bet you'll never guess tell me then well i'll tell you he's not a screw can't be a prisoner no who then he's a fine fellow alec come now tell me he's a citizen the foreman of the new shop the weaving department that's the man here's another stiff from him answer at once part three dear mr j m i hardly know how to write to you it is the most remarkable thing that has happened to me in all the years of my confinement to think that you a perfect stranger and not a prisoner at that should offer to intercede in my behalf because you feel that an injustice has been done it is almost incredible but cos has informed me that you are determined to see the warden in this matter i assure you i appreciate your sense of justice more than i can express it but i most urgently request you not to carry out your plan with the best of intentions your intercession will prove disastrous to yourself as well as to me a shop foreman you are not supposed to know what is happening in the block the warden is a martinet and extremely vain of his authority he will resent your interference i don't know who you are but your indignation at what you believe an injustice characterizes you as a man of principle and you are evidently inclined to be friendly toward me i should be very unhappy to be the cause of your discharge you need your job or you would not be here i am very very thankful to you but i urge you most earnestly to drop the matter i must fight my own battles moreover the situation is not very serious and i shall come out all right with much appreciation a b dear mr m i feel much relieved by your promise to accede to my request it is best so you need not worry about me i expect to receive a hearing before the deputy and he seems a decent chap you will pardon me when i confess that i smiled at your question whether your correspondence is welcome your notes are a ray of sunshine in the darkness and i am intensely interested in the personality of a man whose sense of justice transcends considerations of personal interest you know no great heroism is required to demand justice for oneself in the furtherance of our own advantage but where the other fellow is concerned especially a stranger it becomes a question of abstract justice and but few people possess the manhood to jeopardize their reputation or comfort for that since our correspondence began i have had occasion to speak to some of the men in your charge i want to thank you in their name for your considerate and humane treatment of them cause is at the door and i must hurry trust no one with notes except him we have been friends for years and he can tell you all you wish to know about my life here cordially b dear mr m there is no need whatever for your anxiety regarding the effects of the solitary upon me i do not think they will keep me in long at any rate remember that i do not wish you to intercede you will be pleased to know that my friend harry shows signs of improvement thanks to your generosity cause has managed to deliver to him the tidbits and wine you sent you know the story of the boy he has never known the love of a mother nor the care of a father a typical child of the disinherited 
he was thrown almost in infancy upon the tender mercies of the world at the age of ten the law declared him a criminal he has never since seen a day of liberty at twenty he's dying of prison consumption was the spanish inquisition ever guilty of such organized child murder with desperate willpower he clutches at life in the hope of a pardon he is firmly convinced that fresh air would cure him but the new rules confine him to the hospital his friends here have collected a fund to bring his case before the pardon board it is to be heard next month that devoted soul cause has induced the doctor to issue a certificate of harry's critical condition and he may be released soon i have grown very fond of the boy so much sinned against i have watched his heart and mind blossom in the sunshine of a little kindness and now i hope that at least his last wish will be granted just once to walk on the street and not hear the harsh command of the guard he begs me to express to his unknown friend his deepest gratitude b dear m the deputy has just released me i am happy with a double happiness for i know how pleased you will be at the good turn of events it is probably due to the fact that my neighbor the big swede you've heard about him was found dead in the street jacket this morning the doctor and officers all along pretended that he was shamming it was a most cruel murder by the warden's order the sick swede was kept gagged and bound every night i understand that the deputy opposed such brutal methods and now it is rumored that he intends to resign but i hope he will remain there is something big and broad-minded about the gigantic colonel he tries to be fair and he has saved many a prisoner from the cruelty of the major the latter is continually inventing new modes of punishment it is characteristic that his methods involve curtailment of rations and consequent saving which is not accounted for on the books he has recently cut the milk allowance of the hospital patients notwithstanding the protests of the doctor he has also introduced severe punishment for talking you know when you have not uttered a word for days and weeks you are often seized with uncontrollable desire to give vent to your feelings these infractions of the rules are now punished by depriving you of tobacco and of your sunday dinner every sunday from thirty to fifty men are locked up on the top range to remain without food all day the system is called kill cure kill or cure and it involves considerable graft for i know numbers of men who have not received tobacco or a sunday dinner for months warden william johnston seems innately cruel recently he introduced the blind cell door covered with solid sheet iron it is much worse than the basket cell for it virtually admits no air and men are kept in it from thirty to sixty days prisoner varnell was locked up in such a cell seventy-nine days becoming paralyzed but even worse than these punishments is the more refined brutality of torturing the boys with the uncertainty of release and the increasing deprivation of good time this system is developing insanity to an alarming extent amid all this heartlessness and cruelty the chaplain is a refreshing oasis of humanity i noticed in one of your letters the expression because of economic necessity and i wondered to be sure the effects of economic causes are not to be underestimated but the extremist of the materialistic conception discount character and thus help to vitiate it the factor of personality is too often ignored by men take the chaplain for instance in spite of the surrounding swamp of cupidity and brutality notwithstanding all disappointment and ingratitude he is today after thirty years of incumbency as full of faith in human nature and as sympathetic and helpful as years ago he has had to contend against the various administrations and he is a poor man necessity has not stifled his innate kindness and this is why i wondered 
economic necessity has socialism pierced the prison walls b dear dear comrade can you realize how your words i am socialistically inclined warmed my heart i wish i could express to you all the intensity of what i feel my dear friend and comrade to have so unexpectedly found both in you unutterably lightens this miserable existence what matter that you do not entirely share my views we are comrades in the common cause of human emancipation it was indeed well worth while getting in trouble to have found you my dear friend surely i have good cause to be content even happy your friendship is a source of great strength and i feel equal to struggling through the ten months encouraged and inspired by your comradeship and devotion every evening i cross the date off my calendar joyous with the thought that i am a day nearer to the precious moment when i shall turn my back upon these walls to join my friends in the great work and to meet you dear chum face to face to grip your hand and salute you my friend and comrade most fraternally alex end of section 54 recording by john brandon section 55 a prison memoirs of an anarchist this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by john brandon prison memoirs of an anarchist by alexander berkman part 2 chapter 48 last days on the home stretch sub rosa april fifteenth nineteen o five my dear girl the last spring here and a song is in my heart only three more months and i shall have settled accounts with father pen there is the year in the workhouse of course and that prison i am told is even a worse hell than this one but i feel strong with the suffering that is past and perhaps even more so with the wonderful jewel i have found the man i mentioned in former letters has proved a most beautiful soul and sincere friend in every possible way he has been trying to make my existence more endurable with what little he may he says he wants to make amends for the injustice and brutality of society he is a socialist with a broad outlook upon life our lengthy discussions her notes afford me many moments of pleasure and joy it is chiefly to his exertions that i shall owe my commutation time the sentiment of the inspectors was not favorable i believe it was intended to deprive me of two years good time think what it would mean to us but my friend my dear chum as i affectionately call him has quietly but persistently been at work with the result that the inspectors have seen the light it is now definite that i shall be released in july the date is still uncertain i can barely realize that i am soon to leave this place the anxiety and restlessness of the last month would be almost unbearable but for the soothing presence of my devoted friend i hope some day you will meet him perhaps even soon for he is not of the quality that can long remain a helpless witness of the torture of men he wants to work in the broader field where he may join hands with those who strive to reconstruct the conditions that are bulwarked with prison bars but while necessity forces him to remain here his character is in evidence he devotes his time and means to lightening the burden of the prisoners his generous interest kept my sick friend harry alive in the hope of a pardon you will be saddened to hear that the board refused to release him on the ground that he was not sufficiently ill the poor boy who had never been out of the sight of a guard since he was a child of ten died a week after the pardon was refused but though my chum could not give freedom to harry he was instrumental in saving another young life from the hands of the hangman it was the case of young paul 
typical of prison as the nursery of crime the youth was forced to work alongside of a man who persecuted and abused him because he resented improper advances repeatedly paul begged the warden to transfer him to another department but his appeals were ignored the two prisoners worked in the bakery early one morning left alone the man attempted to violate the boy in the struggle that followed the former was killed the prison management was determined to hang the lad in the interest of discipline the officers openly avowed they would fix his clock permission for a collection to engage an attorney for paul was refused prisoners who spoke in his behalf were severely punished the boy was completely isolated preparatory to his trial he stood absolutely helpless alone but the dear chum came to the rescue of paul the work had to be done secretly and it was a most difficult task to secure witnesses for the defense among the prisoners terrorized by the guards but chum threw himself into the work with heart and soul day and night he labored to give the boy a chance for his life he almost broke down before the ordeal was over but the boy was saved the jury acquitted him on the ground of self-defense the proximity of release if only to change cells is nerve-wracking in the extreme but even the mere change will be a relief meanwhile my faithful friend does everything in his power to help me bear the strain besides ministering to my physical comforts he generously supplies me with books and publications it helps to while away the leaden heeled days and keeps me abreast of the world's work the chum is enthusiastic over the growing strength of socialism and we often discuss this subject with much vigor it appears to me however that the socialist anxiety for success is by degrees perverting essential principles it is with very much sorrow i have learned that political activity formerly viewed merely as a means of spreading socialist ideas has gradually become an end in itself straining from political power weakens the fibers of character and ideals daily contact with authority has strengthened my conviction that control of the governmental power is an illusory remedy for social evils inevitable consequences of false conceptions are not to be legislated out of existence it is not merely the conditions but the fundamental ideas of present civilization that are to be transvalued to give place to new social and individual relations the emancipation of labor is the necessary first step along the road of a regenerated humanity but even that can be accomplished only through the awakened consciousness of the toilers acting on their own initiative and strength on these and other points chum differs with me but his intense friendship knows no intellectual distinctions he is to visit you during his august vacation i know you will make him feel my gratitude for i can never repay his boundless devotion sasha dearest chum it seemed as if all aspiration and hope suddenly went out of my life when you disappeared so mysteriously i was tormented by the fear of some disaster your return has filled me with joy and i am happy to know that you heard and responded unhesitatingly to the call of a sacred cause i greatly envy your activity in the pea circle the revolution in russia has stirred me to the very depths the giant is awakening the mute giant that has suffered so patiently voicing his misery and agony only in the anguish-laden song and on the pages of his gorkies dear friend you remember our discussion regarding plevy i may have been in error when i expressed the view that the execution of the monster encouraging sign of individual revolutionary activity as it was could not be regarded as a manifestation of social awakening but the present uprising undoubtedly points to widespread rebellion permeating russian life yet it would probably be too optimistic to hope for a very radical change i have been absent from my native land for many years but in my youth i was close to the life and thought of the peasant 
large heavy bodies move slowly the proletariat of the cities has surely become impregnated with revolutionary ideas but the vital element of russia is the agrarian population i fear moreover that the dominant reaction is still very strong though it has no doubt been somewhat weakened by the discontent manifesting in the army and especially in the navy with all my heart i hope that the revolution will be successful perhaps a constitution is the most we can expect but whatever the result the bare fact of a revolution in long-suffering russia is a tremendous inspiration i should be the happiest of men to join in the glorious struggle long live the revolution a dear chum thanks for your kind offer i am absolutely opposed to having any steps taken to eliminate the workhouse sentence i have served these many years and i shall survive one more i will ask no favors of the enemy they will even twist their own law to deprive me of the five months good time to which i am entitled on the last year i understand that i shall be allowed only two months off on the preposterous ground that the new workhouse term constitutes the first year of a new sentence but i do not wish you to trouble about the matter you have more important work to do give all your energies to the good cause prepare the field for the mission of tchaikovsky and babushka and i shall be with you in spirit when you embrace our brave comrades of the russian revolution whose dear names were a hallowed treasure of my youth may success reward the efforts of our brothers in russia a chum just got word from the deputy that my papers are signed i didn't wish to cause you anxiety but i was apprehensive of some hitch but it's positive and settled now i go out on the nineteenth just one more week this is the happiest day in thirteen years shake comrade a dearest chum my hand trembles as i write this last good-bye i'll be gone in an hour my heart is too full for words please send enclosed notes to my friends and embrace them all as i embrace you now i shall live in the hope of meeting you all next year Goodbye, dear devoted friend with my whole heart your comrade and chum july nineteen nineteen o five dearest girl it's wednesday morning the nineteenth at last ge stiller meins herzenschlag und schleist uk all mein alten wunden den dieses ist mein letzter tag und dies sind sein letzten stunden my last thoughts within these walls are of you my dear dear sonya the immutable sasha end of section fifty five recording by john brandon section fifty six of prison memoirs of an anarchist this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman. Part 3. Chapter 49. The Workhouse. The gates of the penitentiary open to leave me out, and I pause involuntarily at the fascinating sight it is a street a line of houses stretches before me a woman young and wonderfully sweet-faced is passing on the opposite side my eyes follow her graceful lines as she turns the corner men stand about they wear civilian clothes and scan me with curious insistent gaze the handcuff grows taut on my wrist and i follow the sheriff into the waiting carriage a little child runs by I lean out of the window to look at the rosy-cheeked, strangely youthful face. But the guard impatiently lowers the blind, and we sit in gloomy darkness. 
the spell of the civilian garb is upon me it gives an exhilarating sense of manhood again and again i glance at my clothes and verify the numerous pockets to reassure myself of the reality of the situation i am free past the dismal gray walls free yet even now captive of the law the law the engine puffs and shrieks and my mind speeds back to another journey it was thirteen years and one week ago this day on the wings of an all-absorbing love i hastened to join the struggle of the oppressed people i left home and friends sacrificed liberty and risked life but human justice is blind it will not see the soul on fire only the shot was heard by the law that is deaf to the agony of toil vengeance is mine it saith to the uttermost drop it will shed the blood to exact its full pound of flesh twelve years and ten months and still another year what horrors await me at the new prison poor faithful horse-thief will never more smile his greeting he did not survive six months in the terrible workhouse but my spirit is strong i shall not be daunted this garb is the visible tangible token of resurrection the devotion of staunch friends will solace and cheer me the call of the great cause will give strength to live to struggle to conquer part two humiliation overwhelms me as i don the loathed suit of striped black and gray the insolent look of the guard rouses my bitter resentment as he closely scrutinizes my naked body but presently the examination over a sense of gratification steals over me at the assertiveness of my self-respect the ordeal of a day's routine is full of inexpressible anguish accustomed to prison conditions i yet find existence in the workhouse a nightmare of cruelty infinitely worse than the most inhumane aspects of the penitentiary the guards are surly and brutal the food foul and inadequate punishment for the slightest offence instantaneous and ruthless the cells are even smaller than in the penitentiary and contain neither chair nor table they are unspeakably ill-smelling with the privy buckets for the purposes of which no scrap of waste paper is allowed the sole ablutions of the day are performed in the morning when the men form in the hall and march past the spigot of running water snatching a handful in the constantly moving line absolute silence prevails in cell house and shop the slightest motion of the lips is punished with the black jack or the dungeon referred to with caustic satire as the white house the perverse logic of the law that visits the utmost limit of barbarity upon men admittedly guilty of minor transgressions throughout the breadth of the land the workhouses are notoriously more atrocious in every respect than the penitentiaries and state prisons in which are confined men convicted of felonies the allegheny county workhouse of the great commonwealth of pennsylvania enjoys infamous distinction as the blackest of hells where men expiate the sins of society at work in the broom shop i find myself in peculiarly familiar surroundings the cupidity of the management has evolved methods even more inhuman than those obtaining in the state prison the tasks imposed upon the men necessitate feverish exertion insufficient product or deficient work is not palliated by physical inability or illness in the conduct of the various industries every artifice prevalent in the penitentiary is practiced to evade the law limiting convict competition the number of men employed in productive work by far exceeds the legally permitted percentage the provisions for the protection of free labor are skillfully circumvented the tags attached to the shop products are designed to be obliterated as soon as the wares have left the prison 
the words convict made stamped on the broom handles are pasted over with labels giving no indication of the place of manufacture the anti-convict labor law symbolic of the political achievements of labor is frustrated at every point its element of protection a lame and impotent conclusion how significant the travesty of the law in its holy of holies here legal justice immures its victims here are buried the disinherited whose rags and tatters annoy respectability here offenders are punished for breaking the law and here the law is daily and hourly violated by its pious high priests part three the immediate is straining at the leash that holds memory in the environment of the penitentiary yet the veins of the terminated existence still palpitate with the recollection of friends and common suffering the messages from riverside are wet with tears of misery but johnny the young magyar strikes a note of cheer his sentence is about to expire he will devote himself to the support of the little children he had so unwittingly robbed of a father meanwhile he bids me courage and hope in closing two dollars from the proceeds of his fancy work to help along he has much grieved he writes at his inability to bid me a last farewell because the warden refused the request signed by two hundred prisoners that i be allowed to pass along the tears to say good-bye but soon soon we shall see each other in freedom words of friendship grow brightly in the darkness of the present and charm my visions of the near future coming liberty casts warming rays and i dwell in the atmosphere of my comrades the girl and the chum are aglow with the fires of young russia busily my mind shapes pictures of the great struggle that transplant me to the days of my youth in the little tenement flat in new york we had sketched with bold stroke the fortunes of the world the girl the twin and i in the dark cage-like kitchen amid the smoke of the asthmatic stove we had planned our conspirative work in russia but the need of the hour had willed it otherwise homestead had sounded the prelude of awakening and my heart had echoed the inspiring strains the banked fires of aspiration burst into life what matter the immediate outcome of the revolution in russia the yearning of my youth wells up with spontaneous power to live is to struggle to struggle against caesar side by side with the people to suffer with them and to die if need be that is life it will sadden me to part with chum even before i had looked deeply into the devoted face but the girl is aflame with the spirit of russia it will be joyous work in common the soil of monongahela laden with years of anguish has grown dear to me like the moan of a broken cord wails the thought of departure but no ties of affection will strain at my heartstrings yet the sweet face of a little girl breaks in on my reverie a look of reproaching sadness in the large wistful eyes it is little stella the last years of my penitentiary life have snatched many a grace from her charming correspondence often i have sought consolation in the beautiful likeness of her soulful face with mute tenderness she had shared my grief at the loss of harry her lips breathing sweet balm gray days had warmed at her smile and i lavished upon her all the affection with which i was surcharged it will be a violent stifling of her voice in my heart but the call of the music rings clear compelling yet who knows the revolution may be over before my resurrection in republican russia with her enlightened social protestantism life would be fuller richer than in this pitifully bourgeoisie democracy 
freedom will present the unaccustomed problem of self-support but it is premature to form definite plans long imprisonment has probably incapacitated me for hard work but i shall find means to earn my simple needs when i have cast off the fetters of my involuntary parasitism the thought of affection the love of woman thrills me with ecstasy and colors my existence with emotions of strange bliss but the solitary hours are filled with recurring dread lest my life forever remain bare of woman's love often the fear possesses me with the intensity of despair as my mind increasingly dwells on the opposite sex thoughts of woman eclipse the memory of the prison affections and the darkness of the present is threaded with the silver needle of love hopes part four the monotony of the routine the degradation and humiliation weigh heavier in the shadow of liberty my strength is failing with the hard task in the shop but the hope of receiving my full commutation sustains me the law allows five months good time on every year beginning with the ninth year of a sentence but the superintendent has intimated to me that i may be granted the benefit of only two months as a new prisoner serving the first year of a workhouse sentence the board of directors will undoubtedly take that view he often taunts me exasperation at his treatment coupled with my protest against the abuse of a fellow prisoner have caused me to be ordered into the solitary dear chum is insistent on legal steps to secure my full commutation notwithstanding my unconditional refusal to resort to the courts he has initiated a sub rosa campaign to achieve his object the time drags in torturing uncertainty with each day the solitary grows more stifling maddening till my brain reels with terror of the graveyard silence like glad music sounds the stern command exercise in step we circle the yard the clanking of charlie's chain mournfully beating time he had made an unsuccessful attempt to escape for which he is punished with a ball and chain the iron cuts into his ankle and he trudges painfully under the heavy weight near me staggers billy his left side completely paralyzed since he was released from the white house all about me are cripples i am in the midst of the social refuse the lame and the halt the broken in body and spirit past work past even crime these were the blessed of the nazarene these a christian world breaks on the wheel they too are within the scope of my mission they above all others these the living indictments of a leprous system the excommunicated of god and man the threshold of liberty is thickly sown with misery and torment the days are unbearable with nervous restlessness the nights hideous with the hours of agonizing stillness the endless endless hours feverishly i pace the cell the day will pass it must pass with reverent emotion i bless the shamed sun as he dips beyond the western sky one day nearer to the liberty that awaits me with unrestricted sunshine and air and life beyond the hated walls of gray out in the daylight in the open the open world the scent of fresh mown hay is in my nostrils green fields and forests stretch before me sweetly ripples the mountain spring up to the mountain crest to the breezes and the sunshine where the storm breaks in its wild fury upon my uncovered head welcome the rain and the wind that sweep the foul prison dust off my heart and blow life and strength into my being 
trembling rapturous is the thought of freedom out in the woods away from the stench of the cannibal world i shall wander nor lift my foot from soil or sod close to the breath of nature i will press my parched lips on her bosom i will pass my days drinking sustenance and strength from the universal mother and there in liberty and independence in the vision of the mountain peaks i shall voice the cry of the social orphans of the buried and the disinherited and visualize to the living the yearning menacing face of pain end of section 56 recording by john brandon Section 57 of Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chuck Williamson. Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman Part 4 The Resurrection 1. All night I toss sleeplessly on the cot and pace the cell in nervous agitation, waiting for the dawn. With restless joy I watch the darkness melt as the first rays herald the coming of the day. It is the 18th of May, my last day, my very last. A few more hours, and I shall walk through the gates and drink in the warm sunshine and the balmy air, and be free to go and come as I please. After the nightmare of thirteen years and ten months in jail, penitentiary, and workhouse, my step quickens with the excitement of the outside, and I try to while away the heavy hours, thinking of freedom and of friends. But my brain is in a turmoil. I cannot concentrate my thoughts. Visions of the near future, images of the past, flash before me and crowd each other, and bewildering confusion. Again and again, my mind reverts to the unnecessary cruelty that has kept me in prison three months over and above my time. It was sheer sophistry to consider me a new prisoner, entitled only to two months' commutation. As a matter of fact, I was serving the last year of a twenty-two-year sentence and therefore I should have received five months' time off. The superintendent has repeatedly promised to inform me of the decision of the board of directors, and every day for weeks and months I anxiously waited for word from them. None ever came, and I had to serve the full ten months. Oh, well... It is almost over now. I have passed my last night in the cell, and the morning is here, the precious, blessed morning. How slowly the minutes creep! I listen intently, and catch the sound of bars being unlocked on the bottom range. It is the night captain, turning the kitchen men out to prepare breakfast. 5 a.m. Two and a half hours yet before I shall be called. Two endless hours, and then another thirty long minutes. Will they ever pass? And again, I pace the cell. 2. The gong rings the rising hour. In great agitation, I gather up my blankets, tin cup, and spoon. 
which must be delivered at the office before I am discharged. My heart beats turbulently as I stand at the door, waiting to be called. But the guard unlocks the range and orders me to fall in for breakfast. The striped line winds down the stairs, past the lynx-eyed deputy standing in the middle of the hallway, and slowly circles through the center, where each man receives his portion of bread for the day and returns to his tier. The turnkey, on his rounds of the range, casts a glance into my cell. Not working, he says mechanically, shutting the door in my face. I'm going out, I protest. Not till you're called, he retorts, locking me in. I stand at the door, tense with suspense. I strain my ear for the approach of a guard to call me to the office, but all remains quiet. A vague fear steals over me. Perhaps they will not release me today. I may be losing time. A feeling of nausea overcomes me, but by a strong effort I throw off the dreadful fancy and quicken my step. I must not think, not think. At last, the lever is pulled, my cell unlocked, and with a dozen other men, I am marched to the clothes room in single file in lockstep. I await my turn impatiently, as several men are undressed and their naked bodies scrutinized for contraband or hidden messages. The overseer flings a small bag at each man, containing the prisoner's civilian garb, shouting boisterously, Hey, you! Take off them clothes and put your rags on! I dress hurriedly. A guard accompanies me to the office, where my belongings are returned to me. Some money friends had sent, my watch, and the piece of ivory the penitentiary turnkey had stolen from me, and which I had insisted on getting back before I left Riverside. The officer in charge hands me a railroad ticket to Pittsburgh, the fare costing about thirty cents, and I am conducted to the prison gate. Three. The sun shines brightly in the yard. The sky is clear, the air fresh and bracing. Now the last gate will be thrown open, and I shall be out of sight of the guard, beyond the bars, alone. How I have hungered for this hour! How often in the past years I have dreamed of this rapturous moment, to be alone, out in the open, away from the insolent eyes of my keepers. I'll rush away from these walls, and kneel on the warm sod, and kiss the soil, and embrace the trees, and with a song of joy give thanks to nature before the blessings of the sunshine and air. The outer door opens before me, and I am confronted by reporters with cameras. Several tall men approach me. One of them touches me on the shoulder, turns back the lapel of his coat, revealing a police officer's star, and says, Berkman, you are to leave the city before night, by order of the chief. The detectives and reporters trailing me to the nearby railway station attract a curious crowd. I hasten into a car to escape their insistent gaze, feeling glad that I have prevailed upon my friends not to meet me at the prison. My mind is busy with plans to outwit the detectives, who have entered the same compartment. I have arranged to join the girl in Detroit. 
I have no particular reason to mask my movements, but I resent the surveillance. I must get rid of the spies somehow. I don't want their hateful eyes to desecrate my meeting with the girl. I feel dazed. The short ride to Pittsburgh is over before I can collect my thoughts. The din and noise rend my ears. The rushing cars, the clanging bells, bewilder me. I am afraid to cross the street. The flying monsters pursue me on every side. The crowds jostle me on the sidewalk, and I am constantly running into the passers-by. The turmoil, the ceaseless movement, disconcerts me. A horseless carriage whizzes close by me. I turn to look at the first automobile I have ever seen, but the living current sweeps me helplessly along. A woman passes me with a child in her arms. The baby looks strangely diminutive, a rosy dimple in the laughing face. I smile back at the little cherub, and my eyes meet the gaze of the detectives. A wild thought to escape, to get away from them, possesses me, and I turn quickly into a side street and walk blindly, faster and faster. A sudden impulse seizes me at the sight of a passing car, and I dash after it. Fair, please, the conductor sings out, and I almost laugh out loud at the fleeting sense of the material reality of freedom. Conscious of the strangeness of my action, I produce a dollar bill, and a sense of exhilarating independence comes over me as the man counts out the silver coins. I watch him closely for a sign of recognition. Does he realize I am just out of prison? He turns away, and I feel thankful to the dear chum for having so thoughtfully provided me with a new suit of clothes. It is peculiar, however, that the conductor has failed to notice my closely cropped hair. But the man in the seat opposite seems to be watching me. Perhaps he has recognized me by my picture in the newspapers. Or maybe it is my straw hat that has attracted his attention. I glance about me. No one wears summer headgear yet. It must be too early in the season. I ought to change it. The detectives could not follow me so easily, then. Why, there they are, on the back platform. At the next stop, I jump off the car. A hat sign arrests my eye, and I walk into the store, and then slip quietly through a side entrance, a dark derby on my head. I walk quickly for a long, long time, board several cars, and then walk again, till I find myself on a deserted street. No one is following me now. The detectives must have lost track of me. I feel worn and tired. Where could I rest up, I wonder, when I suddenly recollect that I was to go directly from the prison? to the drugstore of Comrade M. My friends must be worried, and M is waiting to wire the girl about my release. It is long past noon when I enter the drugstore. M seems highly wrought up over something. He shakes my hand violently and plies me with questions as he leads me into the apartments in the rear of the store. It seems strange to be in a regular room. There is paper on the walls, and it feels so peculiar to touch, so different from the whitewashed cell. I pass my hand over it caressingly, with a keen sense of pleasure. The chairs, too, look strange, and those quaint things on the table. The bric-a-brac absorbs my attention. The people in the room look hazy, 
their voices sound distant and confused. Why don't you sit down, Alec? The tones are musical and tender, a woman's, no doubt. Yes, I reply, walking around the table and picking up a bright toy. It represents undine, rising from the water, the spray glistening in the sun. Are you tired, Alec? Uh, no. You have just come out? Y yes. It requires an effort to talk. The last year in the workhouse, I have barely spoken a dozen words. There was always absolute silence. The voices disturb me. The presence of so many people, there are three or four about me, is oppressive. The room reminds me of the cell, and the desire seizes me to rush out into the open, to breathe the air and see the sky. I'm going, I say, snatching up my hat. Four. The train speeds me to Detroit, and I wonder vaguely how I reached the station. My brain is numb. I cannot think. Field and forest flit by in the glittering dusk, but the surroundings wake no interest in me. I am rid of the detectives. The thought persists in my mind, and I feel something relax within me and leave me cold, without emotion or desire. With an effort, I descend to the platform, and sway from side to side as I cross the station to Detroit. A man and a girl hasten toward me, and grasp me by the hand. I recognize Carl, the dear boy. He was a most faithful and cheering correspondent all these years since he left the penitentiary. But who is the girl with him, I wonder, when my gaze falls on the woman, leaning against a pillar? She looks intently at me. The wave of her hair, the familiar eyes. Why, it's the girl! How little she has changed! I take a few steps forward. Somewhat surprised that she did not rush up to me like the others. I feel pleased at her self-possession. The excited voices, the quick motions, disturb me. I walk slowly toward her, but she does not move. She seems rooted to the spot, her hands grasping the pillar, a look of awe and terror in her face. Suddenly she throws her arms around me. Her lips move, but no sound reaches my ear. We walk in silence. The girl presses a bouquet in my hand. My heart is full, but I cannot talk. I hold the flowers to my face and mechanically bite the petals. 5. Detroit Chicago and Milwaukee pass before me like a troubled dream. I have a faint recollection of a sea of faces, restless and turbulent, an eye in its midst. Confused voices beat like hammers on my head, and then all is very still. I stand in full view of the audience. Eyes are turned on me from every side, and I grow embarrassed. The crowd looks dim and hazy. I feel hot and cold, and a great longing to flee. The perspiration is running down my back. My knees tremble violently. The floor is slipping from under my feet. There is a tumult of hand clapping, loud cheers and bravos. We return to Carl's house and men and women grasp my hand and look at me with eyes of curious awe. I fancy a touch of pity in their tones, 
and am impatient of their sympathy. A sense of suffocation possesses me within doors, and I dread the presence of people. It is torture to talk. The sound of voices agonizes me. I watch for an opportunity to steal out of the house. It soothes me to lose myself among the crowds, and a sense of quiet pervades me at the thought that I am a stranger to everyone about me. I roam the city at night and seek the outlying country, conscious only of the desire to be alone. 6. I am in the wall time, the girl at my side. All is quiet in the cemetery, and I feel a great peace. No emotion stirs me at the sight of the monument, save for a feeling of quiet sadness. It represents a woman, with one hand placing a wreath on the fallen, with the other grasping a sword. The marble features mirror unutterable grief and proud defiance. I glance at the girl, her face is averted, but the droop of her head speaks of suffering. I hold out my hand to her, and we stand in mute sorrow at the graves of our martyred comrades. I have a vision of Stinka Rosin, as I had seen him pictured in my youth and at his side hang the bodies of the men buried beneath my feet. Why are they dead, I wonder? Why should I live? And a great desire to lie down with them is upon me. I clutch the iron post to keep from falling. Steps sound behind me, and I turn to see a girl hastening toward us. She is radiant with young womanhood. Her presence breathes life and the joy of it. Her bosom heaves with panting. Her face struggles with a solemn look. I ran all the way. Her voice is soft and low. I was afraid I might miss you. The girl smiles. Let us go in somewhere to rest up, Alice. Turning to me, she adds, She ran to see you. How peculiar the girl should conceive such an idea. It is absurd. Why should Alice be anxious to see me? I am old and worn. My step is languid, unsteady. Bitter thoughts fill my mind as we ride back on the train to Chicago. You are sad, the girl remarks. Alice is very much taken with you. Aren't you glad? You are mistaken, I reply. I'm sure of it, the girl persists. Shall I ask her? She turns to Alice. I like you so much, Sasha, Alice whispers. I look up timidly at her. She is leaning toward me in the abandon of artless tenderness and a great joy steals over me as I read in her eyes frank affection. 7. New York looks unexpectedly familiar, though I miss many landmarks. It is torture to be indoors, and I roam the streets, experiencing a thrill of kinship when I locate one of my old haunts. I feel little interest in the large meeting arranged to greet me back into the world, yet I am conscious of some curiosity about the comrades I may meet there. Few of the old guard have remained. Some dropped from the ranks, others died. John Most will not be there. I cherished the hope of meeting him again, but he died a few months before my release. He had been unjust to me, but who is free from moments of weakness? The passage of time has mellowed the bitterness of my resentment, and I think of him, my first teacher of anarchy, with old-time admiration. 
his unique personality stands out in strong relief upon the flat background of his time his life was the tragedy of the ever unpopular pioneer a social leer his whitening years brought only increasing isolation and greater lack of understanding even within his own circle he had struggled and suffered much he gave his whole life to advance the cause only to find at the last that he who crossed the threshold must leave all behind even friendship even comradeship my old friend Justice Swab is also gone, and Brady, the big Austrian. Few of the comrades of my day have survived. The younger generation seems different, unsatisfactory. The ghetto I had known has also disappeared. Primitive Orchard Street, the scene of our pioneer meetings, has conformed to business respectability. The historic lecture hall that rang with the breaking chains of the awakening people has been turned into a dancing school. The little café around the corner, the intellectual arena of former years, is now a counting house. The fervid enthusiasm of the past the spontaneous comradeship in the common cause, the intoxication of world-liberating zeal. All are gone with the days of my youth. I sense the spirit of cold deliberation in the new set, and a tone of disillusioned wisdom that chills and estranges me. The girl has also changed. The little sailor, my companion of the days that, thrilled with the approach of the social revolution, has become a woman of the world. Her mind has matured, but her wider interests antagonize my old revolutionary traditions that inspired every day and colored our every act with a direct perception of the momentarily expected great upheaval. I feel an instinctive disapproval of many things, though particular instances are intangible and elude my analysis. I sense a foreign element in the great circle she has gathered about her, and feel myself a stranger among them. Her friends and admirers crowd her home, and turn it into a sort of salon. They talk art and literature discuss science, and philosophize over the disharmony of life. But the groans of the dungeon find no gripping echo there. The girl is the most revolutionary of them all, but even she has been infected by the air of intellectual aloofness, false tolerance, and everlasting pessimism. I resent the situation. The more I become conscious of the chasm between the girl and myself, it seems unbridgeable. We cannot recover the intimate note of our former comradeship. With pain, I witness her evident misery. She is untiring in her care and affection. The whole circle lavishes on me sympathy and tenderness. But through it all, I feel the commiserating tolerance toward a sick child. I shun the atmosphere of the house, and flee to seek the solitude of the crowded streets and the companionship of the plain, untutored underworld. In the Bowery Resort, I came across Dan, my assistant on the range during my last year in the penitentiary. Hello, Alec, he says taking me aside. Awful glad to see you out of hell. Doing all right? So-so, <laughs> Dan. And you? <laughs> rotten, Alec, rotten. You know it was my first bit, and I swore I'd never do a crooked job again. <laughs> well, they turned me out with a five-spot, about four years' steady work, mind you, 
and three of em working my head off on a loom. Then they handed me a pair of Kentucky jeans that any fly cop could spot a mile off. My friends went back on me. That five spot was all I had in the world, and it didn't go a long way. Liberty ain't what it looks to a fellow through the bars, Alec. But it's hell to go back. I don't know what to do. How do you happen here, Dan? Could you get no work at home in Oil City? Home hell! I wish I had a home and friends like you, Alec. <laughs> Christ, do you think I'd ever turn another trick? But I got no home and no friends. Mother died before I came out, and I found no home. I got a job in Oil City, but the bulls tipped me off for an ex-con, and I beat my way here. I tried to do the square thing, Alec, but where's a fellow to turn? I haven't a cent, and not a friend in the world. Poor Dan. I feel powerless to help him, even with advice. Without friends or money, his liberty is a hollow mockery, even worse than mine. Five years ago, he was a strong, healthy young man. He committed a burglary and was sent to prison. Now he is out, his body weakened, his spirit broken. He is less capable than ever to survive in the struggle. What is he to do but commit another crime and be returned to prison? Even I, with so many advantages that Dan is lacking, with kind comrades and helpful friends, I can find no place in this world of the outside. I have been torn out. I seem unable to take root again. Everything looks different, changed, and yet I feel a great hunger for life. I could enjoy the sunshine, the open, and freedom of action. I could make my life and my prison experience useful to the world. But I am incapacitated for the struggle. I do not fit in any more, not even in the circle of my comrades. And this seething life, the turmoil, and the noises of the city agonize me. Perhaps it would be best for me to retire to the country and there lead a simple life, close to nature. 8. The summer is fragrant with a thousand perfumes, and a great peace is in the woods. The Hudson River shimmers in the distance, a solitary sail on its broad bosom. The palisades on the opposite side look immutable eternal, their undulating tops melting in the grayish-blue horizon. Puffs of smoke from the valley. Here, too, has penetrated the restless spirit. The muffled thunder of blasting breaks in upon the silence. The greedy hand of man is desecrating the palisades, as it has desecrated the race. But the big river flows quietly, and the sailboat glides serenely on the waters. It skips over the foaming waves, near the spot I stand on toward the great busy city. Now it is floating past the high towers, with their forbidding aspect. It is Sing Sing Prison. Men groan and suffer there, and are tortured in the dungeon. And I, I, am a useless cog, an idler, while others toil, and I keep mute, while others suffer. My mind dwells in the prison, the silence rings with the cry of pain, the woods echo the agony of the dungeon. I start at the murmur of the leaves, the trees with their outstretched arms bar my way menacing me like the guards on the prison walls. Their monster shapes follow me in the valley. At night I wake in cold terror. 
the agonized cry of crazy smithy is in my ears and again i hear the sickening thud of the riot clubs on the prisoner's head the solitude is harrowing with the memory of the prison it haunts me with the horrors of the basket cell away i must away to seek relief amidst the people back in the city i face the problem of support the sense of dependence gnaws me the hospitality of my friends is boundless but i cannot continue as the beneficiary of their generosity i had declined the money gift presented to me on my release by the comrades i felt i could not accept even their well-meant offering the question of earning my living is growing acute i cannot remain idle but what shall i turn to i am too weak for factory work i had hoped to secure employment as a compositor but the linotype has made me superfluous i might be engaged as a proofreader my former membership in the typographical union will enable me to join the ranks of labor my physical condition however precludes the immediate realization of my plans meanwhile some comrades suggest the advisability of a short lecture tour it will bring me in closer contact with the world and serve to awaken new interest in life the idea appeals to me i shall be doing work useful work i shall voice the cry of the depths and perhaps the people will listen and some may understand nine with a great effort i persevere on the tour the strain is exhausting my strength and i feel weary and discontented my innate dread of public speaking is aggravated by the necessity of constant association with people the comrades are sympathetic and attentive but their very care is a source of annoyance i long for solitude and quiet the thought is preposterous impossible meetings have already been arranged in various cities and my appearance widely announced it would disgrace me and injure the movement were i to prove myself so irresponsible i owe it to the cause and to my comrades to keep my appointments i must fight off this morbid notion my engagement in pittsburgh aids my determination little did i dream in the penitentiary that i should live to see the city again even to appear in public there looking back over the long years of imprisonment of persecution and torture i marvel that i have survived surely it was not alone physical capacity to suffer how often i had touched the threshold of death and trembled on the brink of insanity and self-destruction whatever strength and perseverance i possessed they alone could not have saved my reason in the night of the dungeon or preserved me in the despair of the solitary poor wingy ed sloan and fighting tom harry russell crazy smithy how many of my friends have perished there it was the vision of an ideal the consciousness that i suffered for a great cause that sustained me the very exaggeration of my self-estimate was a source of strength I looked upon myself as a representative of a world movement. It was my duty to exemplify the spirit and dignity of the ideas it embodied. I was not a prisoner merely. I was an anarchist in the hands of the enemy. As such, it devolved upon me, 
to maintain the manhood and self-respect my ideals signified. The example of the political prisoners in Russia inspired me, and my stay in the penitentiary was a continuous struggle that was the breath of life. Was it the extreme self-consciousness of the idealist, the power of revolutionary traditions, or simply the persistent will to be? Most likely, it was the fusing of all three that shaped my attitude in prison and kept me alive. And now, on my way to Pittsburgh, I feel the same spirit within me at the threat of the local authorities to prevent my appearance in the city. Some friends seek to persuade me to cancel my lecture there, alarmed at the police preparations to arrest me. Something might happen, they warn me. Legally, I am still a prisoner, out on parole. I am liable to be returned to the penitentiary without trial for the period of my commutation time, eight years and two months, if convicted of a felony before the expiration of my full sentence of twenty-two years. But the menace of the enemy stirs me from apathy, and all my old revolutionary defiance is roused within me. For the first time during the tour, I feel a vital interest in life and am eager to ascend the platform. An unfortunate delay on the road brings me into Pittsburgh two hours late for the lecture. Comrade M. is impatiently waiting for me, and we hasten to the meeting. On the way, he informs me that the hall is filled with police and prison guards. The audience is in a state of great suspense. The rumor has gone about that the authorities are determined to prevent my appearance. I sense an air of suppressed excitement as I enter the hall and elbow my way through the crowded aisle. Someone grips my arm, and I recognize Southside Johnny, the friendly prison runner. Alec, take care, he warns me. The bulls are laying for you. 10. The meeting is over. The danger passed. I feel worn and tired with the effort of the evening. My next lecture is to take place in Cleveland, Ohio. The all-night ride in the stuffy smoker aggravates my fatigue and sets my nerves on edge. I arrive in the city feeling feverish and sick. To engage a room in the hotel would require an extra expense from the proceeds of the tour, which are intended for the movement. Moreover, it would be cybaritism, contrary to the traditional practice of anarchist lecturers. I decide to accept the hospitality of some friends during my stay in the city. For hours, I try to locate the comrade who has charge of arranging the meetings. At his home, I am told that he is absent. His parents, pious Jews, look at me askance and refuse to inform me of their son's whereabouts. The unfriendly attitude of the old folks drives me into the street again, and I seek out another comrade. His family gathers about me. Their curious gaze is embarrassing, their questions idle. My pulse is feverish, my head heavy. I should like to rest up before the lecture but a constant stream of comrades flows in on me, and the house rings with their joy of meeting me. The talking wearies me, their ardent interest searches my soul with rude hands. 
these men and women they too are different from the comrades of my day their very language echoes the spirit that has so depressed me in the new ghetto the abyss in our feelings and thought appalls me with failing heart i ascend the platform in the evening it is chilly outdoors and the large hall sparsely filled and badly lit breathes the cold of the grave upon me the audience is unresponsive the lecture on crime and prisons that so thrilled my pittsburgh meeting wakes no vital chord i feel dispirited my voice is weak and expressionless at times it drops to a hoarse whisper i seem to stand on the mouth of a deep cavern and everything is dark within i speak into the blackness my words strike metallically against the walls and are thrown back at me with mocking emphasis a sense of weariness and hopelessness possesses me and i conclude the lecture abruptly the comrades surround me grasp my hand and ply me with questions about my prison life the joy of liberty and of work they are undisguisedly disappointed at my anxiety to retire and presently it is decided that I should accept the proffered hospitality of a comrade who owns a large house in the suburbs. The ride is interminable, the comrade apparently living several miles out in the country. On the way he talks incessantly, assuring me repeatedly that he considers it a great privilege to entertain me. I nod sleepily finally we arrive the place is large but squalid the low ceilings press down on my head the rooms look cheerless and uninhabited exhausted by the day's exertion i fall into heavy sleep awakened in the morning i am startled to find a stranger in my bed his coats and hats are on the floor, and he lies snoring at my side, with overshirt and trousers on. He must have fallen into bed very tired, without even detaching the large cuffs, torn and soiled, that rattled on his hands. The sight fills me with inexpressible disgust. All through the years of my prison life, my nights had been passed in absolute solitude. The presence of another in my bed is unutterably horrifying. I dress hurriedly and rush out of the house. A heavy drizzle is falling. The air is close and damp. The country looks cheerless and dreary. But one thought possesses me to get away from the stranger snoring in my bed away from the suffocating atmosphere of the house with its low ceilings out into the open away from the presence of man the sight of a human being repels me the sound of a voice is torture to me i want to be alone always alone to have peace and quiet to lead a simple life in close communion with nature ah nature that too i have tried and found more impossible even than the turmoil of the city the silence of the woods threatened to drive me mad as did the solitude of the dungeon a curse upon the thing that has incapacitated me for life made solitude as hateful as the face of man made life itself impossible for me and is it for this i have yearned and suffered 
for the specter that haunts my steps and turns day into a nightmare this distortion life oh where is the joy of expectation the tremulous rapture as i stood at the door of my cell hailing the blush of the dawn the day of resurrection where the happy moments that lit up the night of misery with the ecstasy of freedom which was to give me back to work and joy where where is it all is liberty sweet only in the anticipation and life a bitter awakening the rain has ceased the sun peeps through the clouds and glints its rays upon a shop window my eye falls on the gleaming barrel of a revolver i enter the place and purchase the weapon i walk aimlessly in a daze it is beginning to rain again my body is chilled to the bone and i seek the shelter of a saloon on an obscure street in the corner of the dingy back room i notice a girl she is very young with an air of gentility about her that is somewhat marred by her quick restless look we sit in silence watching the heavy downpour outdoors the girl is toying with a glass of whiskey angry voices reach us from the street there is a heavy shuffling of feet and a suppressed cry a woman lurches through the swinging door and falls against a table the girl rushes to the side of the woman and assists her into a chair are you hurt madge she asks sympathetically the woman looks up at her with bleary eyes she raises her hand and passes it slowly across her mouth and spits violently he hit me the dirty brute she whimpers he hit me and i shan't give him no money i just won't frenchy the girl is tenderly wiping her friend's bleeding face shh madge shh, she warns her with a glance at the approaching waiter drunk again you old bitch the man growls you better vamoose now oh let her be charlie won't you the girl coaxes and say bring me a bitters the, the dirty loafer it's money always give me money the woman mumbles and i've had such bad luck frenchy you know it's true don't you frenchy yes yes dear the girl soothes her don't talk now lean your head on my shoulder so you'll be all right in a minute the girl sways to and fro gently patting the woman on the head and all is still in the room the woman's breathing grows regular and louder she snores and the young girl slowly unwinds her arms and resumes her seat i motion to her will you have a drink with me <laughs> with pleasure she smiles poor thing she nods toward the sleeper her fellow beats her and takes all she makes you have a kind heart frenchy we girls must be good to each other no one else will some men are so mean just too mean to live or let others live but some are nice of course some twirls are bad but we ain't all like that and she hesitates 
and what well some have seen better days i wasn't always like this she adds gulping down her drink her face is pensive her large black eyes look dreamily she asks abruptly you like poetry e e yes why i write oh, you don't believe me do you hear something of mine and with a preliminary cough she begins to recite with exaggerated feeling Ahem. mother dear the days were young when posies in our garden hung upon your lap my golden head i laid with pure and happy heart i prayed <laughs> i remember those days she adds wistfully we sit in the dusk without speaking the lights are turned on and my eyes fall on a paper lying on the table the large black print announces an excursion to buffalo will you come with me i ask the girl pointing to the advertisement to buffalo yes <laughs> you're kidding no will you come sure alone with me in the stateroom frenchy grows tender and playful she notices my sadness and tries to amuse me but i am thinking of the lecture that is to take place in cleveland this very hour the anxiety of my comrades the disappointment of the audience my absence all prey on my mind but who am i to presume to teach i have lost my bearings there is no place for me in life my bridges are burned the girl is in high spirits but her jollity angers me i crave to speak to her to share my misery and my grief i hint at the impossibility of life and my superfluity in the world but she looks bored not grasping the significance of my words don't talk so foolish boy she scoffs why do you care about work or a place you've got money what more do you want you'd better go down and fetch something to drink returning to the stateroom i find frenchy missing in a sheltered nook on the deck i recognize her in the lap of a stranger heart sore and utterly disgusted i retire to my berth in the morning i slip quietly off the boat the streets are deserted the city is asleep in the fog and rain the gray buildings resemble the prison walls the tall factory chimneys standing guard like monster sentinels i hasten away from the hated sight and wander along the docks the mist weaves phantom shapes and i see a multitude of people and in their midst a boy pale with large lustrous eyes the crowd curses and yells in frenzied passion and arms are raised and blows rain down on the lad's head the rain beats heavier and every drop is a blow the boy totters and falls to the ground the wistful face the dreamy eyes <gasps> why it's cholgos a cursed spot i cannot die here i must new york to be near my friends and death eleven loud knocking wakes me say mister a voice calls behind the door 
are you all right yes will you have a bite or something no well as you please but you haven't left your room going on two days now two days and still alive the road to death is so short why suffer an instant and i shall be no more and only the memory of me will abide for a little while in this world this world is there another if there is anything in spiritualism carl will learn of it in prison we had been interested in the subject and we had made a compact that he who is the first to die should appear in spirit to the other pretty fancy a foolish man born of immortal vanity hereafter life after death children of earth's misery the disharmony of life bears dreams of peace and bliss but there is no harmony save in death who knows but that even then the atoms of my lifeless clay will find no rest tossed about in space to form new shapes and new thoughts for aeons of human anguish and so carl will not see me after death our compact will not be kept for nothing will remain of my soul when i am dead as nothing remains of the sum when its units are gone dear carl he will be distraught at my failure to come to detroit he had arranged a lecture there following cleveland it is peculiar that i should not have thought of wiring him that i was not able to attend he might have suspended preparations but it did not occur to me and now it is too late the girl too will be in despair at my disappearance i cannot notify her now i am virtually dead yet i crave to see her once more before i depart even at a distance and that also is too late i am almost dead I dress mechanically and step into the street. The brilliant sunshine, the people passing me by, the children playing about, strike on my consciousness with pleasing familiarity. The desire grips me to be one of them, to participate in their life. And yet it seems strange to think of myself as part of this moving, breathing humanity. Am I not dead? I roam about all day. At dusk, I am surprised to find myself near the girl's home. The fear seizes me that I might be seen and recognized. A sense of guilt steals over me and I shrink away, only to return again and again to the familiar spot. I pass the night in the park. An old man, a sailor out of work, huddles close to me, seeking the warmth of my body. But I am cold and cheerless, and all next day I haunt again the neighborhood of the girl. An irresistible force attracts me to the house. Repeatedly, I return to my room and snatch up the weapon, and then rush out again. I am fearful of being seen near the den, and I make long detours to the battery in the Bronx. And again and again I find myself watching the entrance and speculating on the people passing in and out of the house. My mind pictures the girl, with her friends about her. What are they discussing, I wonder? Why, myself, it flits through my mind. 
the thought appalls me they must be distraught with anxiety over my disappearance perhaps they think me dead i hasten to a telegraph office and quickly pen a message to the girl come i am waiting here in a flurry of suspense i wait for the return of the messenger a little girl steps in and i recognize tess and inwardly resent that the girl did not come herself alec she falters sonya wasn't home when your message came i'll run to find her the old dread of people is upon me and i rush out of the place hoping to avoid meeting the girl i stumble through the streets retrace my steps to the telegraph office and suddenly come face to face with her her appearance startles me the fear of death is in her face mute horror in her eyes <gasps> sasha her hand grips my arm and she steadies my faltering step twelve i open my eyes the room is light and airy a soothing quiet pervades the place the portiers part noisily and the girl looks in awake sasha she brightens with a happy smile yes when did i come here several days ago you've been very sick but you feel better now don't you dear several days i try to recollect my trip to buffalo the room on the bowery was it all a dream where was i before i came here i ask you you were absent she stammers and in her face is visioned the experience of my disappearance with tender care the girl ministers to me i feel like one recovering from a long illness very weak but with a touch of joy in it no one is permitted to see me save one or two of the girl's nearest friends who slip in quietly pat my hand in mute sympathy and discreetly retire i sense their understanding and am grateful that they make no allusion to the events of my past days the care of the girl is unwavering by degrees i gain strength the room is bright and cheerful the silence of the house soothes me the warm sunshine is streaming through the open window i can see the blue sky and the silvery cloudlets a little bird hops upon the sill looking steadily at me and chirps a greeting it brings back the memory of dick my feathered pet and of my friends in prison i have done nothing for the agonized men in the dungeon darkness have i forgotten them i have the opportunity why am i idle the girl calls cheerfully sasha our friend philo is here would you like to see him i welcome the comrade whose gentle manner and deep sympathy have endeared him to me in the days since my return there is something unutterably tender about him the circle has christened him the philosopher and his breadth of understanding and non-invasive personality have been a great comfort to me his voice is low and caressing like the soft crooning of a 
mother rocking her child to sleep. Life is a problem, he is saying. A problem whose solution consists in trying to solve it. Schopenhauer might have been right, he smiles with a humorous twinkle in his eye. And his love of life was so strong, his need for expression so compelling. He had to write a big book to prove how useless is all effort. But his very sincerity disproves him. Life is its own justification. The disharmony of life is more seeming than real. And what is real of it is the folly and blindness of man. To struggle against that folly is to create greater harmony, wider possibilities. Artificial barriers circumscribe and dwarf life, and stifle its manifestations. To break those barriers down is to find a vent, to expand, to express oneself, and that is life, Alec, a continuous struggle for expression. It mirrors itself in nature, as in all the phases of man's existence. Look at the little vine, struggling against the fury of the storm, and clinging with all its might to preserve its hold. Then see it stretch toward the sunshine, to absorb the light and the warmth, and then freely give back of itself in multiple form and wealth of color. We call it beautiful, then, for it has found expression. That is life, Alec, and thus it manifests itself through all the gradations we call evolution. The higher the scale, the more varied and complex the manifestations, and in turn the greater need for expression. To suppress or thwart it means decay, death. And in this, Alec, is to be found the main source of suffering and misery. The hunger of life storms at the gates that exclude it from the joy of being, and the individual soul multiplies its expressions by being mirrored in the collective as the little vine mirrors itself in its many flowers, or as the acorn individualizes itself a thousandfold in the many-leafed oak. <sighs> but I am tiring you, Alec. No, no, Philo, continue. I want to hear more. Well, Alec, as with nature, so with man. Life is never at a standstill. Everywhere and ever it seeks new manifestations, more expansion. In art and literature, as in the affairs of men, the struggle is continual for higher and more intimate expression. That is progress, the vine reaching for more sunshine and light translated into the language of social life. It means the individualization of the mass, the finding of a higher level, the climbing over the fence that shut out life. Everywhere you see this reaching out. The process is individual and social at the same time, for the species lives in the individual as much as the individual persists in the species. The individual comes first. His clarified vision is multiplied in his immediate environment, and gradually permeates through his generation and time, deepening the social consciousness and widening the scope of existence. But perhaps you have not found it so, Alec? after your many years of absence. No, dear Philo, what you have said appeals to me very deeply. But I have found things so different from what I had pictured them. 
our comrades the movement it is not what i thought it would be it is quite natural alec a change has taken place but its meaning is meant to be distorted through the dim vision of your long absence i know well what you miss dear friend the old mode of existence the living on the very threshold of the revolution so to speak and everything looks strange to you and out of joint but as you stay a little longer with us you will see that it is merely a change of form the essence is the same we are the same as before alec only made deeper and broader by years and experience anarchism has cast off the swaddling bands of the small intimate circles of former days it has grown to greater maturity and become a factor in the larger life of society you remember it only as a little mountain spring around which clustered a few thirsty travellers in the dreariness of the capitalist desert it has since broadened and spread as a strong current that covers a wide area and forces its way even into the very ocean of life you see dear alec the philosophy of anarchism is beginning to pervade every phase of human endeavor in science in art in literature everywhere the influence of anarchist thought is creating new values its spirit is vitalizing social movements and finding interpretation in life indeed alec we have not worked in vain throughout the world there is a great awakening even in this socially most backward country the seeds sown are beginning to bear fruit times have changed indeed but encouragingly so alec the leaven of discontent ever more conscious and intelligent is moulding new social thought and new action today our industrial conditions for instance present a different aspect from those of twenty years ago it was then possible for the masters of life to sacrifice to their interests the best friends of the people but today the spontaneous solidarity and awakened consciousness of large strata of labor is a guarantee against the repetition of such judicial murders it is a most significant sign alec and a great inspiration to renewed effort the girl enters <laughs> are you crooning sasha to sleep philo she laughs oh no i protest i'm wide awake and much interested in philo's conversation it is getting late he rejoins i must be off to the meeting <gasps> what meeting i inquire the cholgosh anniversary commemoration i think i'd like to come along better not sasha my friend advises you need some light distraction perhaps you would like to go to the theatre the girl suggests stella has tickets she'd be happy to have you sasha returning home in the evening i find the pin in great excitement the assembled comrades look worried talk in whispers and seem to avoid my glance i miss several familiar faces where are the others i ask the comrades exchange troubled looks and are silent has anything happened where are they i insist i may as well tell you 
philo replies but be calm sasha the police have broken up our meeting they have clubbed the audience and arrested a dozen comrades is it serious philo i am afraid it is they are going to make a test case under the new criminal anarchy law our comrades may get long terms in prison they have taken our most active friends the news electrifies me i feel myself transported into the past the days of struggle and persecution philo was right the enemy is challenging the struggle is going on i see the graves of waldheim open and hear the voices from the tomb a deep peace pervades me and i feel a great joy in my heart sasha what is it philo cries in alarm my resurrection dear friend i have found work to do end of section 57 end of prison memoirs of an anarchist by alexander berkman